This fantastic seminar that I prepared over the last month for you guys. This is very powerful. It's very complete in our understanding of Taoism. And although I can say it's complete, it's ever still incomplete in the fact that you can explore so many more roads and routes from this information I'll be presenting to you guys in this five-part seminar series. I hope you stay tuned for this entire thing because I absolutely love this information. It was deeply inspiring to create it, and I think it'll be deeply inspiring to simply share it or for even you to apply it in your life, and that is my main goal here. So this presentation is called Tao, or Tao, The Way of Nature, A Full Return to Nature. My name is Corey Edmund Endrelot. In case you're new to Taoism, uh, or Eastern philosophy as a whole, or you want to deepen your own spiritual journey, uh, or you want to simply understand what does it mean to really return to nature if you care about nature, I certainly do. Is it sort of a fad to say you want to return to nature, or is there some sort of basis to it that we can also look back on from thousands and thousands of years ago? So there is just a wealth of information, and let's just jump right into it. Of course, we're going to be featuring Lao Tzu himself, and we'll talk about who that is and hundreds of resources, very inspiring content creators that essentially helped me create this seminar through their amazing content, which I'll be sharing with you, basically brought together in this seminar. So this seminar is for three people. For one, anyone who is completely new to Taoism and wants an overview of important core concepts. Two, those who are already aware of Taoism and want to further their education or further apply it in their own life, but also learn how Taoism can naturally change the world and become more commonly practiced to change the world. And then number three, those who are in the spiritual or cult natural law or voluntarist community, or anyone who cares about humankind and freedom to gain a great perspective on their worldview and action. And if you ask me, um, this three people is a lot of people. <laughs> it's way more than three people who would then, I would consider, care about this information or find some sense and value in it. We live in a world where people might be rushing around and attaching themselves to material things. Um, and in spiritual traditions, they typically say, stay away from that. Taoism has a little bit different of a view. It's not necessarily, oh, well, let's just embrace it all, or let's completely stay away from it, but let's understand its role, its use within our lives. And so if you come from any community, uh, if you're any person, I welcome you to this presentation. If you're simply called toward this information, uh, if you simply care about nature, like I said, or want to further your own journey as a whole, wherever you're at, you know, you don't have to put a label on it. You don't have to say, this is where I'm at. You are living right now in the present. And as you're listening to the seminar, things might come up upon your journey. I encourage that you pause at any moment if you need to and take breaks if you must. Right? But try to do a little bit more once every single day. Maybe you do one part every day or an hour each day or whatever works best for you Okay, at your own pace. This information is essentially only a start. And, you know, I wear this robe not to look special, not to act special or anything like that, uh, simply because it's quite comfortable. <laughs> and uh, I was like, all right, I'll, I'll wear it. It fits the theme of the presentation. Like I said, I was quite inspired to make this, but you have to bear in mind that it really is only a start and this is only paving the way. See, the word Tao means way or path. Okay, so when we're talking about Tao, and if I'm saying this is especially introductory because you can look into any of this information much more on your own if you choose to do so, this is only paving that way. Okay, so it's essentially like if we were both hiking on the same trail 
and you didn't know where to go, I'd be like, it's down that way. Now, I can't go down that trail for you, but I can help guide you and I can help point the way and say, this is the way you can go. Right. And that's essentially this sort of information or any spiritual journey for that matter. People can help you on your way, but you may need to take it into your own hands at one point in time or another um, in order for you to truly reap the benefits, in order for it to become truly practical. Okay, so let's look more upon this. Um, The only agenda that I have in this seminar really is making our lives better, harmonizing with nature. You might assume, um, because this is quite a complete work, that I might, at the end of it, ask you to pay for something or uh, to learn more, you have to go to some course or whatever. That's all optional, um, but I don't have that. (laughs) When I say it's optional, it's because there are courses out there that you can take for different things, and I can share them with you. But this is not like a sponsored video or plugging anything or getting you to do anything, nothing like that. It's just applying it in your own life, realizing the value of all the information that I found on the internet regarding Taoism. And like I said, there's much more out there, but this is going to cover a lot of what I've seen. Now, you have to have strong will here, right? There most certainly is something you may find unpopular or undesirable in the teachings of Taoism. This philosophy is designed to evaluate your ability to change and adapt. So just bear that in mind, okay, that you can relate this to a strong will or really just an open mind. Are you truly open and present to what I'm going to share with you in this presentation? Because many people, when it comes to any information that they're new to or they think they already understand, um, they're going to go in with preconceived notions uh, or a, a mental blockade that prevents them from learning new information. So just something to bear in mind. So we are planting the seed for what can potentially become very helpful for us if we do open our minds and open our hearts to it. We can learn from ultimately everything. And this information is from me to you, a fellow messenger, right? Human to human. It's all it is. I'm just a fellow human being sharing ideas. I do not seek to convince anyone. That is greatly the problem. I create this so you can take personal value from it. Every individual must be able to think for themselves upon it. I'm going to be sharing scientific studies. I'm going to be sharing different perspectives and analogies all across this entire presentation. Again, from many different sources. But I want you to think about it for yourself. You know, really reflect upon this world of this nature that is ever around you. And see if you can grasp that information for yourself. I can come up to you and say, here's a way to look at the world. But... I want you to still do something with your own eyes, with your own ears, with your own senses. It was given to you by nature. And see, like I said, I can only guide you in what maybe you don't see or to help you use those senses you already have. So this is a tapestry of work. Our goal may be among fulfilling in the gaps to questions concerning division, freedom, semantics, and arguments in the world. There's a lot of people who you know, have contradicting views uh, of their own or between other people. Um, it's causing division. Uh, there's a lot of people who say they care about certain things. They don't know how to actually achieve it. Uh, there's people who are fighting over words and meanings. Uh, and, and we are all prone to thou, those problems. Um, but we can try to fill in the gaps that are causing all these problems. Maybe there is some sort of unifying ground that we can find midst the division and midst all these people who may want something but may not know how to actually get it. Like many people might say they want freedom and they have different ways of getting there, but yet they all want the same thing. So what's the problem? And I think it's about filling in those gaps or bridging connections between point to point information information. Again, I do this a lot with the content creators in this presentation. I learned from many different types of individuals and I sort of just brought them together. So this work is a tapestry that embraces paradox for the work to balance out the extremes in our world. There's people with this worldview, there's people with that worldview, right? There's the masculine, there's the feminine, there's the yin, there's the yang. And we need to understand both of these, not shut one out, but realize They're both in the same reality. And even in the truth communities, there may be extremes that need to be worked out on, uh, that need to be looked at. 
And so, shall we begin? <laughs> You've already begun simply by joining this seminar with me, giving your time and attention toward the information that I am presenting here, uh, simply by partaking in this life journey that is really a, a life experiment, a, a science, a massive science experiment. I was trying to find our place in the world, find some sense of meaning. What are we doing with our lives? Why are we here? All the big questions that even science has a hard time answering, you know, religions try to answer, and maybe we can find some answers in Taoism, this ancient um, Chinese practice, which a lot of the Western world does not really know about, to be honest, and we'll talk about that as well. We'll talk about all the differing views, even the things that Taoists may not talk about. We're going to get into everything. So you've already begun by simply joining the video, by living your life, following your path, and it led you here. Congratulations. <laughs> so starting here, do you know this symbol? This symbol that's on the screen. Now, starting with what most people are familiar with, other than themselves, this symbol. Now, what comes to your mind? I think a lot of people will say yin yang, right? Well, we actually see it all throughout nature. You can see there's a galaxy, there's a hurricane, <laughs> you can see a sunflower, and on the left side, you'll see actually the first known use of the yin-yang symbol, at least historically. And um, it actually works as a clock, I'm pretty sure. It's got a lot of unique uh, things going on in this diagram. I'm not going to break that down into detail. We're going to be sharing a lot of symbolism for the first part of this seminar. Uh, so I just want to get you guys familiar with what these things are and how they sort of correlate through all of nature. You can see uh, seashells basically follow the same principle as well. This is actually called the Taija II, okay? And it's known as the yin yang or Tao symbol, the Taija II. Okay, so there it is. You have a white part and a black part. Uh, you have a light part and a dark part. Okay, so let's look at just the circle, the Taija II circle. The circle represents all of creation. A circle is never ending. It has no beginning or end. It is a perfect shape as it has no corners, rough edges, angles, or irregularities. Thus, it represents God or creation itself, the all that is. And this is typical for the use of a circle in symbolism. Now, if we look at the swirls of the Taiji II, the two swirls represent change of which all creation is comprised. All that exists is in a constant state of change. All matter passes from form to form in an endless dance of creation. Life itself is change. Inability to change is the equivalent of death and non-existence. Therefore, the two swirls inside the circle represent this ever-changing dance of matter taking place within the whole of creation. The two dots within each swirl represents the idea that no matter how deeply into one polarity or the other we may travel, the seed of the opposite energy is always carried within each polarity, no matter if each is at its strongest. So say you look at the yin-yang symbol and these swirls. Let's say the white part becomes bigger than the black part. Well, you have an extreme taking place. The yang is taking over the yin, essentially. Well, there's still that seed of the black inside of that white, and that seed is going to then reconcile. It's going to bring the darkness out of the light. And the same would happen if the darkness were overtaking the light. There's the seed of the light within it. So you see there's this ever constant change of yin to yang or yang to yin. And this is what this is representing, okay? The seed is in each, an ever-changing dance of matter. So yin and yang represents fish with eyes. Yin becomes yang, yang becomes yin, the time or place of cooperation or competition. Right and wrong works together and difference and change is natural. There is beauty in symbolism for simplicity upon complex understandings as this, right? It's putting it into a symbol, as simple as the polarity, the paradox of all of life, of all the many different things that contrast with each other, all put into one symbol. 
And actually, this photo I have here in this slide is from Avatar The Last Airbender. Uh, you can see there are two fish swimming you know, in a circle. So that's actually in the very first episode, I'm pretty sure, of the Avatar The Last Airbender series, uh, one of my favorite TV shows you might be familiar with, and it's very brief on screen. You may not even notice it, um, but it's a, it's a slight little touch, which is quite funny. Um, there's a lot of references in a lot of TV shows. We'll be talking about that throughout this presentation as well. So just bear in mind, change is essentially law. Everything is bound to this law of change, the yin and yang. So we are seeing opposites. From chapter two of the Tao Te Ching, quote, when people see things as beautiful, ugliness is created. When people see things as good, evil is created. Being and non-being produce each other. Difficult and easy complement each other. Long and short define each other. High and low oppose each other. Fore and aft follow each other. End quote. Okay, so that's basically just summarizing this concept of yin and yang through just one of the quotes from Lao Tzu of the Tao Te Ching. And so if you look at the yin yang symbol, it actually represents consciousness. Uh, this is, of course, a chart from Mark Passio, markpassio.com or what on earth is happening. Com, and you see that he's looking at the yang, which is this white part of the Taiji Tu, and that represents the solar, the masculine, active, analytical, dominant, left brain, or aggressive state, you know, the active state. And then you have the yin, which is the dark side of this little Taiji Tu symbol, and it's lunar, feminine, passive, intuitive, submissive, right brain, and compassionate. So this symbol really combines many aspects of our reality and brings them together to create a balance. And funny enough, there's actually a word called enantiodromia, uh, which is a Greek word that means opposite running course. And it is a principle introduced in the West by psychiatrist Carl Jung. In psychological types, Jung defines enantiodromia as the emergence of the unconscious opposite in the course of time. It is similar to the principle of equilibrium in the natural world, in that any extreme is opposed by the system in order to restore balance. When things get to their extreme, they turn into their opposite. Jung adds that this characteristic phenomenon practically always occurs when an extreme, one-sided tendency dominates conscious life. In time, an equally powerful counterposition is built up which first inhibits the conscious performance and subsequently breaks through the conscious control. However, in Jungian terms, a thing psychically transmogrifies into its shadow opposite in the repression of psychic forces that are thereby cathected into something powerful and threatening. So, of course, Carl Jung, he's known as a famous psychiatrist uh, in the West, particularly, and he talks about so many great ideas we'll be talking about in this presentation, one of them being enantiodromia, but it basically is representing this yin-yang structure. You can even see an image at the bottom that sums it up simply as the changing of something into its opposite. That's really all he's saying here. He's just putting it in some psychiatrist words and terminology, which is fantastic for those of you who might be into that, because again, we'll be sharing a lot more of this scientific perspective behind this as well. And again, it's just recognizing a principle inherent within the universe. And hermetic principles have also been discovered and talked about, especially much in the modern day, um, which is to basically go back to a lot of the occult teachings of the Egyptians and hermetic philosophy. You can see there's a book called The Kabbalion by Three Initiates, where they talk about different principles in the universe. Some people will call it natural laws. You have mentality, correspondence, vibration, polarity, which is particularly <laughs> our focus here for this symbol, Taiji Tu. And then we have gender, rhythm, and cause and effect, but they're all present. I mean, you can look at correspondence and you see the symbol is like a, a circle that's empty, and then there's a circle that's whole. And you see how they're 
basically connected to one another. These all are interplayed into each other at the same time. Uh, so very important just to know about how each one of these principles may relate to each other and how they may be applied to your own life as well. How a ruler is typically uh, reflected of the people who are being ruled uh, and vice versa in the case of correspondence. Or vibration, when we look at anything under a microscope and we see everything's constantly moving, we can actually say, wow, you know, this ancient knowledge holds up quite true. And so we see that we're revisiting a lot of what the ancients told us, and not everything necessarily we can say they were true about, or maybe we need to have more perspective on, we need to nonetheless learn from what was said. And I think Taoism has a lot of connections with modern science uh, and especially traditional Chinese medicine that we'll be talking about and how it can be applied to your own life as well. Simple little steps within your life. And this balance that we're talking about between the yin and yang also reminds me of just general brain balance. This is a chart by Chris Nelson of EvolveConsciousness.org. And you can see you have the left brain, you know, extreme on one end and then the right brain extreme on the other end. And then you have this zone of balance where there's no longer an extreme imbalance and you have this center. OK, and it's ideal, but unreachable permanently. So it's only passing contact and fluctuation. Think of it like a straight line. And we're like this and we're trying to align to the line, but we can never get it just perfect. Our goal is just trying to line up with that line, aligning to nature, some people will say. So I encourage that you read through this chart for yourself if you want to have a little bit more perspective on brain balance. You don't have to agree entirely with this science, but it's another way of looking at the yin and yang. OK, people have even applied it to business. Here's a chart about the Tao of business success. You have somebody saying here's the yin passive accepting side and the yin active and aggressive side. And it's like the yin is the outside in and the yang is the inside out. So you can really apply this principle, this understanding, this symbol to anything in life. Uh, shall you put your mind to it? You have to realize that essentially the yin and yang is in everything. Quote, all information whatsoever can be translated into terms of yang and yin. That's Alan Watts. And we'll be using a lot of quotes from him in this presentation. An example would be attraction and repulsion, life and death, winter and summer. A bee is using yang to pollinate a yin flower, yet the bee contains both yin and yang. The atom has a positively charged core surrounded by negatively charged electrons. The binary code also demonstrates this through zero and one patterns. And no movement is possible unless an opposite movement occurred before it in the case of walking. OK, and then you have Wu Wei Taoist practice, and that is essentially the balance between yin and yang. We'll be talking about that. But the possibility of order turning into chaos or chaos turning into order is always present because you have this constant shift between the yin and the yang. So we need to utilize Wu Wei and Taoist practice to help us understand how we can become more balanced within our own life. OK, now there's the occult nature of yin that we must understand. Since yin is something that is considered darkness or hidden, by its nature it's considered occult, and occult simply means hidden. So the value of yin is, and by its nature, often overlooked, okay, as it may appear occulted or hidden. An example is a mug, a simple mug, right, or a simple glass, okay, and so the yang is the material the hard and dry, but the yin is the emptiness, which is what makes the mug useful. Without emptiness, we can't punch or use a soccer ball. Without emptiness in sound, we can't speak because we need pauses to separate tones. We also wouldn't be able to enter a room if there wasn't any space in the room. Another may be the solar system, right? Muscles are built when resting. Plants are grown while planted. OK, so the receptiveness of yin makes it very, very attractive because it's what makes something very useful. Actually, the emptiness we will be talking about this very strange paradox, the empty being useful. We'll be talking about this quite a bit.
But let's go back into symbolism and realize more about this yin-yang symbol. You might see it in another symbol called the Bagua or the Pacua, the eight trigrams, and it looks kind of like this. Okay, so you can see it on the screen. And you can see on this chart, it's broken down into all its sort of uh, interpretations. Okay, this is a very helpful chart that you can see going into all the different elements, how they interact with each other. This stuff can get quite complex. And there's practitioners that still use this to this day. Of course, you also have feng shui, which is also practiced, uh, where people design their room. They design houses in certain you know, furniture in certain places, certain colors for certain rooms to represent different emotions, different feelings, and different attractions. I know that uh, from looking at different scientific research material that if people use certain colored place settings, it might affect their appetite. So there's a lot of research out there for different things regarding colors, uh, design, and what people put in their environment and how it affects their mood. Uh, everything is going to be receptive and connected to them in a sense. So we need to pay attention to what we're living with, what we're doing, and even just merely the furniture that we have next to us, okay? This could make uh, some bit of a difference. So realizing uh, how to help our current emotions or what we want to achieve, we could do so by studying feng shui, for example. So here are just a bunch of different colors and what they may represent uh, for what you may want. Say I want health and spiritual well-being. Maybe I'm going to start using more earth tones, yellows, right? Maybe I want love and relationships. Well, I'm going to add more pinks, reds, and whites. And just see how your mentality goes along with that. You know, does it make you crave it more? Does it help with the craving? Does it help you deepen your current relationships? What are you exactly trying to achieve? And like I said, there's people who practice this stuff. We're not going to go deep into detail, but these are just some fields of um, practice that are actually connected to Taoism. And so you can see the Bagua and the Feng Shui is connected in this diagram. Uh, amazing stuff. I find it so fascinating. You can see you have south, north, northeast, east, southeast, southwest. Uh, north, it's, it's a compass, right? And it's also time, it's, it, and they have so many different interpretations. There's hundreds of different types of diagrams you can find online for some of this, not everything. There's some things in this presentation I was shocked to see. It's like, wow, there's not enough information about this online. I'm like, there should be a lot more because there's just so much information that can be so powerful when it's applied. Um, for instance, this, the five Wu Xuing. I mean, I did not find a lot of information about this online, or at least as much as I'd like to see. And so the Wuxing, um, also known as the five elements, uh, agents, or phases. It's described by Chinese practitioners as well as Western, uh, by Hippocrates, for instance, because Hippocrates would talk about the humors in the body, talk about the elements. He's known as the father of Western medicine. You know, you can go back to Native Americans and they're talking about a great spirit that is present all throughout the universe. It might sound a lot like the Tao, which we'll be talking about, but you'll see there's a lot of parallels through many different spiritual or ancient traditions. And it wouldn't be surprising to find some medicine uh, parallels between the East and the West if we look deep enough. And so you can see water supports or nurtures wood. Wood supports fire and fire supports earth through ashes returning to it as well as through volcanoes. Earth supports or contains metal and metal supports water and bowls, etc. And so seen from a different perspective, water triumphs over or extinguishes fire. Fire triumphs over or melts metal. Metal triumphs over or cuts down saws wood. <laughs> wood triumphs over or grows from earth and earth triumphs over or rises out of water. So these five elements are essentially connected and used and you can see again the Taiji to the yin yang symbol in the middle of these five elements. Here's another chart where it goes a bit more into detail with exactly how the five elements play out with each other but also connecting it to the body. 
which now adds some level of alchemy into the play, which we'll be talking about. And you can see the lung, it goes in the kidney and the liver and the heart and the spleen and how each one supports different things. Each one generates different things. Uh, there's different seasons, there's different colors. I mean, it's all here in these diagrams. So maybe if you're suffering from a certain condition, you might want to consider looking at some of these foundational understandings uh, of nature by Chinese medicine or Eastern philosophy. Here's another chart talking about the five elements through another perspective, wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. Again, seasons, climates, tissues, emotions, colors, taste, voice, <laughs> incredible. Right, and here's another chart. I found these charts to be the most helpful regarding this information. And I wanna talk about now why we're getting into this, why we're talking about all these symbols, how we can really get to the philosophy of Taoism, get to the heart of what really started all of, the, all of this and really inspired Chinese medicine, really brought it together. And, you know, you can probably look at Lao Tzu, who wrote the Tao Te Ching, which is known as like this foundational document for Taoism. And he did not really intend for a lot of those things to necessarily be connected to it. But we need to understand why uh, and why it's so inspiring for many individuals like myself and this individual, George Thompson. <laughs> He's one of the people who inspired me to definitely make this presentation and to look deeper into Taoism. And I'm sure as for a lot of people, uh, he made a video about his transformation. I recommend checking it out. Basically him going to China and his whole life turned around. He basically did the shadow work as Carl Jung would put it. Um, he, in his very beginning stage, and he shares this in the video, he didn't know what he was doing. You know, he was depressed or he had some dark feelings. He didn't really know what to do. So he's like, all right, I'll go to China. I'm going to try Kung Fu. And he ends up going to China to Wu Dane and he talks to the locals there and he ends up going to a Taoist, you know, temple in the mountains and he meets Master Gu of the Wu Dane uh, Taoist Wellness Center and they make a connection and he starts becoming essentially part of their family. Um, he starts producing videos. It's a very inspiring journey because he didn't expect to get where he was. And in that process uh, of just being open-minded and, and trying new things, um, he found his calling. You know, he found that Taoism was ultimately very helpful for him. And he still, you know, went to some Buddhist temples and other temples as he planned, but he really found his home with Taoism. And so, you know, there's a lot of people in this world who suffer all sorts of different conditions, health conditions, mental conditions. And I think this is just one example of somebody who may have gone through a lot of those dark patterns in life, but was able to get out of it. So very, very inspiring. And as for my own transformation in this process, I will say it's not information although it's provided with it because you know information sort of comes along the way i don't necessarily need to seek out the knowledge i didn't seek out taoism did he seek out taoism no there's a lot of people who it reaches the individual who truly does care about nature as myself or who really is looking for something that can help them out in their life um, but not necessarily in the same way religions do or or strict doctrines or ways or practices do because Taoism has a different approach to that and that always inspired me it, it, it was admired I mean the minute I read the Tao Chi Ching for example which of course I recommend you read um, aside from this presentation I was like, it's so simple, it's so profound, a kid can read this and understand it. I just thought that was, by itself, giving it so much value to its works, to its knowledge, that it didn't have to ask of you for anything. It didn't have any specific praises. There weren't people preaching it. There's just people with life experiences, and they're not fighting reality, they're trying to live with reality. and. I was able to sympathize with it quite easily because of it. Um, it just came along my journey. Again, I am somebody who cares much about nature. It's the title of my channel. And I've always held with me this message for myself. Nature is the answer. 
And so I would study the world with a respect toward nature as the general just baseline, right? My only bias is I care about nature. And I think a lot of people do. And they just have, again, different ways of, of using that sort of mentality. And I just saw where it would lead me. And it led me to Taoism. <laughs> but without expecting it, I had a lot of views that were aligned to Taoism. I was like, wow. And then once I started looking to Taoism more, I realized, wait, there's a part of my brain I haven't accessed for so long. This yin, this right brain side, this uh, darkness, this emptiness that is actually very useful. Like I mentioned before with the mug analogy. And so it's teaching me more every day, um, even though I'm learning less because I'm looking at nothing. I'm looking at emptiness. I'm looking at the uselessness in things. Um, which is actually more useful. And this paradox, which sounds so strange, especially to anybody who's new to it, will be completely understood by the end of this presentation. I can guarantee you that. Because we can use real-world experiences and just look out into nature and see how things get done. And so um, it's very natural, right? Nature, because it is nature. And my goal is always to be, well, how do we become natural? and without necessarily leaving society, okay? Because we can still live with society, we can still live with other human beings, but learn how do we do that? And so this is a process, it's a journey. And my journey led me to Taoism unexpectedly. I did not intend it. It's just because I care about nature and I didn't want to impose my will on nature, say this is what I think needs to be done in nature. I need to find out, I had a genuine search for the truth. What is it that I should do? What is it that I should care about, you know, um, if I care about nature? What is it that I should do? And so I think this presentation is going to answer that question. What is it that I should do? And maybe more of the question is, what should I not do? <laughs> so let's get into this. The Tao. It's the way or path of nature. It's the uncarved block, the nameless, the mother of 10,000 things and it may relate to the concept of the anima mundi or world soul. A lot of uh, people who study theosophy may make that connection. Okay, so that is what the Tao is, simply put. The path, the way. And so I mentioned the Tao Te Ching. This is the foundational document typically of Taoism. And it translates to the book of the Tao, of the way and of virtue, of integrity, of reason, on the principle and its action. Okay, so it's variations of that. And it's the most translated work worldwide after the Bible. Yet it is not promoted as much in the West, which I find quite significant. Anyone can read it. It is simplistic and short. It has no expectations other than for you to be you. It does not ask to be praised. And it is generally considered among the first anarchist or freedom oriented texts in all of recorded history. It dates back to the fourth century BC. It is similar to Stoicism, naturalism, and transcendentalism in aims of achieving harmony with nature. It is connected to traditional Chinese medicine or TCM, feng shui, and esoteric ancient Chinese. Okay, so again, we already briefly went over some of these, but uh, this is just profound. You know, the first anarchist text, what does that mean? You know, uh, fourth century BC, that's a long time ago. Stoicism, transcendentalism, some of them are, they come a little bit after. Transcendentalism is much after, but they all want to achieve harmony with nature. So how are they different? We'll talk about that. All of this, even looking at the Bible and how that may relate to the Bible, there's people who have wrote about that. Um, and we'll make some connections here with Western religion, but I think people have to look at this objectively for what it is in Eastern philosophy, because the Eastern mind is not much like the West, and Carl Jung makes this distinction very clear. So who is Lao Tzu? 
The Tao Te Ching was written by Lao Tzu, or Lao Tzu, okay? And many people spell this several different ways, so you're going to see it spelled several different ways. I mentioned three different ways, uh, four different ways in this little slide here. And he's also known as the Old Master, before he left society due to constant conflict and warfare. So he wrote this Tao Te Ching document. You know, there was a guy who basically stopped him and said, hey, um, before you leave society, could you write me something before you go? Because he recognized him. He's like, you're a philosopher. <laughs> and so he's like, all right. And so he wrote to Tao Xi Ching and he left. Now that's according to the story, but um, he has a controversial existence. People don't know if he actually really existed, but he's said to maybe even be the Buddha or the Buddha's teacher. And he was prophesied by Yingxi. Okay, so Yingqi is the guy who prophesized him, and the warring states ultimately led to the rise in Chinese philosophy as a whole, striving for order. You know, you had this time in China's history where there's many different cultures and philosophies emerging out of war because people are like, man, somebody's got to bring order to this chaos, essentially. And so you had Confucius, you had Lao Tzu. Right, you had Buddhism, and these were all influencing the culture at the time. And so, Taoism has two main texts not just Tao Te Ching, but the Xuanzi, and other texts also include the Ha Hu Jing, and the Li Tzu, and Mensis. Uh, the practice of Taoism is generally known as the art of flow or the art of minding your own business. Now, bear with me, I'm not Chinese, so if I pronounce some things, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, all these texts, essentially, most people would consider these are the basis of Taoism, and you can include many others, I'm sure. But it provides more clarity to the related I Ching, which you might be familiar with, the Book of Change, which was very much loved by the psychiatrist Carl Jung. So, let's look at mystery. Chapter 1 of the Tao Te Ching is a nine-line poem, which explains how the Tao cannot be fully understood with the intellect alone. It admits to the limits of language. An example is how love cannot be fully explained in words. It emphasizes the need to embrace the mystery inherent in life. And if you contrast that to religions, which most people follow, they typically follow it to provide certainty. And here's Taoism and its main text, literally admitting in the first chapter, it's okay to not understand all of it. In fact, you can't. <laughs> that there's limits to our language and that the language is going to be perceived differently. And you see many different translations of the Bible or the Tao Te Ching or many ancient texts and people disagree and they have so many different interpretations. And here am I reading a nine line poem and being able to write hours and hours and hours of presentations based on poetry. <laughs> I think that's insane. But that's how profound the Tao Te Ching is, is being a poetry book able to be understood so simply uh, through so many different years of time and then being able to be explained till the end of time. And so here's a quote from Voltaire, perfect is the enemy of good. You know, people are trying to find that answer for their life, that, that one thing that's going to provide them with everything that they need to know. Maybe that's not the way we should look at the world. And the Tao Te Ching sort of helps us with realizing there's a mystery that we must embrace within the world. And again, that's sort of the nature of yin. You don't see it. There's emptiness there, but it makes it very useful. So the Tao is all encompassing. The Tao is all-encompassing humans attempt to capture part of that all-encompassing Tao, and so they conceptualize things beyond understanding. So we use names, categories, titles, all of which must be known as not whole, because whenever we use a title or name or category, we are limiting something to something else. We deceive ourselves if we get stuck on these labels and these categories. Okay, so as life is made more understandable, it may be counterintuitive 
as it limits the fact that life is much more than just that label, that category, that title, that judgment. You know, we want to judge people and say, this person is that, this person is that. They're much more than that. We try to grasp onto the world. We try to understand things. And it's very helpful to label things, to say this is what it is, to communicate with language. But is there also value in silence? Is there certain things that can't be portrayed with language? Are there limits when we do use language that we don't realize we're setting upon the truth of reality? And so the question remains, are we forever learning? Are we able to get past these categories and titles and names and realize there's something more beyond it? And that is this all-encompassing Tao that is being referred to, this unnameable thing, which the Tao texts represent. I mean, it literally says the universe is nameless and without man-made words. However, it is also the mother of all things that we do use words for. We should not tie ourselves to labels recognizing what lives underneath it all. So when I title something like this, okay, we have to realize there's something beyond this. And so we call ourselves all sorts of names and titles, but we are far more complex and nameless. We have limitless potential with more than we give ourselves credit for. We are complex. Okay, so... We try to get a grasp on things. Maybe that's part of our struggle. Maybe that's part of the problem, is us trying to think that we can have all the answers. And it's funny, I can come up here and say, I have a presentation and it's not gonna tell you the answers. When many people would make a presentation because they want to have the answers. And I said there's a lot of value in Taoism, but that value may not be the value you perceive in money or titles or fame. It may not be the same type of value, right? And so we have to learn to be free from desire, ultimately. So how does this tie in? Well, Lao Tzu tells us, free from desire, you realize the mystery. Caught in desire, you see only the manifestations. So what we see is what we learn. But what about what we don't see? We claim certain things will make us happy. This makes desire limiting. And we end up not happy. Happiness is actually without desire. It's contentedness. So in addition, desiring to be happy or see mystery makes us define ourselves as not happy or not seeing mystery. This is why presence and reminding ourselves of what we have helps. Quote, when you realize you have enough, you are truly rich. When you realize there is nothing lacking, the whole world belongs to you. Okay, so trying or desiring and not trying, not desiring, learning and letting go. These are all yin and yang at work. So we need to realize where desire plays in, okay? A lot of Buddhist teachings will talk about how the root to suffering is desire. Now, we're not saying that's not desire at all. Lao is not saying not desire at all. There's going to be desires. He says, great, you get to see the manifestations. You get to, to see what happens in the world. But you don't see the underlying mystery, the more that could be seen if you were actually free from desire. And so to see the all, you being a part of it, it's coming to understand that we have to free ourselves from desire. This might sound a little interesting. We're going to be talking much more about that throughout this presentation. Let's start with life and death. Well, there's Zhuangzi, who I mentioned is another text of the Tao Te Ching, but also another writer. Uh, again, said many different ways. There's three different ways to say his name. <laughs> and he taught us not to fear death, to see it as part of nature, part of fate, a change like the birth process and like the seasons. We don't cry about the billions of years of life before we existed. So why attach to the years after we're gone? He lost his wife and did not weep long, for he realized the nature of her being, how she came to be in the very first place, that before there was death, there was birth, and it's just part of nature, that we should accept the impermanence, you know, you have gain, loss, aging, fame, disrepute, they're all just part of the process. So he did not want a marvelous funeral for himself, and did not need a man-made coffin. He stated that he will be devoured either way. 
so why prefer worms to birds eating him? <laughs> Zhuangzi brought the Tao Te Ching further to life in his writings. He used many different examples, uh, many different stories to share about the paradox of our world. So people would say, well, his wife died. Why would he, why would he not, you know, why isn't he sad? Why, why is he celebrating? Why is he happy? Well, it's actually because if he let it affect his mind, it would make him sad. It would make him unhappy. And he knows, like, you can't undo the past. It is what it is. It's just the, the nature of change. And so he weeped for a little bit, but he didn't let himself get attached to that. Uh, he moved on. He learned how to move on. And so he just went with the flow of things. And so throughout a lot of his writings, he's happy, you know, he's, he's uh, mysterious. He's, he's encapsulating all these ideas of what we see the Tao to be. This free flowing, effortless guy, right? Going out through life and um, nothing able to really affect him. He's having fun through the process. And so Zhuangzi tells us that the world is too complex to attach ourselves to labels and judgments because these are limiting and to recognize the hidden yin or yang because the world is always changing and there's always a great mystery that is there. So why limit life? Why attach ourselves to certain things? We can't fear freedom, he ultimately teaches us. He teaches us that dangerous freedom is preferred to peaceful slavery. That having to walk for food rather than being caged up and given food, freedom is a greater gift than comfort. The value in minimalism for contentedness or less materialism. Recognizing that even learning or reading can become imbalanced if we attach ourselves to it. And so we habituate to our environment, and this is also known as the hedonic treadmill. You can see there's a a chart there showing the hedonic adaption or hedonic treadmill, how we desire for something, then we strive for it, then we obtain it, we enjoy it for a short amount of time, but then we start to adapt again, and then we desire more, and then the cycle just happens again and again and again. But there's a level of contentedness that we can reach, shall we understand what people like Xuanzi or even Buddha or Laozi have been telling us in Eastern philosophy. And so we have society and self. Swangza tells us that we are able to live within society, but without getting stuck with society. So we can look past the illusions, the man-made rigidity, like I said before, the titles and the categories, the labels that limit life. And it's also the Hindu concept of maya, which means to measure, to essentially limit, okay, to move through the world skillfully. If we can move past these illusions, we can free ourselves like these birds getting out of the cage. <laughs> we're, we're past the illusion of, well, I need to stay in this cage, right? This cage is my life. No, there's a life that is freedom and you shouldn't fear it because that's, that's your natural state. That's your natural world. You're meant to be free. And he's saying, Zhuangzi is like, don't fear nature. Don't fear your natural state of freedom. Embrace it may look dangerous because you're comfortable in that cage but when you're free and about and flowing with the freedom of the world you'll be more happy and you'll achieve something you won't be stuck you won't have an attachment and so active listening to nature you can figure out for yourself the best way to live so he emphasizes the value of being carefree having humor and play and so you can be social and have nature. You can be in society, but not following society. This is what Swangza teaches us in a nutshell. Now, if we look at Leitze, okay, he teaches us to ride with the wind, that disciplining our mind actually requires letting go. External circumstances don't need to weigh us down because we don't resist. We allow the natural course of things. Quote, without knowing it, I was being carried by the wind, drifting here and there. I did not know whether I rode on the wind or the wind rode on me. Okay, that's what he said. And he shared a story throughout his writings about somebody called the Yellow Emperor. 
and he said that the Yellow Emperor, after being in government, he wanted to take a break. So he chose to engage in pleasures for the senses. Quote, I pampered myself too much and then pushed myself too hard. No wonder I lost my health and my inner peace. So that's the Yellow Emperor basically speaking. And so he then chose to free himself of desires, what uh, the Taoists call fasting of the heart, thus not participating in government. But the problem was he expected fast results. So he wore himself out, and after wearing himself out, he had a dream. <laughs> he dreamt of a kingdom that ruled itself without a ruler. The people therein didn't have desires outside of instincts. Not attached to life or adverse to death, they were without preference and prejudice. The people moved about like gods, unaffected by the external. And after he had that dream, it gave him a sense of enlightenment. And it occurred when the emperor stopped trying. When the emperor stopped trying. So when he was able to flow, in a sense, he just let go. And he was able to get this sense of enlightenment, of realizing, wait, a kingdom can rule itself when people don't have these desires outside of instincts and they're not attached to life or adverse to death. How they have no preference or prejudice. And so this is something to be very inspiring of. Can we live in a future world where maybe people don't, aren't attached to so many material things or consumerism or people are able to go about with their lives with less of these things that hold them back that ultimately keeps them away from that freedom that Swangza talks about? Just some questions to think about. We have our separation. Liza tells us that riding the wind or when we cease to see ourselves separated from water, it won't drown us. When we cease to see ourselves separated from fire, it won't burn us. This is not illusion. It is seeing the oneness of reality. There are people who do miraculous or supernatural things due to it. I know Eric DeBay has a whole documentary on some of these people who can walk on fire. <laughs> and if you jump into the arena worried about winning or losing, you will have doubt. Otherwise, it is not in the picture. Your mind can stand in your own way. So we are to transcend duality. What is to fear when the outcome is irrelevant? When the outcome is irrelevant, what do we fear? And if we transcend duality in a sense of recognizing right and wrong, light and dark, they're all part of this whole, the whole Taijutu, the whole Tao, the whole universe. They're all connected. All this stuff that is here in this world is here for a reason. We don't necessarily want to go against what is here then. We kind of want to let go and see where it leads because nature will tell us where we lead in time. And we'll be talking about this more in detail because it's obviously maybe a bit more than that, but it's a quite simple premises when you understand it because most of us have these moments in life where we do let go. For instance, we sleep, <laughs> right? Or like I said before, when we stop tugging on the plant, the plant can grow. When we, after we're done working out, our muscles can grow. I mean, miraculous, we're not doing anything. It's, it's happening while we're doing nothing. <laughs> so we have a comparison game going on as well in this world. Your food only tastes delicious because you tried something disgusting in the past. You're only pretty because someone else is ugly. You're only rich because other people are poor. The wrong teaches us of right. If we act counterintuitively, for example, trying too hard, salesman, or being a cling clingy friend that's always there with you all the time, we must learn to act more intuitively or use what is called Wu Wei. This is the core concept within Taoism. Quote, those who stand on tiptoes do not stand firmly. Those who rush ahead don't get very far. Those who try to outshine others dim their own light. Those who call themselves righteous can't know how wrong they are. Those who boast of their accomplishments diminish the things they have done. Lao Tzu. So just bear that in mind anytime you see people comparing each other 
to other people, themselves, others, whatever, judging other people. You judge yourself, I'm sure, a lot too, perhaps. You know, we might be our own worst critics sometimes. You know, I'm certainly judging myself sometimes making this presentation, but I learn to go with the flow and then it works out better because I'm not thinking about it so much. I'm, I'm in the zone, per se. And so this Wu Wei concept is very important. This is the end of part one. Part two, we'll be talking about what that really means. Stay tuned. Thank you very much for watching. Welcome to part two of Tao, the way of nature, a full return to nature. And we're going to be observing Wu Wei. Wu Wei is also known as non-action, spontaneous or effortless action, or non-forcing or not interfering. It is still action, even though it's considered not action. So think of it like not doing, but going. It is being without the struggle of doing. A state of being in which you know the principles of the social and natural world so well that you can just relax. Your mind can just relax. Okay, it's not troubling you. You're not attached to things in the world. You let things go. But you know why you're letting go. You know where you're letting go. And you're basically following the path of least resistance. So these are many different ways to represent the idea of Wu Wei, which is a core concept within Taoism. Okay, and there's a little equation that you can use to help you understand what is meant by effortless action or non-action. Because to a lot of people, it might sound alarming, like doing nothing in the face of evil. It's not quite like that. In fact, it's natural and social laws, again, understanding it, knowing it, and having that with our subconscious, making it to where we're in the zone, we are practicing what is right, practicing what is true, effortlessly. We're in the zone. I'm going to be talking more about this and providing a lot of examples. For instance, we can first talk about our cognition. We have hot cognition and cold cognition. Okay, our hot cognition is our fast, automatic, effortless, and unconscious. It's essentially our body. Our cold cognition is the slow, deliberate, effortful, and conscious. It's that voice in our head. Okay, so the goal with Wu Wei is to help our cold cognition become hot cognition. Our voice in our head, our mind, align to our body. Okay, and so the conscious aligned to the unconscious, the effortful aligned to the effortless, the slow aligned to the fast, deliberate, attached and aligned, actually, to the automatic. Okay, and so we recognize this is a natural attachment, this is a connection we have in the body, that if we are so up here in the mind, we forget about the body, if we're so in the body, so instinctual and so unconscious, we forget about the mind. So both hot and cold cognition, just like yin and yang, are both essential for not just our health, but our actions that we partake in everyday life. So cold cognition becomes hot cognition through Wu Wei. And essentially, you can look at it as the action becomes second nature. So when people say, well, it's become second nature for me to walk, it's become second nature for me to present. It's because they've practiced. Their conscious efforts have now become their effortless efforts, <laughs> which is Wu Wei. Okay, and you can look at this like learning how to ride a bicycle or learning how to really do anything in this life. I mean, roller skating, cooking, you're being in the zone. With practice comes ease. This is Wu Wei. I mean, think about all the bikers, right? all these competing bikers. I mean, they're skilled at biking, but there's still this guy over here who doesn't know how to bike at all. <laughs> and so for them, it's effortless. For that guy, it's like, man, he, he's just starting out. But once he practices, he's now effortless. I remember when I was learning roller skating, which, you know, I was like, man, why are humans on wheels? This is kind of weird. I just got over the fear in my own head, and now I was able to do it. And once I kept practicing, it became effortless. It was like walking. And you observe others and 
it's even better than walking. It's like they're floating on air. <laughs> and that, like we said before, riding the wind is Wu Wei. So there's an intelligence here. It's not like you're just doing nothing. There's a reason why you're doing what you're doing even still, even if you're not doing anything. So if you are unsatisfied with the growth of a plant and you put too much effort in trying to make it do what it can naturally do, it dies. Overthinking is another cold cognition problem. So, you know, you can overthink, you can try to make a plant grow, but you have to recognize there's this effortless nature to it that you can support and nurture. Okay, there's this body you're given and you have this mind that can dictate what happens in this body and you can have it work together or you could have them in conflict with one another. The natural being is intelligent and we simply need to listen to our body. I mean, oftentimes in health, right? Many people have many different conditions, um, reactions to different foods. And if an individual listens to their body, they become more intelligent as to what they should eat and what they should not eat, for instance. So fulfilling this balance between hot and cold cognition is using our intuition, our effortless intelligence, which is another way to say it, our Wu Wei. We are never to use muscle, for instance, at the wrong moment. Take, for example, martial arts, where Wu Wei is really put into practice. The person who's effortlessly, you know, looking like they're water bending in Tai Chi, for example, which we'll talk about. I mean, they know when to use the right muscle at the right time. And it becomes so much of a practice, it becomes effortless. Quote, the Tao does nothing, yet nothing is left undone. Lao Tzu. And we can look at food forests. This is something you may have not heard of but it's working with nature. It's called permaculture and it's relatively low maintenance. Um, you plant some trees next to each other in a, in a certain fashion, right? And they grow abundantly and you let it go in just like it would in its natural environment. You don't try to make it look necessarily pretty because it is quite pretty when it does its own thing, when you let things be. Um, you look it out into nature, you're not judging the stars and their arrangements, but yet it's quite pretty, quite beautiful. There's not a lot of people judging nature's arrangements, <laughs> right? Now there's people who are landscaping and now they try to judge nature. And you have people like Jim Gale who look at looks at the landscaping and he's like, wow, all these ornamental plants, why aren't people putting in food? He's somebody who promotes food forest. And he says, this is no maintenance. So we just do a little bit of trimming and stuff in the beginning stages to make sure the plant does well. But nature does all the work and they respect it. They're like, we don't need to have like these cookie cutter homes with perfect landscaping or cookie cutter, you know, gardening uh, post. We can have a food forest where we walk in and there's abundance of food and it's growing so much and everything supports each other because they like being next to each other. A lot of plants, if you know much about gardening, um, they like support, they like being with each other. And so you create an environment where everything is supportive of one another. So again, like the mind and the body, the yin and the yang, female and male, even the plants have react to their environment and love being supported, okay? There's even scientific research about classical music and vibrational energy and how that affects the growth of plants. And there's people doing electroculture and amazing things, just working with nature, understanding how nature works and not trying to go against it, not forcing upon the, the nature of things, but working with it to allow nature to work in its beautiful bounty that it can absolutely provide for people. And then you start looking at food forests and you can look them up online for yourself. And you say, why is there a food shortage? If people can create so much food in a little amount of space, it's amazing. So effortlessness versus force. Nobody's building the trees or telling the birds what notes to sing. <laughs> this is effortless. So. On the other hand, you have society telling us to work hard and work fast, to be successful and valuable. This is force. You know, there's a lot of people telling others how to live their lives or people telling themselves what images of who they should be, their own ego. And 
we have to realize, does nature really have all those judgments of itself, or is it just creating beautiful bounties every single day without even thinking about it? And so nature, or Tao, has created so much without thinking or planning. And you can see this as fate rather than chance. Uh, Carl Jung and many others have called this a synchronicity. And there's even documentaries talking about synchronicity. Jason Gregory has a really good one, for instance, uh, connecting it to Taoism, where it's not like cause and effect, but it's where things come about together because they do support each other in order to become in the very first place. So we need to learn how to act when needed. When you're given this body with so many different body parts, when you're given a selection of foods, when you're in this world, you make choices every day. And so we need to know when do we act or even when we do not act in the case of Wu Wei. And so are you acting from the present? Do we utilize emptiness, a beginner's mind to learn more? For instance, if I clear my mind, am I able to see more? Am I, if I open my mind, am I able to see more? If I'm consuming, am I producing? If I'm producing, am I creative? And what allows me to be the most creative? Just ask yourself this line of questioning, and I guarantee you it has some sense of emptiness to do with it. What allows you to sleep? What allows you to relax? Think about it. So Taoist-based practices help with presence. For instance, you have meditation, Tai Chi, Qigong, or even just nature itself. You have the freedom to choose your responses, to not be reactive in life. So you have to trust yourself to take your time, to be flexible, and give yourself credit. Quote, within the Tao, twisted knots loosen, sharp edges become smooth, Lao Tzu. So do we know when to take action and when to flow? Are you wasting energy? Do you move like water? Why might we be so serious with ourselves, stuck in a cold rationality or cognition so up in the head? Why can't we learn to love life, have joy and ease and flow? For every tool you pick up, like this, this very seminar, this thing you're watching to hopefully apply in your own life, don't forget to also not have tools to simply have nature, this open world of possibility that is beyond the seminar, that is beyond what you're searching for, beyond what people think you should do. Think for yourself and reflect, given the world that you are given to, not just me. We both share the same reality. So be sure to use it and not just have other people use it for you, because you are you. And know that. Trust yourself. Give yourself time. Be flexible. Give yourself credit. This is about overcoming. Quote, That which offers no resistance overcomes the hardest substances. That which offers no resistance can enter where there is no space. You can think of water as an example. We'll talk about that. Quote, few in the world can comprehend the teaching without words or understand the value of non-action. Lao Tzu. Wu Wei is the golden path, essentially, between anxiety and boredom. Always feeling like you have to do something and not doing anything at all. <laughs> and having nothing to do. Problems solve themselves. The world governs itself. If we simply allow nature without resistance, letting go to a sense. You see the picture of a kid just standing off into the cliff, you know, just feeling the elements, embracing what comes. You know, this is how he truly enjoys the moment and doesn't let it pass upon him. So there's an effectiveness in Wu Wei. Again, just because you're doing nothing does not mean you don't reap anything. It's still an action, doing nothing. You're still doing something, even if you're being or just going, not really doing. Society celebrates effort regardless of its actual effectiveness. 
busy for the sake of being busy. You don't have a job. You don't have this. You need to go to school. Busy for the sake of being busy. Hard work is necessary at times. However, most times, we have to admit, it's not necessary. We do it because we think we need to do it. But a lot of problems do solve itself. And business owners will even know this because they're so overworked that there's times where they have to just let it go and they know things will solve itself, <laughs> right? And they can't worry about every little problem and there are thousands of workers at times. I mean, there's people who are tremendously stressed in life and they have to go on vacation in order to let go because how else will they? And incorporating Taoist practices can be greatly beneficial for somebody like that, but for anybody in this, what seems to be a fast-paced world, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe you live in the mountains and you're in nature, awesome. You're not affected as much by it. It's part of the reason why, you know, I sympathize with Taoism so much because I go to the city or I go to where there's a lot of people and I see the difference because I'm able to contrast. If I didn't have a previous experience, however, I wouldn't have been able to compare it. Just bear that in mind. The farmer can be impatient and force grow his crops, but he must be patient, allow and then yield at the right time, right? He's utilizing action where and when it is best. Man plants the seed, nature does the rest. Man, man yields the crop and consumes it. And then guess what? Nature does the rest again because the body has to digest and think about our lungs and our heart and how it works without us even really thinking about it. it it's always breathing. It's always pumping. It's amazing. We should respect and absolutely adore this intelligence that is effortlessly given to us. We shouldn't try to go against it or try to force upon these natural reactions. So it is both safe and effective to act with this effortless intelligence. And so easy and honest is Wu Wei. An individual can meet someone they like and try too hard, be something they are not and appear pretentious. How many times have you met people unexpectedly, unprepared, where you have not overthought? You know, there's people who are like, man, I'm going to be going on a date. I have a boyfriend or girlfriend, and it prepares all these expectations and creates more of an unnatural environment around some of these ideas, which can otherwise be rather free-flowing and natural to see where things go. And it can cause more problems, actually. And so, where you have not overthought, you know, where in this life have you just let go? I mean, to some extent, you have to admit you do all the time. Again, in order to live, in order to sleep, in order to do, just be free in our mind. And so, this keeps you yourself in enjoying the moment. Are you flowing with the rhythm of the game? Think if you're playing a game and you're given certain cards that you're dealt with, you're given this life that you're basically just come into, are you going to deal with those cards? And if it's your turn, I mean, you can't really go against reality, can you? We need to accept reality rather than attempt to go against it because we can try to go against it, but how successful will we be? We have to let life move through us and the answers are already here and will present themselves if we stop creating obstructions to the flow. Because it is, again, the nature of reality that things change and that the truth essentially rises above. And the truth is already present. It doesn't need us. We can share it with other human beings in this case of if they're obstructing that truth, but the truth is already there. So they can only be creating blockades and attempting to go against that truth. But that truth is always going to rise back up. So we don't really have to worry so much about convincing everybody. Although we may want to help them, we have to act when necessary. We have to be intelligent about it in the case of Wu Wei. But we understand that this universe we have to work with. Okay, We can't be gods over this universe. We have to respect something higher that is the universe itself. 
That is this world that was before us itself. That is this flow, the Tao. I think this is why spirituality can help with a lot of people. Or even if it's science. Wow, there's this big bang, there's this world of mystery and creativity. It's still very inspiring. And I think people can still look up, no matter which scenario they're in. Even if they're in a scenario where they're feeling down, they can then look up to create a balance, that yin-yang that they need in their life. And so, effortless effort. For effortless effort, all you need to do is look, listen, and respond with all the knowledge available to you. However, it is mostly about knowing when not to act. This is the key. We need to listen or think before knowing or acting. On the Tao, Jordan Peterson states, quote, inaction is the minimal necessary action to keep the balance between order and chaos proper. You detach and you watch, and when it's time to intervene, you intervene minimally without a lot of arrogant self-propagandization. <laughs> this is the word he uses, propagandization. I'm like, what? Um, but it's about understanding when to act and knowing especially not to act in certain circumstances. And so if you do that properly, he says, you hardly have to do it at all, and it's as if you're doing nothing. So Jordan Peterson often has a reputation as uh, being in the field of psychology as well, not just Dr. Carl Jung. Um, so we can learn from him on this too. But coming from the Western world, I don't know how much he knows about the East. Nonetheless, his words about this is true, and inaction is still action, and effortless effort is still effort, even if it's effortless. So when someone tries to undervalue someone who doesn't do something, realize it's their personal choice, and realize there's a reason why you're given that choice, and realize there's a reason probably why they took that choice. And how do we make choices on our day-to-day -day life? It requires some sense of knowledge. Notice it says, look, listen, and respond with all the knowledge available to you and knowing when not to act. So knowledge is a very core component here. This is why we share information with each other. But again, let's not forget how we get information in the first place. Let's not as let us forget um, how we actually become present and how we become more still and allow the flow to be more effortless. We're going to talk more about this idea of nothingness, emptiness, and knowledge. So only as needed do we act, quote, in the practice of Buddhism, there is no place for using effort. Sleep when you're tired, move your bowels, eat when you're hungry. That's all. The ignorant will laugh at me, but the wise will understand. So I'm pretty sure this comes from Zen Buddhism, to be more specific. Okay, and again, just because we're talking about Taoism does not mean we don't talk about Buddhism or Hinduism or Christianity, or because we can learn from all of them. We're not restricting ourselves to just one. One of the beauties I find about people who share Taoist wisdom is they're able to look at other philosophies and not shut them down and say that they know the only way because they realize knowledge and in this reality all these things are created for a reason and that people follow them for a reason and that there's messages and there's you can learn from everything that's a beauty in life so let's look at the slums alan watts gives us a example here for example, he says, we have a slum, and the people are in difficulty, and so on. And they need better housing. Now, if you go in with a bulldozer and knock the slum down, and you put in its place by some architect's imaginative notions of what is a super efficient high-rise apartment building to store people, you create a total mess. Utter chaos. A slum has what we call an ecology. It has a very complex system of relationships going in it by which the thing is already a going concern, even though it isn't going very well. 
anybody who wants to alter that situation must first of all become sensitive to all the conditions and relationships going on there. So somebody can't just come in and say, I'm going to fix this whole scenario. They have to sympathize. They have to connect. They need to become sensitive to the people there because they will create counterintuitive results by their vision of reality, no matter how great they think it is, if they can't work it into the current way things are. This is learning how to flow. You have the microbiome as another example by Alan Watts. Quote, you have conflicts going on in your own body. All kinds of microorganisms are eating each other up. And if that wasn't happening, you wouldn't be healthy. So all those interrelationships, whether they appear to be friendly relationships as between bees and flowers or conflicting relationships as between birds and worms, they are actually forms of cooperation. And that is mutual arising. You have to understand this as the basis. Apply this not forcing anything and you get spontaneity, a life which is so of itself which is natural, which is not forced, which is not unduly self-conscious. So you have this togetherness that allows life to manifest. And when people draw lines in the sand and create divisions and separations between this togetherness, we see a lot of conflict can arise, more conflict than that natural conflict that was there between these polar opposites, between the balance that was being played out that has always happened in nature that we should respect, Alan Watts is essentially saying here. To understand the bees and the flowers and the worms, they all have their place, even though there's conflicts within. They all help each other. And, you know, George Thompson provided another story about how there was a river and, um, you know, it had a dam that was being held up by a bunch of trees and those trees were eaten by the deer and the deer were eaten by the wolves but once the wolves disappeared the deer population increased so much that all the trees were starting to get eaten and the dam flew wide open and the water started flooding everything all because you had one population become imbalanced in that scenario isn't that something to think about all the different scenarios that may happen in life all it takes is a slight shift of the balance, and things can change rapidly. Now, this is not just mere passivity. When we talk about Wu Wei and not doing and effortless effort, it's not just mere passivity. Here's Alan Watts talking about this. The difficulty here is that Westerners, when they hear about Buddhism and Taoism and the sort of thing, they interpret it one-sidedly as passivity and don't see that what sometimes looks like passivity is actually cleverness. As businessmen often know, if you leave letters unanswered for a month, when you return to them, many of them have already answered themselves. And sometimes when you sit and do nothing, you avoid making very serious mistakes which would have arisen if you had acted prematurely, if you had done something about it. Isn't that something? Learning that you don't need to worry about every little thing. You can do your best to be conscious in this life, but don't forget about the unconscious, and you can work with that hot cognition, not just be stuck in the cold cognition. And, you know, what I think of when I think of Wu Wei and this sort of passivity that is cleverness is the idea of a passive ability in World of Warcraft. And I know this may sound silly, but for any of you who've played World of Warcraft or any video game out there where there's passive abilities who might understand what I'm talking about, passive abilities may act as Wu Wei. And negative passives are just part of the game. It isn't questioned. You become one with the game, essentially because you're given it. You're just given it. So you don't really question if it's good or bad. It's mostly good because it's just part of who you are. And that's why you choose to play a certain character. So it says here from Wowpedia, from World of Warcraft, a passive ability is an ability that is always active. So that's interesting. Passive being always active. Well, we think of passive as doing nothing, but... 
In this case, it's always happening. Interesting, right? And we look at the Tao and it's always present. We look at the universe and change and it's always happening. And so it says usually they are not shown in your spell book or tool tips. You may not understand that if you haven't played the game. They are sometimes known as an innate ability. Isn't that interesting? So it's as if it's part of your nature, the part of the nature of the universe, that there's things that always happen. And so if you think of it like there's a flow constantly going in the universe, it's your choice to go along with that flow. And really you have no choice because it is the flow of reality. And so if you try to go against that and you don't work with your passive abilities, say in World of Warcraft, you may not be as powerful as you need to be for an encounter. You might fail uh, in an attack. So um, your passives actually give great way to your active abilities in the game. Your passives, you basically have to work around. They're like the fundamentals that you are given that you need to work with. It's it's really symbolic, I would say, uh, for Wu Wei. And it's effortless. You don't have to think about it. It's always happening on your character. Um, you don't even need to choose it most of the time. There's some passives you can choose, and you can practice with that passive. But since it's passive, it's quite easy to apply. <laughs> and so there's time for control. There's time for action. Alan Watts says, man as the controller, the reasoner, the logical being, and yet at the same time, not ruining life by making it all logic and all control. To have logic and to have control, that is to say, in short, to have order, you have to have randomness. Because where there is no randomness, order cannot manifest itself. You might have seen before in our brain charts, we compared left brain and right brain, okay? And one of them may be considered more deterministic and the other may be considered more random. But guess what? They're both connected in a sense. And they come together with this core understanding in Taoism, which Alan Watts is perfectly describing here, that randomness is actually essential for order. Isn't that something? And we see it in science, too, that we may observe an ever-random world, but within it, we do sense some order within it. Hmm. Like, there's an order we just couldn't put our, our fingers on. We can try to maybe see, okay, there's some scientific laws, there's some math equations we can make of this world, and it really helps us understand things. But even then, there's an order beyond that, which we can't fully quantize and, and try to put into an equation. That's such a great mystery that encapsulates this Taoist understanding. So we have the Wu Wei Apophysis. You may have heard of Apophysis, especially if you're from the natural law community online. And the Greek word Apophysis means to say no. To know what something is by what it is not. Or affirmation through negation. Quote, this is from Chris Nelson from EvolveConsciousness.org. He says, Apophysis relates to a Taoist saying, Wei Wu Wei, or Wu Wei, meaning non-action, which is normally represented as knowing when to apply the appropriate amount of effort and when it would be wasted. I employ this in how I direct my time and attention in life. Time is limited for us all. Choose where you spend it wisely. These are the real base currencies in life, the time we spend and the attention we pay. This meaning is also used to represent being able to recognize reality and judge accurately, to analyze the situation and determine the most effective path to take. Take inaction to not take a wasteful or foolish action. In this way, you can also understand it as if something is not working, stop doing it. Don't forget, Wei Wu Wei has the extra Wei, which adds more clarity. Stopping to do one action is to engage in an action. Here's another quote from Rush, a Canadian rock band. If you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. So Wei Wu Wei is knowing when to stop doing something. When you seize actions that support the existence of something, that is an action to remove it from existence. 
It's not so much about what you can do in an active sense, but what you can stop doing to unbecome. Certain progress can only be made by not doing certain things. Not by actively doing certain things, but by actively choosing not to do certain things anymore. And this is the case for morality and improving the world, as is the meaning with the apophatic process of negation. So this sums up the idea of knowing when to say no, which is the same concept of knowing when to act, when not to, and becoming effortless in that pursuit, being able to flow. And so we are merely being, a quote from Lao Tzu, some are meant to lead and others are meant to follow. Some must always strain and others have an easy time. Some are naturally big and strong and others will always be small. Some will be protected and nurtured, and others will meet with destruction. The master accepts things as they are, and out of compassion avoids extravagance, excess, and the extremes. So he's going with the flow of nature and reality. That does not mean that you go with the flow of society and what man tells you to do with his creation. Big distinction here, we're talking about what we have in our nature. We're naturally bigger, strong. And so accepting our reality, accepting our nature. And you essentially become the philosopher. Quote, the five colors blind the eye. The five tones deafen the ear. The five flavors dull the taste. The chase and hunt craze people's minds. The sage observes the world, but trusts his inner vision. He allows things to come and go. He prefers what is within to what is without. Lao Tzu. And here you can see a picture of what is depicted as the death of Socrates. Many people weeping at Socrates accepting his fate. Accepting the fact that the government of his time was putting him to death. He wanted to be himself, to stand for what he sees as a higher truth, which is why he's pointing up, many people will say. You can see what is often depicted as Plato on the left side of the picture who has his head down because he is grieved by Socrates willingly doing this. All of them are grieved by him willingly doing it, but it's an act of bravery and courage because it ultimately set an example and actually made him to some extent more popular by deciding to go with his fate. And it's not an egoic decision. He didn't want conflict anymore. You know, he stood for what he stood for and he taught people his values. He didn't even write it down on paper. Um, and so I think Socrates has a lot of parallels and his teaching is to Taoism, actually. You know, he was asking people questions a path that doesn't have a lot of resistance. People may not like being challenged, but he wasn't telling people what to think if he's asking people questions. Um, he was getting them just to think. And a lot of spiritual figures or people who made a lot of change in history, a lot of them have been killed by different figures or governments. And I think learning how that affected the world, um, you know, we created holidays, uh, it created more sentiment around their ideas, and it doesn't actually destroy the ideas. You can only destroy the physical body, but that soul, that spirit, that energy that Socrates, Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi shared, it's all still there, right? And so Socrates accepted his fate. He allowed it because he saw the time was right. He was like, it's, it is what it is, <laughs> ultimately. And he knew he stood for the truth. So he trusted the process and stood with courage. I find it quite significant in light of what we're talking about. So we have to learn about contradiction because we certainly may live with contradictions in our world. And we need to know how to then navigate that. We know we should do certain things, but we don't do it. Or we know we shouldn't do certain things, but we do them anyways. We need to know that we can't control everything, but we can choose our response. Again, not to be so reactive, this is responsibility in becoming less reactive. 
becoming more responsible over who is ourselves. There's a reason why we're given a mind and the ability to think. And so you should use it. The ability to breathe, the ability, anything in your natural ability, you use it. You just know when to use it. You practice it. You create intelligence around it. You get Wu Wei. And so we don't get stuck because we get so stuck on the differentiations, especially in the modern day, you may see when in reality, there is also similarity. You know, there's people who are divided among culture, race, religion, or whatever, what have you, when in reality, they're all part of the same reality. You know, there's just ever present nature. And here's man applying titles and ideologies and images on top of that. But what was there all along? What is the root to it? It's just reality. It's nature. And so we can be different from each other, but yet inseparable. A tree that cannot bend will crack in the wind. So we have to be somewhat flexible to accept other human beings, to accept what is different, because actually it allows us to be different too. It allows us to be ourselves by accepting other people being themselves. You might relate this to the golden rule. We'll be talking more about that. But look at this picture. You have water crashing against rocks and it's just taking whatever form it comes, right? And it, it's, it's, it goes wherever it must go. It even has to go around rocks, but it doesn't get stuck, you know? It can get stuck between rocks, but it then accepts its fate. You know, it accepts its fate. It, it, if you put water into a glass, it becomes the glass, right? So we're going to be talking about water because it's very connected to the idea of Wu Wei and Taoism. Let's do a little thought experiment before we do that. Swangza says, when your belt is comfortable, you don't feel it. Well, the same with your shoes or clothes. The more you are aware of these things, the less properly they are made or they fit. Our psychic center should not get in our own way. We can float like Leitze, just being. All the moral talk attests to the idea that something hasn't happened. We need this. This is what's right. This is what's wrong. We wouldn't be talking about it if something's already present that is right, that we're content with. And so it is attributed then to confusion, which is further explained in the video, Just Flow and Don't Force Anything, Alan Watts, by True Meaning. Definitely recommend checking it out if you want more information about this in case you're confused. But here's a quote. The man of superior virtue is not conscious of his virtue, and in this way he really possesses virtue. The man of inferior virtue never loses sight of his virtue, and in this way he loses his virtue. Lao Tzu. I think this is one you have to be able to wrap your head around, um, but not think too much about, <laughs> hence what the whole thought experiment is for, is recognizing that as a child we have mystery and wonder. And you have to observe how you feel if you let go of all your philosophy and religion and instead view what simply is. Because oftentimes, especially if we're looking at a world of cold cognition, we may be so stuck in the head, okay, that we are not embracing what is now, what is reality. We're in bed, but we're thinking about our day at work and we're not even at work yet, you know, so it's the weird contradiction of it's not even happening yet. Why are you worried about it? We think blue is blue and we are so molded to what we think we know. We're so attached to how we perceive the world and the way we do that we lose the sense of mystery that I'm talking about. And so we don't need to drop reason or logic altogether, but as a thought experiment, just let it go for a moment. And what do you honestly hear? This is something you'll have to do in your free time, obviously away from this seminar. But just let your mind be relaxed. Go out in nature if it helps you. And just have a sense of mystery and exploration. Don't think you know it all. Don't try to analyze the trees and everything in the world. Just let it go. See what happens. What do you honestly hear? Do you hear the noise of politics and religion and all this stuff that people talk about on a day-to-day -day basis? Do you hear that when you honestly sit down in your reality with what you have right now in this current moment? Okay, 
I want you to truly do this and realize that world that is out there that you see that nature it's the same sky the same world your ancestors were in that's quite significant so has things really changed or are humans thinking that things have changed and is that sometimes to their own demise it's a thought experiment for you i'll leave you on that but let's now talk about water why is water so important well here's a quote from Lao Tzu: the supreme good is like water which benefits all of creation without trying to compete with it it gathers in unpopular places thus it is like the Tao, because it is humble content with its low position no one can find fault with it and so quite interesting to see water as sort of this symbol of Taoism, which can't really be seen as a symbol i mean you can look at a beach you can look at a lake or an ocean um but can you symbolize water you can maybe put it into a equation h2o <laughs> You know, you have the yin yang, which represents all the forces in life, really, you know, the two contrasting forces of light and dark. But you have water, which encapsulates understanding the yin in particular, but I would argue also the whole. I mean, think about how much water is involved in our lives. I mean, your body is mostly water. The world is mostly water. And so it has no purpose or goal yet it nourishes everything. Quote, water is the softest and most yielding substance, yet nothing is better than water for overcoming the hard and rigid because nothing can compete with it. So it's like, again, seeing this value of yin, which is ever so valuable, especially in a yang world. And this is why people may find it unpopular. And so everyone knows that the soft and yielding overcomes the rigid and hard, but few can put this knowledge into practice. And again, Lao Tzu said before, few understand the value of non-action or Wu Wei. So we can connect Taoism to water and Wu Wei. And so Wu Wei and water have to have some really core connections then. Well, again, water isn't really thinking of where it's going and it's yielding so it's definitely going with the flow of things of reality i mean the idea of flow if you just look up flow you're probably going to get a bunch of pictures of water because that's usually what we refer to as like the most flowing thing is water right now maybe you can argue for air right but water is something i think we can more readily observe and i think this is why it's used as an analogy here to understand the Tao which again is unnameable. So there's a flexibility in water and you navigate through the river rather than attempting to control it. I mean, this is what water's doing. And so we have to stop swimming against the current, letting go to focus on the present. Water gives to everyone and goes to places where people dislike and to depths of the lowest places. And so we adapt, we be flexible. Now, when I say the lowest places, this also has quite a significance in Taoism. So let's first understand that suffering is not life. Oftentimes in Buddhist teachings, suffering is life. Or even in Western cultures, we have the idea of sin, seeing life as inherently flawed or evil. Well, what is the Taoist position on this? Well, add a salt to a cup of water, then taste it. Versus if you get a cup of salt and you put it in a lake, then taste a cup of water from the lake. What's the difference here? <laughs> well, if you taste that salt that is just added to the cup of water, it's going to taste salty. But if you have that same salt in, in that cup, but you add it to a lake and then you take that water, you don't taste the salt at all, really. So this is an analogy for the fact that suffering can occur, but that does not need to be our entire experience. It depends on our worldview picture. If we view ourselves as that limited, you know, cup or that ocean, that lake that is expansive, that is able to take in loads of salt and not be affected whatsoever. This is an analogy for the fact that suffering can occur, but that does not need to be our experience. We are inseparable from nature. Suffering is just part of nature. 
So no matter how much suffering we add, it will not affect us if we recognize and see ourselves from an expansive worldview. We keep breathing. We keep moving on. We keep flowing. And so we don't fear suffering. We see it as natural, part of the process. Isn't that something? It's to recognize why go against reality, even suffering, even the bad things. Don't go against the fact that it's coming to you. If it's a reality now, it's a reality. It must be accepted, right? We can prevent further problems knowing what is right in that sense, right? We can talk about morality more as we move on, but we can't fear what wrong has already happened. We have to accept it and move on and work with it because it has already happened. It's become truth. It's become our reality. So we can't fear death if it's also part of our future reality. We have to be able to move along with life and stop trying to control things or stop the inevitable in a sense okay there is always going to be wrongdoing we can stop certain wrongdoing perhaps in our own lives but we can't prevent all of it and we're still always going to run into problems and we need to be able then to navigate like water through all the hurdles and burdens which we're inevitably going to run into and so it's true survival the soft overcomes the hard Soft things cannot break easily as they bend and yield. Even the hardest rock can be overcome by the gentleness of water or wind. Water survives circumstances due to adaptation. The river is able to move and change, flowing past any hurdles without effort, adapting to its circumstance. Into its inevitable inhilation, the ocean or death. Because if you think about it, right, you're on a river, you're in that river, you're flowing, you're going to go into an ocean or a lake, you're no longer part of that river, right? You're in the ocean, you're gone, right? And so it embraces the change from river to ocean, river to lake. We recognize these two things as different for a reason, okay? But the river doesn't worry about turning into the ocean. It's its inevitable fate. It doesn't want to accomplish anything. It just settles. That's what water does. So again, you put it into a cup, you get a cup of it and, and, and put it into a bowl. It just becomes the bowl. It sits there until it's moved by the wind, by effort, by energy, and it just adapts. It allows things to flow as they must. And so it basically embraces its nature. We live in a very yang world, and this is an active world. Ugliness, stupidity, or being poor is seen as undesirable. And so when we see flexibility in these, for instance, for example, it'll help us see their purpose and value, actually. Being poor could mean less to worry about. Being ugly means we are less likely to end up in abusive or artificial relationships. And people can like us for our personality. A crooked tree may not be used by lumberjacks, but it could then be used for relaxation or a holy site, whereas the other trees could not. So in this case, the uselessness led to longevity and less burden. And that is based on a story that's often shared online. So there's this common phrase, every cloud has a silver lining. So when we view certain things as undesirable, uh, we judge ourselves, we create all these standards for ourselves, we probably shouldn't do that. We should recognize we're standing in our own way. And this is what I meant before with this cold cognition and the problems with judgments and attachments, um, is recognizing you can be you, and there's nothing wrong with that. So the yin nature of water. Water always seeks the lower places, it makes the best of circumstances. Don't get set on one form. Adapt and evolve. Water is very yielding even to air. It is easily mixed with other substances, hence also why it can be easily polluted. So realize the vulnerability, the yin nature of water can have its upsides and downsides, but it makes the best of its circumstances. So we can still learn from it, absolutely, in our life, especially, again, if we are currently in a yang world. 
and there's still going to be yin aspects there in it. Again, just like any other extreme, you have some seeds of the yin and the yang, and you have some, you know, seeds of the, the yang and the yin. It's it's all there, but we recognize where's the extreme, where's the imbalance. And if you recognize there's people rushing and there's consumerism, there's all this yang, then you need to be able to say, where's the yin that can help bring this to a balance? Okay? So... Let's look at Taoist energy now, because this is going to tie in, and this is applying more specific practices uh, in Wu Wei or in Taoism in general. Qi, which is spelled Q I or C H I, you know, there's again many different pronunciations for these types of things, and I'm not Chinese. It represents breath or energy flow or life force. It is the same definition as prana in India or uh, Nivea in Greek or spiritus in Latin, okay? And so realize this is not a new concept, the idea of breath or spirit. And so when you have that idea of spirit, don't forget some of our words. And a lot of our words may come from Latin or Greek. So when you look at inspiration, it actually means in breath, okay? And basically means to inhale new and exhale old. So we have 20,000 breaths per day. Our arteries, veins, capillaries, end to end would be 100,000 miles, which would go around the earth two and a half times. We have 36 trillion cells. I mean, just fascinating. Everything breathes its oscillation, day and night, atoms with energy and motion, even with the possible Big Bang Theory. You see a breathing motion, an in and an out. And so we may define nature as movement simply, or constants therein as law. So change, right? We see change, we can say change is law. But similarly, we can call it movement. Movement is law. Movement is change. And so breathing is always taking place. Energy is always moving. Again, that principle of vibration we mentioned before. And so when we basically utilize our energy wisely, uh, we have an energy practice. So Qi Gong is known as Qi practice. More precisely, Tai Chi is known as great principle or universal natural law. Okay, now this is usually referred to a martial art, but not usually used for martial arts. It's often actually used for medicinal purposes. It is about balance. Uh, tai Chi is a type of Qigong with a more meditative manner. So the practice includes integrating the up, down, open, close, full, empty, right? And you can see this full, empty, open, close, right? Up, down, right? Internal, external, etc. I mean, we're doing it simply with, with the movements of our hands in Tai Chi, for instance. And so acupuncturists and feng shui artists also seek balance of energies within their practice. I mean, we talked about before how there's different colors, different furniture, how it can affect an individual's health. So um, Tai Chi, Qigong, it's not the only thing that could be used to help our breath work, right? There's plenty of practices all throughout the world, but these are two in particular that are highlighted among Taoism. So energy can be practiced as simple as walking with heel to toe, slow and relaxed, mindful movement. And you could go backwards as well, reversed walking. Okay, so that would be toe to heel. And then you improvise, maybe, you know, do some leg lifts, literally just walking. You can do this. See how challenging it can be. Literally just slowly walking, heel toe, heel toe. And see how present you become too as you focus more and more on it. And again, walking as a whole has become quite Wu Wei for a lot of humans, okay, because they learn it from a very young age. It essentially becomes part of their programming, their conditioning. And so when you become slow and relaxed and you learn how to become more present, guess what? Presence becomes more of your condition. You're able to see more in reality. Definitely helps for somebody like me, if I'm going to share some personal experience, I definitely overthink quite a bit. 
um, I, especially all throughout my life. So when I came across Taoism and Tai Chi, I found fantastic benefit within my life. In fact, I do Tai Chi. I try to practice every single day. Um, I absolutely love it. And I actually found out, wow, you know, I am flexible in a lot of regards, but my hamstrings are quite tight. Um, and I have some problems like with my calves that I never knew I had until I started exercising and finding out, wait, I have some tension here, you know, doing some self massaging, massaging the intestines, doing a simple Qigong, you know, belly massage. I mean, simple things can make a big difference. And you see, this is why Tai Chi is also promoted among, um, senior citizens or people who are, um, older of age, because it's actually really simple. Like anybody can do it. It doesn't take like super flexibility to do it. Um, it's just simple hand and foot movements and then coordinating those uh, with more and more practice. And again, it becomes a wu wei, it becomes effortless. I don't even have to think about it after a while. You know, George Thompson gets to the point where he's like, I can close my eyes and I feel the chi, you know? And, and I've gotten to that point, especially when I'm out in nature and I'm really in my element in that zone. I am able to feel more because again, I'm more present. So there's actually research on Qigong as well. It's not like this is just some practice that doesn't have benefits. Again, there's a reason why older folks would be doing it for their own health. Um, but here you can see some studies, not that we need them, <laughs> but there is extensive research on meditation, but also on Taoist energy practices. And so here's some example science of Qigong uh, you can see a chart on the screen, and this is provided by QigongHealing.com. And you can see it, uh, the numbers are quite staggering, right? And of course, I haven't looked deep into how the study was conducted and yada yada, but it tells you the gist of it. And it's still quite remarkable, I would say. I mean, this is Qigong versus stroke, which is a huge problem, heart conditions, especially in the Western world. So very very helpful for a lot of people perhaps just to consider applying it in their life just getting the circulation going right i mean you can't say that's a problem it's not like you're overexerting yourself it's not like you're also falling asleep i noticed when i did regular yoga i would fall asleep when i started doing taoist yoga it would involved more movements and more synchronicity i, I loved it um, and so it just got me going into Tai Chi, and then eventually I want to do some Qi Gong. And I'm sure after this video is shared and among the world, uh, I will probably have a lot more experience. And so just to remind yourself of the journey, don't forget about the journey. It's a beautiful journey. Yes, you might have some struggles in the beginning part, but when you see your progression, I mean, it's ever more inspiring just for yourself, uh, let alone others. So. Now let's look at internal alchemy. Internal alchemy is also known as Naiden. Okay, the failure of external alchemy led alchemists to understand that the true alchemical process should take place within the body. Now the reason why I say that is because usually when people do research on alchemy, they think of turning tin to gold, for instance. Uh, physical elements being turned physically into other things, but there's an internal alchemy that is particularly being referred to here. This is Nidan, okay, in, in Taoist medicine. So internal alchemy is focusing upon becoming aware, developing and using the Sanbao, known as the three treasures, which represent the three essential forms of energies that sustain our life in its human form. It's also related to the three pure ones, the goal is health and longevity. Okay, now the three pure ones, I think is more of a religious concept. We'll talk about that as well, but let's look more into this internal alchemy. Let's look at what these three energies are. The three energies are considered to be the three treasures, okay? Now, there's other names for them as well, the three jewels, for instance. And this is in Taoist traditional Chinese medicine, and this is as follows. You can see a chart on the screen that you can see. We have Shen, Qi, and Xing, okay? So Shen is spirit. And I have these color coded on purpose as well, in a sense to represent what they're talking about, usually in a sense of color coordination to like chakra systems, for instance. So spirit, 
Shen, it's the energy of the spirit, our connection to unity to our source. It is spirit, mind, God or deity, higher intention, supernatural ability, and bright. Okay, so when I say bright at the end, that's sort of like the color that actually represents what it is. So you can think of white or bright. You know, white co combines all the different colors in the rainbow. Um, so you can consider that like the highest color of the chakra system. But nonetheless, you can look at it higher intention, supernatural ability, okay? So that is the higher part of ourselves. And then we have chi, which is vitality. It's breath, life force, vital energy. The natural energy of the universe flowing into channels of the human body. It's our air, food, water, force, vapor, breath, vigor, attitude, and the color is usually represented as gray, okay? Now we have Jing. Jing is essence. It's the nutritive essence in a refined form. It's the energy of the physical body. So it's the sperm or seed. It's the refined, perfected extract, soul, animal instincts, genetics, or dark. So if you look at this chart, you can analyze it for yourself. This is why chi is so heavily uh, emphasized is because it's sort of in the middle here and it's our air, it's our food, it's our water, it's our basic needs, right? And it's, it's our exercise, our force, our breath. So when we look at Qing, it's more so our genetics, our sperm, our fertility. And when we look at our spirit, we look at Shen, it's more of our mind and tensions and what we're really doing here on earth and how with enough qi practice we can help nurture our shen but essentially these all help each other okay they all support each other and you can actually see this parallel in star wars there's actually quite a bit of parallels in star wars with taoism there's plenty of quotes you can even find clips online where yoda and different you know masters as said in star wars jedi masters uh say things that you think would be right out of the Tao Te chain and so uh, star wars has many exact parallels to that of understanding taoism and here are just a few charts you have the apprentice luke who is mastering the force and the force is known as chi and he has embarked on the jedi's way which is known as the Tao, the way in order to become a noble jedi which is known as a Daojun, or a gentleman of the Tao, and Master Yoda has already reached his highest potential and will soon become an immortal. And you can see that in the movies, he becomes like a sort of immortal form, a spirit that can always be talked to and referred to, basically transcended. And he's wise, you know, he doesn't speak often. You don't think of him as somebody who would uh, really do well in combat, but then when the time comes, he's able to show off with all his fancy moves and abilities it's quite impressive and so again you have chi is the force yin and yang could also represent the light and dark side of the force uh the Tao is the way the jedi's way and then you have those other parallels and you even see obi-wan kenobi and how he's using Wu Wei and non-action uh, throughout his progress since he became a master you know he sort of let things be and he sees uh, Anakin and see how he's trying to force things and how that causes a bit of tension throughout the series. So if you're familiar with Star Wars, you might understand what I'm talking about with that. <laughs> now there's another analogy we can understand uh, for the three treasures in Taoist traditional Chinese medicine, and that is the candle analogy. There's again another quite a bit of charts online about this one. And so Shen is looking at the spirit, awareness, mental health, your shininess, the heart houses your Shen. Okay, and so then you have Qi, and that's the energy, breath, attitude, day to day, and then Qing, which is your essence, foundational from birth. So the Qing is that candle, the, the Qi is the, the wax, like the, the part that becomes very useful for the Shen, which is the spirit, that fire, the, the light that comes from the fire of Qi. Okay, so the Qing gives way to the, the Qi, to the Shen. Okay, so Qing, Qi, Shen. And if you wanted to learn a lot more about this, I mean, there are very extensive texts about it. Here's one that people who study Qigong might learn in school. In case you want to look it up for yourself, it is 
incredibly in detail. Amazing stuff. You can find uh, treasures of information in these books, talking about just the nature of reality as a whole. It's quite impressive. And so I also came across um, a depiction of the Taoist human body, but there was no charts online that actually described each part of the chart, especially in English. So I made sure to do that. So in case you are interested and you want to see the Taoist depiction of the human body broken down into English, here it is for you. And you can see that we basically move up the chart from the very bottom. Uh, if we're looking at it. And so there's spiritual work involved, which is Wu Wei, which is us moving up along the spine of the chart. And so it's Qi moving through the spine and it goes through many different processes, which also those processes involve, of course, organs in the body. And then here's another chart that you might find online, incredibly complex. Again, this is not something I'm going to go in detail with, but it's worth knowing about if you want to learn about Taoism, because there still is plenty of practitioners who use this to this day. And there's a lot of uh, content creators in case you're interested. If you do a simple search online, you'll find plenty of people who break it down more than me. But Dantian is a very important topic for Taoism. So Dantian, Dan is elixir and Tian is a farmer's field. So we must plant the elixir of longevity and wisdom. Like a crop, it requires constant care as well as working with nature so to know when not to. So you have the upper Dantian, you know, I was pointing to my head earlier. The upper Dantian is between the eyebrows, the nervous system, okay? It's Shen, it's the use of meditation that allows us to really understand Shen. Okay, then we have the middle Dantian, and that is within the diaphragm, at the heart. This is the respiratory system, and this is where Qi is being used, and we can really nurture this with the use of Qigong. Okay, so meditation up here, Qigong here, and then what's down here? The lower Dantian is right below the navel. It's the endocrine system, it's Xing. It's the use of balanced relationships, really having a foundation for the rest of your life. I mean, if you think about it, you have parents or family, hopefully, in the beginning parts of your life that really set you up for success. And if not, then you create balanced relationships, whether with yourself or others, that can really help nurture your Qing. Okay, so there are several perspectives for Dantians, not just this perspective. You know, you have some that are vertical, some horizontal, and every Dantian model represents energy, storage, and flow consistent with that of a particular school within Taoism or Qigong. And I got a lot of this reference material from Qigong master Ken Cohen. So you can look him up if you want a lot more information as well. So Taoist practitioners, Here's an example of somebody who still practices Taoism to this day. Somebody I actually find quite inspiring. In fact, you know, he's sitting there with tea. If I could sit with him right now, I would absolutely love to do that. <laughs> Very quite jealous of uh, George Thompson for getting to visit Master Gu in Wudang and practice Tai Chi in the mountains, the heart of Taoism. Quite a beautiful experience, I'm sure. I don't need to really be jealous because nature is all around me, ever present, and I really don't desire to necessarily travel that much because I like to live a very simple life. But nonetheless, seeing this in Wu Dang and seeing how he's upholding the traditions is quite an amazing thing. Seeing his energy, you know, he's singing throughout the mountains. He's got a course online, but he's also sharing a lot of information for free and he sings songs. You can find songs of him singing online. It's, it's really awesome. It's quite amazing. Um, but you have practitioners like this Taoist master Gu from Wudain and they encourage qi flow or circulation rather than stagnation. This is the goal of a Taoist practitioner. And so Shen would be looking vital and glowing in appearance. This is how you know someone you know, really uses their Shen. And then Jing would be preventing stress or strain. Okay, so if somebody has good circulation, they got good Qi. If they don't have much stress or strain, they have good Jing and they have really good appearance and they have the Shen. So um, all these are helped through Taoist practices, but also through acupuncture, cupping, and other medicines. Now, 
again, those are signs to see where the body might be at. You know, I see it definitely in Master Gu. Um, and I think, you know, I have to pay attention to myself once in a while and make sure, hey, am I doing okay with my health? But I don't judge myself in the sense of, oh, I don't look good enough, I need to color my hair, I need to get some piercings, I need to put on makeup. I'm not trying to mask the problems because if nature tells me there's a problem, like if you get acne, for example, it's saying there's something going on wrong in the body. It's not something to be ashamed of, it's actually amazing. The fact that the body's giving you a signal, a sign that something needs to be paid attention to. So um, I would say, okay, well, maybe I want to pay attention more to my Shen, right? Maybe I want to use more meditation techniques, really relax, find a way to become more comfortable with myself. And I'm sure in that process, it'll help with my Qing and my Qi and all these again, help each other. So why not go for all of them? Why, why only focus on one, right? So the three treasures are also interpreted through a philosophical worldview, and that refers to the three concepts on the screen here. Compassion or kindness, simplicity or frugality, and humility or modesty. So compassion or kindness, this should be rather self-explanatory, but it means to love others like loving yourself. Simplicity or frugality, it's being wary of material or physical desires, because again, we see how it affects the human mind. We see how it can make somebody go crazy, be stuck in a cold cognition, uh, have a hard time with their own life. And that can have effects on their health ultimately. Okay, and so you want to love others like loving oneself. Um, this is very important because if you want to receive love as well uh, from other people, then you have to give it to them, right? Again, going back to the golden rule concept. And you have humility or modesty. Humility is very huge and important. Um, I know Jason Gregory wrote several books on these topics as well, but it means not being left brain extreme. It's not asserting authority over other human beings. I know this, you don't know this, you must know this, this is what you are. No, being able to be open and say, okay, this person's in this circumstance because of this, I understand. You know, I'm not in their shoes. I don't know what's going on. I, I admit to the reality of things. It's not like you're just caving in. The reality of things is that people are far more complex. So why judge, like we said before? There's reasons to be to have humility, not just that you should have humility. There's reasons to live simply or to have some sense of simplicity in your life. You know, not that you should just be living simplicity. There's reasons why somebody would consider this the three treasures, because they lead to a life with no excess, no imbalance. This is why Taoist wisdom can help a lot of people. And so you can see the three treasures are also translated among different ways. So here's a chart that shows all the many different types of translations, generally pretty consistent if you ask me. Uh, some of these I think are quite significant. Never to be the first in the world, never to be at the world's front, uh, not daring to be ahead of all under heaven. I think those are quite uh, powerful translations for humility, right? Uh, you have mercy, charity, which is quite interesting. Not that you would be showing it off, right? Um, pity, so feeling a sense of sympathy for other people again. Um, so, you know, look through this if you want, if you want more of the philosophical worldview of the three treasures. Now, to go back to Carl Jung, we can actually talk about a Nidan meditation, a specific meditation, which you can find in The Secret of the Golden Flower. This is a book that um, has been revived over time. And so The Secret of the Golden Flower, it was attributed to Lu Yan from 800 AD based on Ku Yan Yin from 400 BC. And then it was popularized in the book by Richard Wilhelm with further interest by personal friend Dr. Carl Jung. It also mentions the He Ming Qing, which again, there's many different texts involved in Taoism. The book is to help you transfer your awareness from your outer self to your inner self. Carl Jung found strong parallels between Chinese philosophy and alchemy in his studies on psychology. He realized that transformation requires the tension of opposites. Again, his word for that was also enantiodromia. 
So there's limits of science, Carl Jung tells us, actually, and this can become very important, especially for uh, understanding the Eastern perspective in the Western world. He says, quote, science is the best tool of the Western mind, and with it, more doors can be opened than with bare hands. Thus, it is part and parcel of our understanding and only clouds our insight when it lays claim to being the one and only way of comprehending. But it is the East that has taught us another, wider, more profound, and a higher understanding. That is, understanding through life. It does not consist of sentimental, exaggeratedly mystical intuitions bordering on the pathological and amanting from ascetic recluses and cranks. The wisdom of the East is based on practical knowledge coming from the lower of Chinese intelligence, which we have not the slightest justification for undervaluing. So what Carl Jung is basically saying here is do not undervalue the wisdom of the East and its philosophies just because you have all the science and technology in the West and claim to know what you think you know. Here's the East with its humility, recognizing there's a mystery inherent in the universe of saying we don't need to have everything figured out and there's actually more beyond what meets the eye. Quite fascinating. And so Carl Jung talks to us about what is the golden flower. He says it's the light, and the light of heaven is Tao. And the golden flower is a mandala symbol. Mandala refers to philosophical eye or mirror of wisdom. Quote, the key is this, we must be able to let things happen in the psyche. For us, this becomes a real art of which few people know anything. Consciousness is forever interfering, helping, correcting, and negating, and never leaving the simple growth of the psychic processes in peace. It would be a simple enough thing to do if only simplicity were not the most difficult of all things. It consists solely in watching objectively the development of any fragment of fantasy. Nothing could be simpler than this, and yet right here the difficulties begin. So he's talking about the paradox of how simplicity can actually be quite complex, especially in the modern world. And he says the golden flower can also be known as the holy fruit, the diamond body, or any sort of indestructible body. These expressions are psychologically symbolical of an attitude which is invulnerable to emotional entanglements and violent upheavals. In a word, they symbolize a consciousness freed from the world. So, a consciousness freed from the world, what does that mean? Is it being able to see more? Is it being able to see past the, the visions? I think this can be very powerful for the world and people who might be confused about their place in the world, who want to have a true sense of freedom, both internally and externally, okay? So, the Tao and Carl Jung, he has many quotes talking about Taoism. That's not just from The Secret of the Golden Flower. And you can see he talks about it. The Chinese would say the archetype is the only name of Tao, not Tao itself. He talks about a man who holds to the way of conservation all through life may reach the stage of the golden flower, which then frees the ego from the conflict of the opposites. And it again becomes part of Tao, the undivided great one. Eternal is the golden flower only, which grows out of inner liberation from all bondage to things. A man who reaches this stage transposes his ego. He is no longer limited to the monad, but penetrates the magic circle of the polar duality of all phenomena and returns to the undivided one, Tao. He says the goal of alchemy is not merely material, it is partly in the beyond, and is almost exactly similar to the goal of Taoism, where the whole effort is directed towards finding or creating Tao. The processing is the alchemistic procedure. This, Taoism, and the Book of Changes are all the same thing. Okay, so again, the Book of All Changes uh, is I Ching that he's referring to. And here's another graphic that somebody created online. I've had to share it here because they compiled a bunch of quotes from Carl Jung on Taoism. 
Look what he says here. He says, the truth is one in the same everywhere. And I must say that Taoism is one of the most perfect formulations of it I have ever become acquainted with. I mean, that is just a huge statement to make, especially from one of the world's most leading psychiatrists. I mean, that's just incredible. He says, Taoism is essentially a religion for the individual. He says, the central idea of Taoism is no moral question, but is the Tao, the indefinable essence of the right way. And this is also the mystery of alchemy. He says, Taoism has also a kind of yoga, but it is less well known than the Indian. The Chinese yoga is very much less founded on dogma. The yogin is left to find his own way through his difficult experiences. To translate meaning into life is to realize the Tao. In Buddhism, this return to nirvana is connected with a complete inhilation of the ego, which, like the world, is only illusion. In Taoism, on the other hand, the goal is to preserve in a transfigured form the idea of the person, the traces left by experience. Water is the valley spirit, the water dragon of Tao, whose nature resembles water, a yang in the yin. Therefore, water means spirit that has become unconscious. Carl Jung being his complex, crazy self, I love it. I think it's fantastic. And you know, he has a patient that gives him a testimony, essentially sharing their Wu Wei experience. Quote, out of evil, much good has come to me by keeping quiet, repressing nothing, remaining attentive, and hand in hand with that by accepting reality, taking things as they are and not as I wanted them to be. By doing all this, rare knowledge has come to me and rare powers as well, such as I could have never imagined before. I always thought that when we accept things, they overpower us in one way or another. Now this is not true at all, and it is only by accepting them that one can define an attitude towards them. So now I intend playing the game of life, being receptive to whatever comes to me, good and bad, sun and shadow that are forever shifting, and in this way, also accepting my own nature with its positive and negative sides. Thus, everything becomes more alive to me. What a fool I was, how I tried to force everything to go according to my idea. Isn't that interesting? How a fool I was, being willing to admit to one's own ego illusion that they were in, saying, I need to let go because I tried it and it showed me more than I realized, more than I was willing to do. And not just that they tried it, but they recognized the nature of the universe as well as always ever shifting. And so they didn't really have to try, right? They just let go. They, they practiced Wu Wei and they did not force their will upon nature. They simply followed the will of nature. So I just thought that was a beautiful testimony to share uh, with real world experience, somebody who was Carl Jung's patient. Now we have the gold pill. There's a lot of people in today's society who say we have a red pill, a blue pill, or even a black pill or a white pill, but they never knew there was a gold pill that has existed for a long, long time in Taoism. The gold pill is an ancient Taoist concept within internal alchemy. It is also known as the pill of immortality. It may be similar to that of the Holy Grail or Fountain of Youth. From Fourth Way today, quote, the gold elixir is a metaphor for the essence of true consciousness or one's fundamental nature. The creation of the gold elixir depends on the practice of the firing process. The fire is the power of effort in practice. The process is the order of procedure. Fire is a symbol of internal illumination. Forming the elixir depends upon practicing internal illumination or awareness. While in his ordinary state, man's awareness is almost exclusively external. To advance the fire and achieve illumination, it is necessary first to illumine the inner. This signifies refining the yin within oneself. The firing process refers to the process of burning away the dross of years, our conditioning, compulsive habits, sensory distractions, wandering thoughts.
replacing this dross with self-awareness. Self-awareness is a yang energy or yang fire. Still, the firing process requires a balance of yin and yang of flexibility and firmness. So sort of the summarizing the concept of the golden pill, the gold elixir, okay? And so it's much more than what people will call a black pill or white pill. This is looking at the foundations of life itself, our true consciousness, our true fundamental nature, which Carl Jung was talking about using the secret of the golden flower. So we have a lot more to share as we move on. Thank you for watching. This is the end of part two. Next, we have part three going even more into what we can do in our own lives or not do. Thank you very much for watching. Welcome to part three of Tao, the way of nature, a full return to nature. Now let's talk about being one with nature. What does that really mean? Nature does not complain about change, including that of seasons. A plant can grow to its peak, then completely die, but it comes back due to its seed. We can be cyclical, just like nature, having fortune and misfortune, just like the trees. As you see, they go from summer to winter. If you have four seasons, you see it's like, wow, these plants are dead, but they aren't. They come right back to life. It's life and death. We can accept these cyclical natures to become more optimistic because life doesn't end. There's always change. There's always a light side. Uh, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. There's always a silver lining in the clouds we mentioned. So we won't cling onto what we have or worry about what's to come. We simply build trust with the universe, with ourselves as part of the universe. We can also recognize that our life is this one big relationship where all organs work together in the body. Well, all people will work together in the world. All the elements work together in the universe. All the trees work together to provide oxygen. They're all working toward essentially the same goal or purpose, even if it seems like they're on their own accord. They interact with each other. They're bound to each other because they're in the same reality. So Lao Tzu tells us, let reality become reality. We need to be like water. We mentioned before how water is another way to describe the Tao. Bruce Lee is known for saying the quote, be like water, my friend. So it means to be calm and even. That life lives itself. We don't need to make life work. Quote, to tamper with it is to spoil it. To grasp it is to lose it. Try to grasp water. It can't be grasped. It's so essential for life. It can destroy tons of buildings. It can replenish all of life. And yet we can't really have a full grasp of it. We can try. <laughs> It'll evaporate out of our hands even if we do get a grasp of it, right? So the things we desperately want now are often the things that bring disasters soon. Also often, good things come out of seemingly bad things. So we don't need to attach ourselves necessarily to the idea that, man, my life is going bad, man, nothing's going to come back. We need to be able to become uh, more stoic more powerful and vulnerable to the elements, to ride like the wind, like Leitza, right? Because he saw that if you work with the fire, you're one with the fire, you're one with the water, you won't drown, you won't burn, like we said before. Just analogies to say that you won't be affected by the things that you embrace, part of your natural reality. Because you will become more in harmony with it, more in sync. You will be connected to it. And this is what we mean by being one with nature. So are we knowing enough about this universe and nature? We see that there's this world that we can ever keep learning from, as we mentioned before. But desires are not necessarily needs. Life is not about stuff. There are problems with consumerism, that is taking in more and more food, more and more material things, as it delves us into more of the man-made world and creates less gratitude. You have to observe young children who are natural explorers with creativity without need of external reward. 
there are children who don't look for candy, who aren't asking for, you know, more material things. Uh, unless, of course, it's presented to them and it becomes a habit and they're like, wow, I really want more and more of this. Because naturally, on their own, and you can see them in nature, they can entertain themselves. They will explore, they will be creative for even the things they do obtain. Man, what could we do with it? Could we jump on it? Could I bite it? <laughs> what could I do, right? It's imagination. And so, if we act more consciously, we can tend to what really matters. You know, understanding again, the conscious mind and the unconscious mind, the hot cognition, the cold cognition. Quote, overfilled the cup's hands drip, better to stop pouring, retire when the work is done. This is the way to heaven, Lao Tzu. Essentially saying to know when is enough, to know our limits, so that if we do gather water and try to grasp it into our hands, we know when to let go like a bird knowing when to stop drinking from a pond, um, knowing how much food we should give ourselves so we don't become obese or have any troubled digestion, right? There's different things we may recognize. Spices are not necessarily food, so we wouldn't consume them in high quantities. Because we know this and we act consciously, we're able to make better choices in our life. But really, we just know what is enough. And we know what works with our nature, our body. We are just simply trying to align to what is intended for our being, for the universe. And so you see those two kids on the beach there holding hands and they seem pretty content with life, right? And they're mysteriously looking out into nature. It's not much more they need in life. If they're by that beach, I, I've gone to the beach and people can just sit there and relax. They don't need much. That's until the external man-made world gets on their mind, then they start to worry. But otherwise, they're just at the beach. They're just having a good time. So there's this emptiness then, not just for our minds, but for our reality physically. And so let's look at what Lao Tzu has to say about this. Shape clay into a vessel. It is the space within that makes it useful. Carve fine doors and windows. But the room is useful in its emptiness. The usefulness of what is depends on what is not. Again, going back to the idea of apophysis before, understanding what is by what is not, and wu wei, non-action. It's the negation of something, but it still is action. Okay, so this emptiness still is something, and something we must understand. It might be actually very useful. Well, Passivity is the root to action. Where do you suppose to gain your energy from? You have to have energy from somewhere in order to do something in the first place. You need emptiness in your life via rest or meditation. It is the yin for the yang or the thoughts that arise. Your brain uses a lot of energy. Your body uses a lot of energy and we consider those active, yang. But they need rest, they need time. And so they need the space. They need all these aspects that we would consider generally yin. So you may notice this in the simple breath or cup of water. We cannot undervalue sleep and its need. Religious, spiritual, and scientific stories of the universe coming into being all affirm how something may come from nothing. Sound comes from silence. Nothing, which is yin, versus being, which is yang, okay? So when I say religious, spiritual, or scientific stories of the universe actually support this notion, you can actually go to many spiritual texts and you see how the breath is related to creating life, how nothing is actually the root to something. Because again, you need the space which allows it, okay? Look at this room, the picture of a room, a chair in it. You can't put the chair in the room if there's no room in the room. It's what makes it a room, the room. <laughs> Right? And it sounds so, so simplistic. But we may undervalue that such simplistic idea, that idea of having space in our lives rather than trying to always clutter, try to fill the void, feel like we need to always fill the void. Maybe we don't. You know, our minds can get us so preoccupied with things, especially as we get distracted. And then we forget the underlying things, the most important things in life. 
and that which gives us the time to really reflect on ourselves in case we need to, to create more conscious action in the very first place. So there's a connectedness in nature. Again, us being a part of nature. I can ask you that simple question. Are we a part of nature? Now, we may be a part. Are we a part, right? Everything depends on another. If we lived forever, we have no terms of being alive due to us not not being alive. Isn't that funny? So precious moments would not be so meaningful if we didn't have these distinctions in life. Do we need to fear death when it helps us feel alive? When we see that the bad, again, helps us understand the good, we don't have to see the bad necessarily as bad, but part of the process, part of this great life of learning, forever learning, connectedness to help us in our journey um, to savor the moments more. Okay, so let us understand this core concept that we're talking about with nothingness. To be more specific, no thingness. No thing. Placing value onto material things reduces our own value. What does money mean to death? Maintaining the objects of our acquisition is an even greater challenge than acquiring them. So we say we want something. Remember the hedonic treadmill we mentioned before. We desire something, we obtain it, but then soon we desire more things. And guess what? Now you still have the responsibilities of the other thing that you obtained. And then you're going to get more and more responsibilities until you overwhelm yourself. And then you're not actually going to be as happy, even though you have everything that you ever wanted. Interesting, huh? So consumerism is a sort of a trap which emptiness or nothingness can help solve for us. We are taught to think or be distracted, but not taught how to consciously not think. Consciously not do anything, right? Wu Wei. And so learning how to quiet the mind will help reveal that of which we missed or should pay attention to. We talked before about internal alchemy, and how there's even certain meditations, like the secret of the golden flower that Carl Jung talks about, where we can really learn to quiet that mind, and how valuable it is, especially undervalued in the West. And so, if we are stuck in the world of thoughts, we think entirely in symbols detached from reality. You know, because every letter, for instance, every word that you use, and you learn this in school at a very young age, these are symbols, right? I mean, you can even look at Chinese characters, and some of them are quite literally inspired by the natural world of just observing how things look. And the Egyptians did this too, you know, they, some of them worshipped gods too that were birds or snakes, and they all had symbolic reasons behind why they did that, trying again to capture reality into a man-made uh, symbol into a man-made title or category and that can sometimes stray us away from the mystery of seeing the bigger picture past it so we think entirely in symbols and then it detaches ourselves from reality which doesn't really have any symbols you look into nature and honestly the tree is just a tree you don't have to think of it as oh it has this molecule and this and that you only know that because you got a microscope now, there's other ways to prove that. Again, the ancients were telling us knowledge that we now approved with microscopes, and you can ask yourself and be like, how did they know that? But maybe it's because they really quieted their mind and listened to nature rather than having to use the things, the material things, in order to help them supposedly align to nature. That's not to say we don't use those man-made things. There's plenty of man-made things that can help us in our pursuit of nature, but we have to realize what was always there. For instance, a ventilator can help us breathe. We can say that ventilator is great, but we do it to help us breathe. We want to breathe. That's what we should do. Why are people having a hard time breathing in the first place? That would be something I would be concerned about, getting down to the roots, realizing that that machine exists because of something else that we cannot ignore. Right? And so, if we are stuck in the world of thoughts, we think entirely in symbols detached from reality. Madness may relate to talking to ourselves, having all these thoughts in our heads, having it 
bombard us in daily life. Oh, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. Oh, did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? Oh, uh, look at this. Like, we're so focused on it a lot of the time. And at least this is what I can see, especially in the Western world. And again, you may or may not share that experience, but we may engage in things just to divert ourselves from the emptiness reality. Just to diverge ourselves from having to look at ourselves, from having to change our own behavior, confront our own traumas, our shadow work, as Carl Jung would say, we don't want to sit down with ourselves, be present, or take the time to reflect or empty our mind, because we're afraid to some extent. We, and again, we don't also see the value in nothingness, in emptiness, in simplicity. But there's a reason why all the spiritual teachers of the past were talking about it. And you see it over and over and over again. It's not like it's just one person saying this. You go through most Eastern philosophy, back in ancient times especially, and it talks about this. And there's a lot of people who are spiritual, spiritual today who even engage in something called minimalism. And they find great benefit for themselves because it creates a clearer mind. I know this for a fact as well. When I was moving out of my old house, my mind was clearer than ever because I had nothing in the room. I actually liked it. It was like a feeling of freedom, not having to worry about it, not feeling so cluttered and feeling something different as well, right? So we chase money, which has no real value except what we think, honestly. If we are being honest with ourselves, it's just a piece of paper. It's just a piece of paper, this money that we attach ourselves to. Now, maybe it's gold, maybe it's silver, but even then, it's still things that we attach value to. And is it as valuable as, say, your life or food itself or the things that we may use money for? And do we attach ourselves more to money than those very things which we say we want money for? And so we can also question celebrities. You know, we praise celebrities. We put people up on pedestals. But they're just people like you and I, right? Are they not? Okay, they have some accomplishments and they've done some things and they can be admirable to some regards. But do we need to worship them? Do we need to praise them and put them up? on this this standard of wow this person's better than everybody else or they can do things other people can't do or um they need to have a red carpet we need to give them more money or whatever you know it's a sort of a, a fixation a hyper fixation on other people and other things when there's value within yourself and you can learn from other people and use things for yourself but Many people will attach themselves to those things and want more things. They'll attach themselves to the celebrities and it becomes their reality. They're so involved. They become what a lot of people call nowadays parasocial, as if they are part of the celebrity. They know the celebrity and they live their life. They watch their vlogs. They watch their videos. They engage in everything they do. But now they lose touch with their own individual present reality. So this is the value of being able to step back and see the value in no thingness. We need to clear the mind because for the problem to be, you need to be thinking about it. Your mentality matters. If your attention moves elsewhere, the problem ceases to exist until you next think about it. Quote, if you can empty your mind of thoughts, your heart will know the tranquility of peace, Lao Tzu. Quote, paradoxical as it may seem, the purposeful life has no content, no point. It hurries on and on and misses everything. Not hurrying, the purposeless life misses nothing. For it is only when there is no goal and no rush that the human senses are fully open to receive the world, Alan Watts. And he says, seeing the emptiness of things can help us cultivate stillness and peace of mind. If you do not know how to keep still in this crazy world, you will be drawn into all kinds of unnecessary trouble. So a peace of mind 
and it can get really troubling in the modern world if you are constantly hearing about nuclear bombs, this country, that country, this person, this death, and this robbery, and you go on the news and you see this constant stream of all oh, this stuff has happened, you need to be up to date, you need to know about the weather, you need to know about that, but do you actually need it? Is it essential for your living? Do you, in your nature, rely on it for your living, for your thriving? Or is it actually a hindrance on it that makes you worry more, that makes you too careful, or that makes you want to do bad things, things you would have never thought of, have all these thoughts in your head you would have never had if you weren't exposed to that information, to that fear? And seeing as it is fear, or seeing it um, as distracting is what allows us to then have a peace of mind to say, I don't need this anymore. People take a break from technology. People take a break from the world of thoughts. They go on vacation and they do this because, again, it helps them clear their mind. It helps them get away from the busyness of the world. But that busyness is often very much self-inflicted. So if we want to get out of that, we have to realize that we probably caused it for ourselves and we can help ourselves then get out of it because a lot of the problems in the world, we may say we don't have a, a place to really fix it, that we can't fix it, that it's helpless or hopeless, but in reality, we do contribute to it. Again, everything is interconnected. So realize your part. Realize your place. Do not undervalue yourself. And again, don't externalize everything. Don't also internalize everything. But remember what Lao Tzu says, look within. These are where the answers are found because you as an individual, you do have a mind of your own. And you don't want to let that mind become corrupted or too influenced by other minds and the external world. You have it for your own for a reason. So there's uselessness that we need to see the value in. Talking about nothingness and talking about not being so busy all the time, not having a clear goal or direction in life that many people are looking for. Maybe it's the exact opposite. When a tree is not being used, it leads to its preservation. As I mentioned before, it can be useful for other means. When humans don't possess many desirable traits, we are often saved from a lot of trouble. Similarly, we can't hold on to the external. Many people use unhealthy coping mechanisms, and they don't let go into nature. They let go into technology, or drugs, or alcohol, or things that will ultimately just keep pushing down what is coming up to the surface. And again, nature's giving you signs. It's giving you acne. It's giving you signs in your life, stress, these feelings that aren't to be ignored. It's your body saying, I can't take this anymore. I need something to change. And so if you keep pushing it down with coping mechanisms, it's still there and it hasn't been addressed until you address it and face it head on, essentially. But how do you face it head on? Perhaps it's this letting go process. It is actually fasting the heart. We will talk about this more. And we've talked about it a little bit before. And again, with internal alchemy, this is all related. Useful people can't be useful without those that have no use. There can't be doctors without patients. If you are perceived as a bad person, you can realize that you can make others feel good about themselves. Nobody is actually useless. Nothing is actually useless. I never strive to make this presentation, for instance. It came naturally. There still is effort involved, but none of it is forced. I think about a lot, and I clear my mind away from it often so I can focus on myself and focus on what really matters my own reality here, but I want to help your reality, and I see how helpful this information can be, so I do have a moral obligation to share it with you. But I do not forget about the yin. I do not forget about my emptiness. There are times I can get distracted, right, even while making the presentation, but I can choose how I react. 
So I don't become reactive, but responsive in the fact of I am choosing consciously where to place my attention, what I'm giving my time, and if I find it actually really beneficial, which, you know, this information helps myself. It doesn't just help you. I made this for many reasons. I wanted people in this community to come together around so much of this knowledge, as much as the knowledge comes together on its own. Because I realized that hasn't really been done on the internet before. And the internet is this tool that we can use to help further our progression of knowledge or our understanding of the dangers of knowledge even. It's simply an aggregator of bringing out more of this human expression. And that has some downsides and it has some good sides. I'm trying to use it for a good purpose, right? But part of that purpose is realizing nature was before this, this screen, this presentation you see right now, nature was before this. Talking face to face was before this. Being present among each other was before this. Let's not forget about the roots. That is the true value in life because it's nature. And we would hopefully use tools like this to help us in that pursuit. Because many people like that. There's many sciences emerging about simply being among each other or being grounded with the earth and being in touch and in contact. And we don't have that contact as much if we're on technology, for instance. So what is a Taoist lifestyle? Because I talk a lot so far in this presentation about essentially what we can do for ourselves and our minds. But what about as a whole, in our entire life as a whole? Well, a Taoist lifestyle is, looks something like this, okay? Meditative walking, walking in nature, and especially in the morning. Now, do not judge yourself, again, if you do not do all of these things. They are to inspire you and help you understand that these can help you perhaps in your alignment to nature, but you can experiment with these on your own. So going to bed at 9 to 11, waking at 5 to 7, you can look out in nature and see that a lot of animals go to bed when the sun comes down and then they wake up when the sun goes up. Now, me personally, at this moment of recording this presentation, I absolutely do not follow the schedule. And I have no problem with admitting that to you guys. Because the first step to changing something is admitting that you haven't done it or admitting your own faults. Or as Socrates would say, uh, realizing your own ignorance is basically your path, your first step toward knowledge. Okay, so it's no shame to feel like, oh man, I'm not doing that. It's just to realize the value that may be there in doing that. And to try it and see what happens. And maybe developing a schedule and seeing how everything in nature follows this schedule. So why aren't humans? Now, we can eat until 80% full to not overeat. This is like a simple tip or rule of advice and getting a balance of macronutrients. There's a lot of people who have very strict ways of eating and I'm not here to say exactly what you should do. You should be able to experiment and find out what works for you. I think if people are honest with themselves, they'll say, yeah, this food is more natural than this one. This food is healthier for me and they know. So trust your internal wisdom Make sure to reflect on these foods and think about what is actually going to fulfill your health. And oftentimes people may eat very fast, you know, and they overeat because it's really good or it's addictive. And they may not realize that the food's addictive or it's tricking their taste buds or there's sugar in it. Um, they're not conscious, they're not breathing, they're not putting the place sitting down once in a while, looking around, sitting with friends, sitting with family, you know, playing music playing games, these are things that can really help an individual in their own health, right? And I say this again, it depends on people and seasons and all this stuff, but generally speaking, you look across tribes, you look across ancient cultures, and these are what the people did. This is what brought you to where you are now. And being conscious of the food we consume can then help us understand when we might become full so we don't overeat. And that's very important because we don't want to overload our digestion. Even Hippocrates, again, the father of Western medicine said, you know, the digestion is the root to all evil. And a lot of digestion takes place in the gut, which he says is the root to all disease as well. And that's over 90% of the immune system. 
according to modern science. So you also need to exercise. This is important. It's the yang part of your life you may consider. And that is for balance with the inactivity. For instance, you watching a seminar, I doubt you're actively working out right now. Now, maybe you are and you're doing both at the same time, though it may be better to focus on the information to be more inactive. But maybe after you watch this or if you want to take a break, maybe do some Tai Chi, do something that gets your body moving a little bit, jump around, have fun. There's no strict way of necessarily expressing that chi and energy. It's always happening. Every time you do some sort of energy movement, you're expressing that chi, right? And so if you do intense exercise, complement it with stretching and meditation. Realize the yins and yangs in your life. I think that alone can help your entire lifestyle because that's Taoism in a nutshell, right? You're listening to your body to know what to do. This is the yin for the yang. And you want to make generosity your default position because you can observe how receptive the world will become. Again, going back to the three treasures, simplicity or frugality, humility, compassion or kindness. And a lot of people say they want this in the world. Well, if they want that in the world, be the example of change. Show it. Start it. You can be the one. Don't rely on others, right? See if you come from that position how other people react. Now, not everybody's going to react the exact way you want them to react. But see generally net positive across the board how people react. Positive to positive, it would make sense to me. Now, again, there's many different influences in the world that can affect people's mentalities. But that does not mean that we just ignore um, what we know we should do to help maximize and optimize our potential here on Earth. And again, the golden rule is very much related to this notion. So do also learn from other animals while recognizing your own species. Recognize you're not other animals, you're a human being. So you have many aspects therein, like intellect and the mind, which can create all sorts of crazy things. That is beautiful and amazing. But there's also animals that are always with their family, that are always following this sleeping schedule, that are listening to their body of when is enough to drink and eat, etc. And they go to bed at the right time. They master balance. And they do so without effort. They don't do so with all this complex thinking of humanity. They do so because it's part of their intuition. They listen to their intuition and they aren't. Um, distracted by so much materialism. They don't need materialism as much as humans. Again, we're the ones creating it for the most part anyways. So we can learn from other animals. Even Mark Twain wrote about this, saying how humans are essentially the lowest animal. I thought that was quite significant um, because it helps us become more humility, have more humility in our lives. To recognize we aren't on top of all the other animals we aren't to rule over them but recognize that we are among them we are all part of nature again you know the minute we start putting ourselves higher we dim our own light as Lao Tzu said before so we want to achieve our flow state with Wu Wei i.e. the dance dances itself typing types itself I don't even have to think about typing I've gotten to the point where it just happens on its own and you know what I didn't learn how to type I didn't do anything like that, take any courses. I just sat at the keyboard and typed. And yes, I was originally looking at the keys, but over time, I didn't have to look at the keys anymore. It just became natural. Again, second nature. It became Wu Wei, and that became a flow to the point where I can look away and start typing like this. It's amazing. So we can learn how to truly relax and prevent overstimulation. Learn how to take action when necessary and learn how to relax so the world doesn't get to us. This in whole is generally a summary that I see of the Taoist lifestyle. Now we can adapt to life because this is a very important notion of understanding why we would see the value in nothingness or uselessness or see the value in Wu Wei and not doing. Um, it's all for a process of adapting to the ever-changing uh, life or Tao itself. And that adaptation is embracing change. 
if something that needs changing can be changed, it is worth taking action. If it cannot be changed, we must adapt and accept. The living are soft and yielding, the dead are rigid and stiff. Living plants are flexible and tender, the dead are brittle and dry. Lao Tzu. Follow your strength instead of trying to repair your weakness. Now, some of this might sound like I'm repeating what I said before in order to emphasize these examples, right? And to help you further understand the connections between the points we're making as we introduce new concepts. Because oftentimes, again, we forget the past, we forget um, the, the ever present, to be more specific, we forget the yin or the things that are hidden that are still there that we just have yet to see. And we do have strengths, even if we say we are weak, even if we push ourselves down, we just aren't giving light to that of which is not so down in the, in the deeps. I mean, we, we, we push on ourselves all the time, we make all these judgments, but we don't realize we still have it better than other people. And that gives you reason to say, well, gosh, why am I then so pushing myself down? And how does it help for me to push myself down? It doesn't help my current circumstance, right? I can understand why I might be feeling down, but I don't need to succumb to that. It doesn't need to be my reality. Like again, suffering does not need to be my entire experience of life. It can just be one part of the experience of life, but it doesn't take us down. And so do not fall to coping mechanisms. Realize them as coping mechanisms. Realize your distractions. Don't escape life, address the problems. Experience life, face fears. Life doesn't need to be enjoyed or suffered. It only needs to be lived. Quote, pursue knowledge, gain daily. Pursue Tao, lose daily. Lose and lose again. Arrive at non-doing. Arrive at Wu Wei. Instead of trying to be occupied, make time for emptiness. That might be one of the greatest Taoist lifestyle tips that it can offer us, is helping us realize um, that we don't need to be so occupied, that we can give some space for the yin, which should have as much space, if not more, than the yang if we are in a yang extreme world. And if I generally ask somebody, or if I ask yourself, do you give more time to what you are doing or what you are not doing? I guarantee a lot of people will say, it's what they're doing because they think that's what's important but they need to realize that it's also very important to have fun to let go to be present to let the mind relax and this idea of unlearning of knowing less losing daily rather than gaining daily relates to a concept called unschooling the concept of unlearning in Taoism may be related to that of unschooling to provide freedom rather than indoctrination. Because that's ultimately what happens when we free ourselves of the desires and attachments. We achieve freedom. We are able to see more. We are able to find out our opportunities and see more potential. And Dana Martin has written a great book about this in case you're interested or maybe you have children or you plan on having children in the future. This helps you get started essentially with getting your kids out of the system, the current man-made dogmatic yang-based systems that you may see are destructive and maybe you don't and you want to balance that. Whatever choice you want to have with this, I want people to simply be aware of this because unschooling and unlearning kind of go hand in hand here with realizing um, what do you actually want to do? What do you actually want to learn? Rather than having some set curriculum and structure telling you what to think, where you're not learning how to think, or you're not really pursuing your own interests. And Dana Martin really emphasizes the idea of the child should want to learn. The child should want to enjoy their schooling experience. They shouldn't feel like they have this burden on them. I remember having tons of nightmares when I was in public school and worrying about the kids and how they judge me and all this stuff. And you may say, yeah, you know, that, that's something every kid needs to learn. It doesn't mean that we have to torture them and put them through the, the modern busyness of the world just so they have to experience that reality. That's not our natural reality. And if we're being honest with ourselves, 
schooling at most uh, starts with the parents. Uh, you know, it's your own kid and they're going to be with you for the rest of time. I remember my teachers, but I never see them again. I remember a lot of my schoolmates, but I'm never going to really see them again. Um, and so when you were with your family, I mean, you're going to have your family till the end of time and your family, you know, they're the ones who held you when you were a baby. It's a very important thing. Again, our ancestors, I don't think would pass us up. They were with each other a lot. And so it's just something to bear in mind. Take this as you will. Um, but radical unschooling, a revolution has begun. It's definitely helped people see the value in homeschooling this book. So be sure to check it out if you're interested. Having control. Well, it looks like humans want to have control over everything, but letting go and being able to have nothing or um, in the sense of simplicity, um, realize the value in nothing, maybe means the opposite. So your thoughts can take control over your own life, even though you are more than your thoughts. Okay? You are way more than just what your mind is yabbering about in your head. You attach yourself to labels or judgments, even though you are more than that. You put yourself down even when problems are inevitable. Again, you're going to run into problems. By giving compassion to both yourself and others, you give yourself and others freedom. You say, it's okay. It's fine. It is what it is. We can hold all experiences and learn from even the most intense emotions and judgments. We can just let it flow past us, not becoming attached. You can watch your reactions, treat them with kindness. This is the common saying, this too shall pass, or no storm lasts forever, or change is the only constant. But the speed and how we react is up to us. Do not forget and in regard to solutions. So someone may mention to you, wow, you know, meditation's great. Uh, being simplistic, having less material things is great, but don't forget about what other solutions also exist out there, okay? Because as great as meditation may be, somebody might need therapy. Someone might need someone who can sit there and be that outsider for them and see the thoughts that they can't inquire for themselves that are so deeply ingrained within them an outsider point of view. We'll talk more about that as well, but um, we see this as why there's practitioners of internal alchemy. You know, there's the individual that can practice it on their own, but then there's practitioners who aim at helping other people with their own alchemy. There's a reason why they want to help other people. There's a reason why I made this presentation. When you can read the Tao Te Ching for yourself and understand it for yourself, there's a reason why there's a bunch of content creators like me or Sanjoy or George Thompson and many others who will produce tons of content about mere poetry uh, because we can expand on it and we can provide more perspective on it, more clarity as to what it's saying, right? And it maybe can help inspire you to realize you can do the same thing. Absolutely. So we learn to stop controlling our environment and we learn how to let go. This is again, Wu Wei. To stop controlling nature is to instead allow nature. The journey is the destination. Let us not project upon nature. Do you, don't do others. Those who are trying to control everything make life unbearable for everyone. This is based in fear of not having control. You can think of many people who want to keep their position of power in the world. Man, they're going to try to hold on for that for their life. And that may mean at the cost of other individuals and in their life. Well, that's why it makes life quite unbearable. So anytime people have fear of themselves or others, expect it to give way to many problems in the world. Are they really fearing catastrophe when people fear not having control? Well, they're not fearing catastrophe. They're fearing not having control. And that's the truth. People are also afraid of doing nothing, that they will do something even if it makes situations worse. They don't actually fear catastrophe. They fear just losing a grasp on life and losing 
a sense of control, losing their sense of direction, losing the fact that they know it all. And you see this in politics, you see this in many ideologies. I know the way of the world and no one else knows. I got all the answers. Medicine, the same thing. This is the only drug. This is going to heal everybody. This diet. Very dogmatic, we may say. Because people are fearing the idea that there can be another way. And they don't actually fear the catastrophe of the fact that, you know, they might be wrong. Um, they also just simply fear the fact that they don't want their own image to be ruined. Their own reputation. The fact that they've held on to something for so long. It's an attachment, and so we perceive doing something as success or uselessness, um, being in control, whereas doing nothing as uninterested or as weak. So we intentionally not just don't see the value in doing nothing or non-action, we quite literally say it's bad. We say it's uninterested, weak, it's not something that should happen. When I could gladfully admit that me not pushing myself out there has prevented a lot of trouble in the world because I can observe others who do and they run into problems all the time and they have to worry about this and that and I enjoy my life as simple as it may be. They can go out and risk their life and may not be fearful. Okay, great. But then there's times where they have a lot of responsibilities because of all the things that they gather with them and attach to themselves. And then that can take a burden on them over time. So it's about realizing that we can take risks in our lives and be fearless. But at the same time, take the moment back to be conscious of what we're doing. Uh, with that emptiness, that empty space. Cold to hot cognition. Okay? So we are allowing life when we realize the value of nothing. Ness, no thingness. When you arrive at non action, Lao Tzu tells us, nothing will be left undone. Mastery of the world is achieved by letting things take their natural course. You cannot master the world by changing the natural way. So he's telling us that humans are trying to change reality, trying to master the world, but they may be doing so not realizing that there's a natural way in the universe. There's this Tao, there's this course of things, this ever-present change that means that it's way beyond you. It means that you can try to change things according to your whim, your opinion, um, but realize to an extent you have to let go to what simply is truth or reality itself in its own way. And so anger will dissolve. Opinions change. Food must be given time to cook. We can't keep touching our wounds. We should keep our hands to ourselves. All these notions. We can sit with our problems, letting them erode. Quote, Who can be still until the mud settles and the water is cleared by itself? Can you remain tranquil until right action occurs by itself? The master doesn't seek fulfillment. For only those who are not full are able to be used, which brings the feeling of completeness. So, again, we're freeing ourselves and our minds by allowing our minds to not be so attached and allowing ourselves to just go with the natural way of the world, allowing the mud to settle because we become still, we become tranquil. And the right actions come at the right time. We act at the right time. We don't seek to go beyond our means, necessarily. We simply do as we must. It is what it is. And so it's the law of reverse effect. This is a term coined by Aldous Huxley. And it's also called the law of reverse effort, or the backwards law. Quote, the harder we try with the conscious will to do something, the less we shall succeed. That's essentially this law of reverse effect. If we accomplished so much, why must we continually remind others? These people who like to brag about their accomplishments. Well, can our accomplishments speak for themselves? We become more admirable, not trying to be admirable, because the more we try to push what we have in other people's faces, we actually make ourselves uh, 
less of an admirable person, even though that's what we're trying to aim for. Again, the sense of humility or humbleness. So this is how we don't have an ego. We become humble and secure with ourselves. We can't force creativity. Mystery drives creativity. And so we can't really push ourselves to be creative. Actually, quite the opposite. During peaceful moments, showers, walks, before bed, we get ideas basically spontaneously. And man, do I know this from experience. Being someone who, you know, I consider myself an inventor since a very young age. I've liked to reinvent games and make new things all the time, new forms of things. I would merge them together and essentially improvise, right? But all my ideas, a lot of them came during these exact times, showers, walks, and before bed. And so when I came across this idea of the law of reverse effect, I was like, this is it. This is that light that Thomas Jefferson or Benjamin Franklin was talking about where suddenly you get this light bulb of an idea and it's there in this this random second in time and if you don't capture it then you might forget about it. And that's what I that's why I write everything down sometimes. And writing down helps a lot. There's a lot of, you know, medical literature about writing down your thoughts, journaling what you eat and how that can be beneficial because you are reflecting and putting it down on paper so you can see for yourself your own thoughts and how they progress over time. But those ideas that allow you to write in that moment and be in that flow and to have a spontaneity in life, this is all Wu Wei. And it's so valuable because this is when some of the best ideas come out, right? So we can't get in the way of our own nature. Quote, the paradox of Wu Wei is that striving less, not trying harder to win at all costs, often generates more success. And that's a quote from an athlete. His name is Christopher Berglund. And there's many people, athletes, who are just in the zone. If they were worrying so much about what they were doing, they would probably worry less about the game. But the thing is, when they're in the game, they're not worried because they're in the game. They're immersed. They're part of the world. Remember how I said before about World of Warcraft, you're part of the world. You're part of those passive abilities. You accept reality as it is. And the more you immerse yourself in a video game like World of Warcraft or any other game, the more you start to master it because you're one with the game. So the same thing with nature. You become one with nature by immersing yourself part of it. And so Wu Wei involves not a focus on results. So we can become more immersive, we become more present. We're not so focused on the results. If we were so focused on the results, we would be, wow, when's the end of the song? Well, then there's no point of the song. <laughs> the song is so we can enjoy the song in every present moment. I know people who talk about how they have ADHD and it helps for them to listen to music because it keeps their mind more present. And there's people who talk about during meditation to listen to sounds because it helps you be more present. So this is just a little bit of understanding this sense of being in the zone or Wu Wei immersion. Think of driving how people are presently focusing on their ability, not able to predict everything in the future, who's going to do what, but focusing on their ability in the same way, again, an athlete plays in a game. And so this allows a writer to write or an athlete to perform before effects are actions. And so we're focusing on the actions. Results don't come from desiring hard or constant thinking. They come through action. That is the very root to effects in the first place. So this law may also be known as if an individual attempts to resist reality, it will make problems worse, not better. Okay, so there's essentially two ways of looking at this law of reverse effect. It's that way, understanding that we can't resist reality and also recognizing that we can't try so hard to do something because reality has a certain flow or way to things, which is what we're talking about with understanding the Tao. So there's power and softness. We live in a world that admires strength, strong words, bodybuilding, military action, the desire for defense, etc. We want to avoid weakness. We are ashamed of it. Weakness is seen as a lack of strength, but it is softness. 
And here's a quote from Lao Tzu. He says, weakness is how the Tao works. Well, he also told us it's like water. So water and weakness go hand in hand. But bear in mind, the water overcomes the heart. We saw this before. The soft approach does not come from anger, impatience, or fear. It is the intelligent approach. It's the Wu Wei approach. It may be unpopular, yet it is so fertile. It's unpopular to sit back or to do nothing, but yet it is fertile for a ground of creativity for ideas. And again, I can relate to this if I'm going to share more personal experience. Being able to be isolated can have a lot of benefits. I think this idea is also explored in the movie and book Ender's Game, where they talk about this kid who is isolated and he's able to be more creative and create more things. As an inventor or somebody who likes to create things, as I said before, having the time alone allows me to actually come with more ideas than if I was distracted and doing a bunch of things. But doing those bunch of things can help me for my time where I am thinking and relaxed and reflective. So they both feed each other, but we cannot deny the power of softness. We cannot say that softness or weakness is not more powerful or equally as powerful as strength itself, okay? The individual who may not have a lot of muscle like me, who may not care about looks, well, is that really a bad thing? Just because I don't have physical strength? I may have mental strength. I might have a will that is stronger beyond the person who has physical strength. And that can matter a lot. There's plenty of yogis and people who are spiritual, who don't have muscle. And there's plenty of them who do. It doesn't matter. The point is, is that there's strength in whatever weakness, if you can see why, in the same way you can see how these different judgments we had before about ourselves, these so-called bad judgments of ourselves, are not so much bad. They have a place. And so, let's just understand then, putting softness and strength into application in the real world, with power systems that be. You have order or chaos. Well, a tyrannical ruler who rules with intimidation and fear actually attracts constant opposition. This becomes a vicious cycle that then creates separation between leaders and followers. There essentially becomes chaos. Whereas the leader who would be virtuous or of integrity is someone way less people would attack but they also cease to be a visible leader. So there is order as things take care of itself. Isn't that something? Order because things take care of itself. And we talked before about the Yellow Emperor and how he had this dream of a self-governing world where he did not touch much. And because he didn't touch much, things sort of just work together on its own. We'll be exploring a lot more of this idea and this exact example as well. But for one example, we can look at prison systems. You can look at the large prison system in America. It does more harm than good. It is based on dealing with criminals, based on anger and fear. It is based on hardness, ultimately. Systems that work better are due to softness allowing individuals to learn how to gain self-control. An example country would be Finland. We may notice similar profound truths in observing the success of nonviolent resistance. Nonviolent resistance is a form of protest in which there is no violence used, and it works some of the best, actually. There's a lot of scientific research about this as well, how um, the greatest revolutions in history have always been nonviolent resistance forms. Uh, and so just some examples would be Mahatma Gandhi, the Quakers, and Martin Luther King Jr. So should people change simply because others are doing it, because they have no choice, or because it's actually the better choice? You tell me. When it comes to the prison systems, when it comes to solving the problems in the world, should they just do it because it's conformity? or because they have no choice, or because it's actually a choice that is better. And this is why nonviolent resistance works as well. 
They didn't need violence to prove their point because they stood with the truth and they trusted the truth to do its own work on its own without counterintuitive action. Because they saw that if they were trying to end violence, why would they introduce violence? It would just feed more violence and it would be easy to put the blame on them for the violence in the very first place and it would make their cause less successful. So Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. and these individuals and these different groups throughout the world, throughout history, have used nonviolent resistance, prove to the world, hey, <laughs> you can do it all without weapons. You can simply change hearts and minds and the world will change on its own because there's a certain truth in order to the world. There's this Tao that if you work with, you can actually produce better results than trying to forcibly and hardness work with the Tao, which you can't work like that because softness and water is the way of the Tao. So when we have conflict in our lives, the act of sitting silent and questioning allows the individual to learn more. They may have the most knowledge because of it, as they also have knowledge of their approach. They are the softest in a room of individuals arguing over who is right. And so we can't be too firm. When we say survival of the fittest, it does not need to imply survival of the strongest, as one may adapt to their circumstance to survive. Rather than having to be the strongest in the environment and overtake everything else, no. Maybe it's the exact opposite, and that's why they survive, because they're able to adapt and go with the fact and accept the fact that they're not so strong. Okay? So, this is realizing your own power, realizing the value if you aren't so strong. Again, as I mentioned before, how I may not have physical muscle, it doesn't mean I'm weak. I don't have to say I'm weak. I can say I'm strong. But it depends on how you look at it. And the same way we look at water, we say, man, water's weak. Well, it depends on how you look at it, because it can destroy huge civilizations. Careful with what you claim, because your assumptions will not hold up when you see the other side of your own arguments, the yin to the yang, right? And so when you're in a conflict, think about this. Rather than feeding into the conflict and making the conflict worse, maybe learn how to be silent, learn how to ask more questions and approach with softness instead. And this is also simply represented by the Bao Quan, if I'm saying that correctly. It's essentially this movement right here in martial arts, okay? So it's one hand, open palm essentially, over a fist. Okay, so this is used commonly in many different martial arts. And in particular, if you're looking at like judo or um, tai chi, uh, this is used as like a bow or for starter moves even in attack. Okay, so when there's even such a thing as attack in these martial arts, it's more so avoiding combat so that the attacker essentially attacks themselves. And so the hard fist is the yang. And that symbolizes rigorous practice, attack, okay? But the soft open hand, yin, symbolizes being virtuous and disciplined, stopping the attack, okay? So you can think of it as like self-defense, which is why people get into martial arts, but also the soft overcoming the hard. It is self-discipline and restraint, okay? self-discipline and restraint. Another interpretation is that to cover aggression with peace is to indicate that there is such a power within you, but you choose not to use it. So I have the ability to take on things with brute force and violence, but I choose not to use it. Maybe I choose it at the right time in the case of self-defense, for instance. Or maybe, even better, I understand the use of nonviolent resistance like Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. Okay, because they're like, we don't even need to use self-defense. They're acting very intelligently. So that's self-discipline. Let's look at a caretaker for an animal as simple as a tiger. A caretaker would not feed live animals to tigers as this would arouse their ferocity. A caretaker would not feed them when they were hungry or full, so they'd be contented when fed. 
No force was used here, only knowledge. If force was used, tigers would retaliate or leave. So this is just one example of how a mere caretaker of an animal can learn um, how to best optimize their environment and make it so that the tiger is not dependent, um, is not attached, and also is not angry, not fearful, but is just content. And that's essentially the goal, right? Is to just be content. This is happiness, as we mentioned before. So overthinking, this is huge because I definitely have been prone to overthinking in the past. I mentioned this before. We can't overthink. Quote, intellectualization sets up a kind of interval or lack of report between you and your life. You think about things so much that you get into the state where you're eating the main ahead of the dinner. You're valuing the money more than the wealth, confusing the map with the territory. Alan Watts. So are you living in symbols? We want to get into the territory, to get into relationship with what is as distinct from ideas about what is. So when we look at symbols and I say, are you living in symbols? What I'm actually saying is, are you looking at the context behind words and not just the words? And there's a lot of people who are so focused on paperwork and signing their signature in certain ways and having to do things in certain ways with language and symbols. But what if I just stay silent for the rest of this presentation? Are you okay with that? I mean, are you able to accept the fact that there might be some silence? That um, my delivery presentation style may not be the best. I mean, are you overthinking the fact I could be doing this presentation better? Are you thinking about my appearance when instead you can be thinking about this material and really taking it in for your own life? I am so prone to overthinking because I will look at something and I can judge it a hundred ways at once or I can simply just accept it. It's fine. It is what it is. It's, it is how it is and there's nothing wrong with it because it is how it is. Now, maybe there are some judgments I want to make, but I'm not going to go head over heels on it, as the expression would be. My head is not going to take over my heart. I'm not going to become so passionate and angry about something and let my head get to me because how many times have you get into an argument with somebody or done something and then maybe a week goes by or a day goes by and you're like man that was so dumb why we talk about that why we argue about that like this is silly because we get so wrapped up in here we don't realize what we're doing and the symbol on the slide for here is actually called brahman and it's a very common hindu symbol and so this has to do a lot with what we're talking about here with recognizing this higher law, this higher principle in the universe. Okay, you can look up that symbol if you want. There's a lot of people who use it uh, to represent a lot of the concepts that we're talking about as well. Again, there's a lot of synchronicities among many Eastern philosophies. So your experience here on Earth, quote, what you experience in you are the same thing. Then realize also going beyond that, that you are in the external world you're looking at. You see, I'm in your external world, you're in my external world. But I'm in the same world you are. My inside is not separable from the outside world. And then he further goes on to explain, we've completely got rid of the person in the trap, the one who either dominates the world or suffers under it. It's vanished. It never was there. So Alan Watts is telling us here the acceptance. And this is why, you know, you have a picture of a girl basically hugging a tree. She's one with the tree. She realizes the tree is her best friend. The tree's no different from her. The tree, if anything, will live longer than us, <laughs> right? But it's amazing. We can't live without the trees. And the trees also can benefit from our existence. So there's a shared reality here. It's not just your experience, but our experience. This does not make everything collective because there is still value to recognize in the separate. Just as we would separate yin and yang from each other and then recognize they're both together in the same universe, we don't 
just to stay focused on the fact that everything is one and the same or the fact that one thing is separate from another. We look at both. This is what makes it integrative and holistic. So you can look at a maple tree, for instance. A maple seed grows into a maple tree, but it's unique. There are patterns, but within such patterns are pluralities. Everything in nature is unique. So you as an individual, you're unique. That's what makes you beautiful. The fact that you will have experiences that other people do not. That you look a certain way that other people do not. Even though we're all humans, the fact that every single one of us looks different from each other, even twins will have differences between each other, is amazing. Because despite the similarities, there still is uniqueness therein. I find that quite powerful. And so let's look now towards status and need, because we're talking a lot about our needs, we're talking a lot about our identity. So the tallest trees catch the most wind. Being at the top requires more effort to stay. There is more competition. So why chase success? This idea of success. What is success? See, the opposite extreme of this would be asceticism, which would be attachment to deprivation. So we don't want to have absolutely nothing, but we don't want to be ahead of the world and have everything that other people do not. So why chase failure either? You know, we don't want to chase success or failure. It's about what we actually need. Animals in nature take as much as they need. And this is moderation among the flow of life. That among your flow, there's going to be things that come to you and you need to be able to work it into your life. Like those negative thoughts that come to you, you don't ignore them, but you see them as passing by. And just like when you're meditating and those thoughts arise, you acknowledge those thoughts. You don't deny them. You know, you don't push them out of the way, but you, you acknowledge them and you let them pass by because you recognize everything does pass in time. Change is law. And so the more we focus on our breath, say, in meditation, the more those things just disappear on their own. And so we don't really have to worry about it so much. And so if we've paid attention to what we actually need, uh, we don't have to worry so much about all the other things we may attach to that need. Um, that we think we need. And again, the key word here would be think. Our brain gets so much in the way of our body and what we actually need. So for instance, we may say, well, I'm on this diet. I need to eat certain foods. But your body just wants nutrition or it wants to be healthy in certain ways. And it may not be what your brain is telling you that you should eat. Maybe you have to listen more to your body. So status and need, when people are chasing success or failure, Taoists would say, no, don't chase either one. Recognize that they're both just polarities meant to distract you and pull you toward an extreme. Recognize moderation. And so there's an embodiment that needs to take place. Embodiment means being able to not get stuck in the head because now you recognize the whole body. The mind is always active. It's always going crazy thinking, right? So if we can be able to let it be in alignment with the body and, and tone down so we're not all stuck up here, we can become embodied. It's who I should be versus who I am. Recognizing who you actually are. It's conscious of feeling our body and environment. It's feeling the elements using your senses. It's presence. The burden of the future often negatively affects the present. This is why the best performances of any kind are done when there is no worry. It can be playing a game for fun or practicing to yourself. Immersion or flow breeds skill. As a swimmer forgets the water, a soccer player becomes the field, and a painter becomes the brush. Worry, judgment, and a focus on results can overshadow skill. You don't produce a song just for the end of the song. You can embody winning to never lose. You can choose where to place your attention. In knowing ourselves, we know others as we are connecting with nature. So that is just a bunch of different examples of how we may understand our Wu Wei our embrace in life.
And at some point in time, we do have to embrace if we want to truly relax, if we do want to be content. And if we want to accept the body that we have, we can't be trying to work so hard against it. Maybe we're putting on loads of makeup and trying to be somebody we're not, right? But if we know ourselves and we accept who we are, we can actually better love ourselves rather than this artificial, dependent, attached person we become when we say we need makeup to be happy. We need this to be happy. Like there's this common saying in Buddhism, get rid of we because that's ego or I, that's ego and want because that's desire. And then all that's left is happiness. So embody happiness, be one with happiness rather than attaching your ego and desire into the mix. Let us find out then what is real happiness, money, status, fame, power, knowledge. Are you dependent on these for happiness? Quote, people who can't get these things fret a great deal and are afraid. This is a stupid way to treat the body. People who are rich wear themselves out, rushing around on business, piling up more wealth than they could ever use. This is a superficial way to treat the body. Swangza. What he's saying here is he's looking at, again, two sides of the polarity. People who are so worried about what they can get and it's a stupid way to treat the body he says right you can't get these things oh my gosh socrates even has quotes about this too and again the guy didn't even write but people created writings based on his teachings and he said you know if you desire something you're not happy once you get it you're not happy even if you had everything you're still not happy <laughs> it's because you're not content and so don't treat your way your body in a stupid way treat it with intelligence and the fact that it's okay to not have everything in the world it's okay to have less in the world it's okay to just accept the way things are and so here's another quote the more wealth you possess the harder it is to protect Lao Tzu. and so you can't overfill a cup Quote, those who know they have enough are truly wealthy. So life is for living. It's not for worrying. It's not for stressing. It's not for desiring. It's for living. That's what makes it the word life. This is what happiness is. It's contentedness. So when we're so worried about even knowledge, man, I don't know enough how to be happy. Maybe that's also an issue because the idea of Wu Wei, of nothingness, of meditation, and the reason why they work for people when they're used without necessarily an intent to use them, just because they're relaxing, just because they are part of their practice, part of their life, they recognize it as an essential part of the life being the yin. It's just part of the way. It's not in the way. It's part of it it's not a part of it <laughs> right so we're not looking at knowledge we're looking at embrace which is far more than knowledge because now you're having knowledge of reality so often when people talk about knowledge they're talking about things that may not matter things that are temporary events people these are all temporary but the spiritual ideas are actually way beyond those there's another quote that's quite famous online where if you focus on people or events, they're not as impactful as if you were to focus on ideas. And what we're looking at right now is ideas. So they're way more powerful. But even beyond the ideas is what allows the ideas to be created, which is this silence, which is this emptiness, which is also this contentedness. Okay. So there's a balance that needs to be made if you see among um, what we're talking about in this presentation. The yin and yang is always at work, as I mentioned. Nature has created everything with its own attributes. Only judgment makes it appear as if there is a problem in need of conformity or man-made standards. Why can't we be who we are? Judgment shouldn't be our main mode of operation. Not that we should never judge. So we stay centered. We unlearn. We become who we are meant to be because we simply are ourselves. So Zhuangzi tells us, follow the middle. Go by what is constant, and you can stay in one piece. Keep yourself alive. Look after your parents. 
and live out your years. So go by the middle sounds a lot like what we said before about moderation. Not having too much, but not having too little either. Working smart instead of working hard. It means to set your sails to work with the wind. Our efforts not to be unhappy generate anxiety. Our desire for happiness is why we are unhappy. We must balance our emotions, as even being too happy can also backfire. La da dee da, I'm super happy in life, and then you realize, too, something ha sad happens and it can push you down. Unless, of course, you want to remain happy and you can, just realize that one extreme to the next, if you're too happy and you're too busy being happy, you might forget about something serious that requires a serious mentality, right? There's a reason why there's love. There's a reason why there's seriousness. So everybody might say, love is the answer. Well, yeah, but also not loving at certain times. You need to know when is the right time to act. There's a reason why there's people who have to be serious at times, but sometimes, and a lot of the time, they put in their own head, I have to be serious, right? So recognize we're probably being serious more than we have to, and maybe we can be too loving more than we have to, but that there's an essential value in recognizing when to be serious, when to be loving, when to be happy, when to be sad. And if we're gonna attach ourselves to those things, that's when we get stuck. And we don't want to get stuck because we recognize nature is ever changing. And if we want to go with that way, it doesn't get stuck. And so being like water, being able to flow past the hurdles and just let things be. So balance in this case is actually then self-control. It's an art. It's to not exceed. And by having this balance, it allows us to create a peace. So balance for peace, self-control for peace. This is how we find peace. So we talked about happiness, we talked about peace. What this ultimately is all for is to conquer thyself. Conquering others takes force. Conquering yourself is true strength. Knowing what is enough is wealth. Lao Tzu. Quote, there is no greater calamity than not knowing what is enough. There is no greater fault than desire for success. Therefore, knowing that enough is enough is always enough. If you worship or place real life value on money and things, then you will never have enough. Worship your own body or beauty, then you will always feel ugly. When time and age start showing, you will suffer. Worship power and you will end up feeling weak and afraid, needing more power to numb your own fear. Worship your intellect and you will end up feeling stupid. Now, if you don't understand why any of these would be the case, psychologically, mentally, then I encourage you think about it and reflect on it. Reflect on these words. There's a reason why Lao Tzu wrote what he wrote. And even though knowledge can be dangerous, we often also recognize how powerful and useful it is. It's just you get to a certain point where you realize knowledge is not everything and that there's actually value in not having knowledge, which allows you to have knowledge in the first place. Maybe you'll get there along your path if you keep following your heart, you keep reflecting on these topics because that came to be my conclusion and it came to be Socrates' conclusion of, wow, I know that I know nothing. That's the meaning of true knowledge. That's what he said. And so true knowledge is not knowing anything or, or knowing nothing. To know that he knows nothing, meaning that really there's so much more he doesn't know yet. So he, he can't really say he has knowledge. There's so much mystery. And I think this opening effect is what the Taoists are leading us to. To recognize we need to keep opening our minds. To realize we can't get stuck. And so when we worship something and we pray something and we say this is what we need in life, we need to reevaluate is that really what we need? Is that actually what's going to help us? And so we need to learn then how to face problems. Problems cannot exist without a perceiver. As circumstances aren't troublesome without someone or something identifying them as such. 
Therefore, nothing is inherently problematic about reality. We create problems that don't exist. If we see beyond the titles and ideas or just our perception, we're able to see this. And this includes the notion of morality. It does not mean we disregard what we may consider moral. It means we recognize that others may have different perceptions from us and that our perceptions is not the truth, that we have to ultimately work together to find the truth because we are among each other. So no one person has the truth all figured out. So that's not a reason to then praise one person or praise some standard and say this is the only way. But actually, it's more of a means to recognize we need to keep learning and recognize that our problems are just stepping stones toward more solutions and that the problems don't have to stop us and nor does our learning, nor does our solutions. If our problems don't stop us, then why are our solutions stopping us? That's how we're going to run into problems because we have to recognize both our problems and our solutions are not set. They too are prone to change because change is that law. It is nature. And then therefore you may say nature is the only solution, but it's a very grand one that involves so many of these internal polarities within. We'll talk more about that as well. So in Buddhism, to give more perspective upon this, there's a concept called the two truths. And those two truths are relative truth, which is conventional, subjective, or perception, and absolute truth, which is the world as it is. It's the objective. The relative obscures the absolute, as it is a perception of reality, but not reality itself. And therefore, it's an illusion. The absolute truth in Taoism is considered Tao, which is way or nature. So it's seen as this thing that is the objective. Okay, so you can see these man-made standards as among the relative truth, and you can see the Tao as this absolute truth. Quote, the Tao is like an empty container. It can never be emptied and can never be filled. Infinitely deep, it is the source of all things. It dulls the sharp, unties the knotted, shades the lighted, and unites all of creation with dust. It is hidden but always present. I don't know who gave birth to it. It is older than the concept of God. And so that's a quote from Lao Tzu. He doesn't know who gave birth to it. He's admitting to what he doesn't know. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Especially from a philosophy or what some people call a religion, which we'll talk about too. <laughs> admitting to what you don't know? That's blasphemy. You have to know it. You're, you're saying this is how the way is, and this is what the world is, and this is how the world works. He's saying no. <laughs> That's the problem, is people thinking they have it all figured out. Because you cannot fill the Tao. It's an empty container. It's nameless. That's what makes it so absolute is this idea of how universally obscure it is, but yet present it is. And so this also ties into the idea of a Lee or organic pattern that we can recognize an order, but we can't really put a name on it. And it is not Tao itself, but it connects to this concept. We'll talk about that too. So going back to the idea of problems then, if we're looking at truth and there's this relative and absolute truth, Let's see what Alan Watts tells us. He says, so long as you are in the present, there aren't any problems. Things just do what they do. There was the coming in at the door person and the person sitting here and now is not the person who will die. All the past and the future, you feel it dragging at you every way. Suppose you wake up in the morning and it's a lovely morning. And some of us have got to go to work on Monday. Is that a problem? For many people, it is. It spoils the taste of what's going on now. When we wake up in bed on Monday morning and think of the various hurdles we've got to jump that day, immediately we feel sad and bored and bothered. Whereas, actually, we're just lying in bed. <laughs> so, I find that amazing because it's true, you know, how many times we worry about something that hasn't even happened yet, 
And how often, too, when you make plans in this life, it doesn't go according to plan. So why do we worry so much about the future? Again, it's going to give us anxiety. And if we're looking at the past, we might get depressed. So we want to stay present. Buddhists state, quote, suffering exists, but no one who suffers. Deeds exist, but no doers are found. A path there is, but no one who follows it. And nirvana is, but no one who attains it. Again, basically saying the same thing Alan Watts is saying here, where we're worrying about problems that we don't even have. We are saying that there's things that need to be done, um, but no one's doing them. Like We are contradicting ourselves because of our desires and our suffering that we create from it. So problem solving. How do we solve problems? Well, you need to feel free to make mistakes in order to find the truth or learn how to do something. And you need to take your time. And so a question you can ask yourself is, are you looking for faults? Are you looking for, man, am I not good enough? When do I need to be doing something better? And you can change your appearance and you can continue to embrace the concept of fault. Man, I do not look good enough, people will say. Rather, we can change our attitude, which is the one thing we can change, and that is our mind. It's mentalism, the principle of mentalism, right? That which creates all things. These things that I have around me, this glass of water, which, by the way, we should take a water break, this had to be thought of by somebody in order to exist. So, you know, we can change our attitudes, feelings, and experiences of circumstances, but we can't change the circumstance itself. Unless we want to change the circumstance, guess what? You still have to change your attitudes, feelings, and experiences. That's the only way you're going to do it. Again, staying on the now rather than looking so at the results and looking at the things that haven't even happened and don't even know if they will happen. So why do we forget something painful? It's because we changed. Some problems are better dissolved than solved. And this is the value in non-action, meditation, and making space for solutions. So this would be essentially the Taoist way you may be able to problem solve in your own life. We need to, in this process, celebrate life, you know, because again, seeing things as problems can be an issue within itself if instead we can see it as part of the process of life. We don't need to cling to life, we can celebrate life. Quote, I have heard that those who celebrate life walk safely among the wild animals. When they go into battle, they remain unharmed. Lao Tzu. The fear of death is what makes us cling to life. And so, you know, it was actually quite funny. Yesterday, I was at the beach and I sat in the water, in the ocean, and I sat so still that there were actually fish swimming around me. And there were people who were not so far from me, but they didn't have any fish around them because they were moving so much and doing a bunch of things and yelling. And I was still, I didn't let that affect me. And my breathing was so relaxed because that's the beach. It does that to you as well. And what a serene moment. And then to have the fish just swim around me. I had like 10 different fish. I was basically one among the animals. And I've also had friends tell me about how they've been on mushroom trips or how if you're relaxed and you go into a lake, say with an alligator, the alligator won't feel the need to attack you because you aren't going in with a fearful heart. They can sense your heartbeat. They can sense your presence in the water because they're one with the water. So they can tell if you're in a mode of panic. And this is why some people will say, hey, you know, if, you, if a dinosaur is looking at you, stay still or don't panic and they'll leave you alone. Because if you panic, that's when they start running after you, right? There's been many different analogies to that type of thing. Just figured to mention it. But it's the fear of death. is That's what makes us cling to life, you know? Because, again, death is just part of the process of life. And in the process of fearing death, we become a threat who are more likely to be attacked. We cling to wealth, beauty, and reputation. And if these things are life to us, that is where their fear of death really is. You know, somebody who really clings their life to these material things, losing those things, oh man, I have no life now. What? Your life is way more than those material things. No, my life oh, it depends on these material things. That's what makes me happy. 
they put it in their own mind that without those things, they can't be happy. And so they quite literally cling to material things for their life. And we can also, again, do this with death, which is a rather more natural concept, um, but we don't if, accept the fact that it is a natural concept because we fear it happening when fear is always going to detract us away from embracing what is. So fear is not usually ever really a good thing in our life, but being that it does exist, recognize where it is perhaps useful. It's perhaps useful in the nick of the moment that let's say something is about to attack you and you need to react. You need to be able to react intelligently, which your fear can get in the way of, but your fear will allow you to snap in an instant, to be able to instinctually move. So it's still there, but then being able to overcome the fear can make you really, really effective in what you do. So there's no need to worry. Change is to be embraced. Death is a natural process. And again, you know, Swangza, he weeped a little bit about his wife dying, but he did not worry long because he realized it was part of the process. So he says here in this quote, it's nonsense even to think about whether heaven and earth can or cannot be destroyed. Whether they will perish or not is something we don't know. If heaven and earth will not perish, that's great. We can live our lives without worry. However, if they will perish, that's something we can't do much about. So why worry about it? So he's saying in either case, no matter what you think about heaven and earth being destroyed or not, there's no need to worry. So let us not assume nor worry. He's telling us to be more carefree, to let go into the world and have more trust because all this worry that we create is again, these problems that don't exist, that we make for ourselves. So let us now understand what this whole process is called in Taoism. When we understand the value of emptiness, understand the value in not being so fearful, not being so attached to the material things, recognizing death is just part of life. It all has to do with this concept in Taoism called fasting the heart. Now the Chinese word for heart is xin, jin. Uh, I'm not sure how to say that exactly, but it means mind or the heart mind, okay? So the heart is actually the mind in Chinese. So that can get a little confusing, but anytime you see fasting the heart, you can then think of the mind or heart mind. And so Confucius even tells us, you hear not with the ears, but with the mind, and not with the mind, but with your soul. So the idea of detoxification is applied in whole in Taoism. It is important to silence our senses and learn how to let go. So we're not just detoxifying our body in the sense of nutrition, but in our own thoughts, our own brain. Since we cannot know or perceive the Tao, we can, however, feel it through oneness and inner peace after we go through this unlearning process we talked about, the unschooling, the unlearning of letting go of the man-made illusions that are there stopping us from becoming who we are. Okay, so the fasting thereof sensory, including thought and pleasure, will help us actually achieve inner peace. And remember, and remember peace has a lot to do with balance and self-control. So fasting the heart helps us gain a greater control over our senses and what we do in this life. And the same reason why somebody would probably be fasting in nutrition as well, because they want to have more control over their own health. So that way disease does not take over the body. And fasting has many benefits in health, for instance, which is why people do it for all sorts of different reasons. And again, it's literally not eating anything. It's apophysis. It's the negation of something, not the addition of something, but the negation. So why do we fast the mind? Well, the more stern we are, the more brittle we become. The stronger we desire something, the more painful not acquiring it becomes, as we said before. The more troubled our thoughts, the darker we see the world. The more we feel like we possess something or someone, the more domineering we become. The mind wants to separate yin and yang. 
when they are inseparable in reality. And so when we embrace imbalance, like us versus them, or attaching ourselves to viewpoints, it creates division. Using the mind helps us, okay? It helps us with many things in our lives, as you may be able to acknowledge from the Yang perspective, but the mind can use us without learning how to fast the mind or fast the heart. So fasting the mind is essentially quieting the mind. And you can see this picture here. It's like, I don't know what this is. Seems like some sort of flow, but do you really need to think about it? I mean, it's just a slide. It's just an image. It is what it is. So let's clear our vision. Fasting the heart or mind may also be known as fasting the conscience. And for any of you who don't know, conscience, consciere, means to know together. So there's a lot of things we might know, and there's a lot of things we might conform to that other people know. But that knowledge still can help distract us from what is happening now in our present reality. And so Lao Tzu tells us, can you coax your mind from its wandering and keep to the original oneness? Can you let your body become supple as a newborn child's? Can you cleanse your inner vision until you see nothing but the light? Can you love people and lead them without imposing your will? Can you deal with the most vital matters by letting events take their course? Can you step back from your own mind and thus understand all things? Seeing a greater knowledge, Lao Tzu is telling us, is seeing past our points of view where we say we have knowledge. Which again is the humility that Socrates had when he said, I know that I know nothing, or that there, there's more that could be known that I don't currently know. Because life is ever teaching us more and more, and life is ever changing. So we create a clear conscience by fasting our heart, fasting our mind, and we become receptive. As we become still, like water in a valley, the mud settles and the water becomes clear. Why do people fast in health? Self-healing. Well, it's the very same phenomenon here. The mind can self-rejuvenate. Our thoughts can self-heal themselves. So we can think more clearly, more rationally. So perhaps instead of trying not to abstain from the pleasures or material things as you would in other practices like Buddhism, we can quiet the mind and become still returning to source which again, a lot of other Eastern philosophies also do, okay, so not to generalize here, but to say that we don't have to just cut out material things and think that's what's going to make our lives better, or just stop doing the things that we think are destructive. Rather, we can fast our heart and quiet the mind. It can be used to go from yang to yin for balance. So can you really enjoy life if you are always analyzing everything? Are you reactive? What gets you somewhere in the first place? It's openness. We need humility, not getting stuck or getting arrogant. So we live with what cannot be avoided, and we starve the mind of distractions. That's ultimately this process of fasting the heart. Are you living with what is ultimately reality and what cannot be avoided and starving the mind of the distractions, the things that are pulling you toward ideology and this is how things must be done and this is how we must view the world and this is what I need to do, this is what's going to make me happy. Instead, you know, you recognize, okay, my body's telling me I'm hungry so I can't really avoid that, I'm going to accept it, right? I'm going to go along with its desires. But these other desires, I recognize they're not so natural. They came about in this Yang-based world, and they're going to take control of me if I don't take control of it. So this process of fasting the heart creates what is called the uncarved block. This is another term used in Taoism. Very, very core and essential. In fact, I even define Tao as the uncarved block itself in the beginning of this presentation. So the uncarved block represents the beginner's mind or our childlike nature. It is where our vision is clear as there is no ego keeping us stuck. Your nature is still wood, even if you're carved. 
Think of it like that. Your block of wood, this is what the uncarved wood or uncarved block represents. But when it gets carved, we need to realize we're still wood, even if we've been changed over time or in different forms. An uncarved block has unlimited potential. It is simplicity because it hasn't been carved. It hasn't been malformed from its original state. So this means dropping religions, politics, ideologies, and standards, assumptions, attachments, expectations, desires, burdens alike. Sounds like a big task for a lot of people in today's world. Um, but who am I to say it's a big task? Why are we saying it's a big task? See, if you were making assumptions to say, well, I can't do that. I can't get rid of religion and politics. It's always on my mind. This is something that makes me who I am. Well, now you got an attachment going. Okay, so I think being aware of how those attachments uh, affect you and your ego will be a helpful stepping stone in understanding this uncarved block and fasting the heart. And so we need to chip away at that ego with fasting the heart. And so the modern world is obsessed with image and even viewing images for such. And we need to become shapeless to not be formed into those images in order to move like the river. For instance, if you see praise and blame create each other, you don't give into the division. You don't praise, you don't blame. You just accept both. They aren't fed. Like this quote here from Evelyn Waugh, to understand all is to forgive all. And again, what Lao Tzu said before, to really have this fasting of the heart mentality, um, you are able to see all things. So you see the place of praise and blame, but how they essentially create each other. So if you start praising one person, in a sense, you would be blaming another. And you may not realize it like that, and you may not see it like that, but the Tao is point of view, and the yin-yang point of view helps us see that. So we need to achieve the still point, which is another way to also say this. Quote, renounce knowledge and your problems will end. What is the difference between yes and no? What is the difference between good and evil? Must you fear what others fear? Nonsense. Look how far you have missed the mark. Lao Tzu. And he's referring to following the way of the world past all the debates to see all sides as part of the whole beyond just black and white. Again, seeing the whole yin yang and how they both work with each other. Here's another quote it's from Zhuangzi. When there is no more separation between this and that, it is called the still point of the Tao. At the still point in the center of the circle, one can see the infinite in all things. Quote, the Tao, said the master, belongs neither to knowing nor not knowing. Knowing is false understanding. Not knowing is blind ignorance. If you really understand the Tao, beyond doubt, it's like the empty sky. So again, being able to see life originally and as it is, simply as it is. This sounds not so easy, but again, when we say it's not so easy, we are putting it in our own head. So be aware of it, because you may acknowledge that when you were a kid, you viewed the world way more simplistically. And now you have all these worries that you did not have when you were a kid. Recognizing that alone can be quite powerful for this concept of the uncarved block or the still point. But it's even greater now that you have the ability to think and rationally go about in your own life that you can work with your mind instead of against it. Uh, you can work with your body instead of against it. So these two can be whole and together and connected. And everything in life can be seen as together and connected and whole. So long as you do not create divisions among it. That's your choice. Okay? So this is the Taoist method. Okay, the Taoist method is the ability to dissociate and distance ourselves from our societal or social roles. Even spiritual gurus are prone to illusion and ego. So nobody is exempt from this. Nobody's got it perfect. OK, 
okay? We all must be aware of the things we may not be aware of. This is the whole concept of yin or meditation or the uncarved block and the still point. The more you care about other people's approval, the more you become their prisoner. And here's a quote from Matthew 18.3. So this is from a Western religion, the Bible. Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So a way of sort of reminding us and helping us understand this uncarved block. We become more like the uncarved block without the pollution of the world that occurs through socialization, culture, advertisements, etc. So does that mean exposing ourselves less to that? Well, it can certainly help but maybe even greater understanding how they affect us and how they maybe even program us to this day. We do certain things maybe unconsciously that we don't recognize that we're doing. So why are we giving our energy away to social media, for example? And this is a big point of contention too. A lot of adults will even blame a lot of the world's problems on technology and social media. And this new generation won't realize that because they grew up with it. So they take it for granted. They don't realize there was a world before that where people were more socially together. So unless you took the time to step back and really empty your mind, you would not see that. And that requires seeing beyond social media and thus seeing reality and how nature has always operated for so long. If we accept social media as our reality and we're giving it all our energy and attention, we might not be giving real connections and real relationships our attention and energy. So we are to go to the stillness or the simplicity or the no thingness back to within what may be the past. Being uncarved occurs by fasting the heart or mind or wiping the Tao, as it is said. Nature is actually perfect then in this view, and we only perceive it as imperfect because we learn to accept this is the world we are given. What are we going to try to go against it? we have to learn how to work with it. So we are then able to realize our problems as gifts, like acne on our skin or even feeling lonely. They can actually help us see things and learn and realize that these are not really bad things. Okay, you're lonely, you think you need company, but you can use this to your advantage to do some things that people who aren't lonely can't do. Oh, you have acne on your skin? Well, at least you have an immune system or a liver that's telling you that there's something going on wrong in the body or something needs to be paid attention to. It doesn't have to be perceived as wrong. And so Alan Watts tells us, quote, it is to work upon nature with skill and craft, but to move in the direction in which nature is already going so that we're going along the way, the flow Tao of life, so that the uncarved block may be extended into a sculpture. Okay. And so when we talk about cultures and we talk about society, this notion of society, we talk about what a lot of people conform to. There's a book called The End of All Evil by Jeremy Locke, where he even talks about the dangers of cultures, and he talks about it quite extensively. He states, if authority is not questioned, if it is accepted as the proper ruler over man, slavery is the result. Germans failed to question the culture imposed upon them by the National Socialist Party. So this is an example in history that led to loads of catastrophe simply because people did not follow their own nature, but followed instead an ideology, a standard. So their servitude to Adolf Hitler and his war machine were the result. Billions failed to question the culture of brotherhood championed by communism totalitarian slavery and the deaths of a hundred million people was the result. Large or small, when you yield your mind to culture, it will make a tool of you for its own purpose. It begins when you limit your speech out of fear of culture. Cultures limit the choices available to people by creating arbitrary rules for your life and enforcing them with peer pressure. Crushing the spirit of people allows culture to gain their obedience. So I find that 
amazing as a quote. Uh, this whole book is very simplistic, much like the Tao, and has great meaning within it. So if you don't know about it, I would recommend reading it. Um, mostly because it helps you just tear away at a lot of the programming that you may have been in. Um, but always have an open mind to see, is there any programming taking place even within this book, even within my presentation, right? There's always that nuance to things of seeing the bigger picture. So in this case, he's saying whether you followed Hitler or Stalin or anybody at the time, you were following a culture and that led to chaos. And it did. History has shown it on repeat for thousands and thousands of years. And so there's people who have been debating Taoism um, online. Not much, really, though, because Taoists wouldn't be the type to really debate. Um, but if you do look it up, you might find this video online by an atheist group called Cross Examined. So they particularly look at Western religion and criticize it. Um, but this video is titled Dude Left Taoism in Less Than Three Minutes. So this is a popular video online, but unfortunately, it doesn't have a lot of context and the three minutes is very short. So in a popular clip titled Dude Left Taoism in Less Than Three Minutes, an atheist speaker asks a curious Taoist student. So this guy is just asking a question and he walks up and the guy challenges him and says, if the Nazis were going to take over America, would you go with it or would you resist? Now the student said he would resist and the atheist used it as a ground to say that he is not a Taoist. But as you would know, if you watched any of this presentation and studied any of Taoism, this argument is fundamentally flawed. As noticed by many in the comment section, you can see I screenshotted many of them. And nonetheless, the student was admired because the student was willing to be like, yeah, I'd, I'd resist. He wasn't stuck on his idea of like, yeah, I'd go with the flow. Um, he was like, yeah, I'd resist because he's being honest. That's what he would do. And he just allowed the argument to play out as it did, even though the atheist guy made of, you know, tried to make him look bad or whatever, uh, tried to be right and, and made him look wrong. He wasn't care caring about the looks. He just went up there, expressed his honesty, and that's what happened. And people actually admired him in the comment section just for that alone. And so Lao Tzu even simply debunks this argument that the atheist used in this video. He says, quote, weapons are instruments of fear. They are not a wise man's tools. He uses them only when he has no choice. Peace and quiet are dear to his heart and victory, no cause for rejoicing. If you rejoice in victory, then you delight in killing. If you delight in killing, you cannot fulfill yourself. And so just look at some of these comments. Taoism doesn't say never resist. Taoism is in essence finding the most successful way around an obstacle by adjusting yourself to the circumstance, emulating the qualities of water, right? And he uses the Bruce Lee quote in that comment. There's another comment that says, that kid actually seems open-minded. He didn't have to cuss the speaker out or ad hom him. He took it in stride and went about his day. And it's true. And then another comment said, that man was just ignorant. And he's talking about the atheist. He didn't even try to understand the concept. He just asked to embarrass the guy in front of the crowd. Another comment said, exactly. Considering Taoism is also so deeply connected to martial arts, it's safe to assume that they had a last resort in mind. I don't disagree with any of the speaker's beliefs, but I think if he had someone come on that is well educated in the philosophy of Taoism, then they would find that they mostly agree. And here's other comments. I don't think the kid knows enough about Taoism to really make an argument for it. Being in flow is more like finding a way around your problems rather than resisting them straight on. It doesn't necessarily mean that a Taoist would go along with the Holocaust. And another comment even said, right, the speaker was actually really dismissive with this example. If you think about it, genocide is against Tao and violence is completely appropriate as a last resort. And so these guys, they understand it, these comment sections, and you can see there's hundreds of people upping their comments, but it doesn't seem like they ever really address this as far as I'm concerned or I'm aware of. And atheists probably don't understand how much they can actually agree with Taoist 
uh, understandings of the universe, as I have shared many examples also across this presentation. And you can even see this video here where Taoism is talked about on the atheist experience, but there's no problem here, really. And, and you watch the video and it's like, okay, in many atheist encounters, if you find any with Taoists, there doesn't seem to be a problem. And since Taoists don't impose religious views, they aren't also a problem for those who are not atheists. So Taoism seems to be quite accepting in the sense of it's a life philosophy. The atheists don't have a problem with it because they're not making any superstitious claims or claiming to worship anything. They're simply understanding the way of the world and how it operates, and they want to know about it just as much as the atheist, except maybe they also want to recognize the problems with knowledge itself, which I would say and maybe argue that the atheists don't know about. Um, and again, I wouldn't expect the Taoists to really debate in the first place. If they would be debating, it would be probably to um, help the other person recognize that debating is part of the issue itself, and that we shouldn't have such a hard mind in the first place. So, um, when we have a natural religion, like Taoism, it's because we do not need to rely on an external god to align our actions with the harmony of the world and find balance. Our spirituality can align to science. You can be a Taoist without even knowing Taoism, or dressing in certain ways, or in partaking in certain rituals. In other words, the words Tao is not a requirement for aligning to nature. So a tribe, or some people who are really in touch with nature, they may have a whole different language and way of going about the world, but they're in sync with the universe. And therefore, they follow the Tao without even knowing it. Just as we found quotes from many other spiritual texts and teachings therein that also align to Taoism, we don't need to say, that, oh, well, they're not Taoism, so they're bad, we shouldn't look at them. We can recognize, wait, there's a unifying quality here. Because, see, dogmatic religions divide us. People will even consider certain diets religions, certain other ideologies that people don't usually consider religions as religions, and that's because of how dogmatic or divisive they can be. And that's because they prevent us from embracing change. Somebody who might be stuck in a Catholic faith, for example, in the light of science, may deny what science is bringing up, and we see this all throughout history. But recognizing that's just part of change, we can not be so resistant to it. And recognize science should actually support what our spirituality entails. And so Taoism was never meant to be a religion or even a term. Fun fact, many astrological concepts and deities associated with Taoism were not intended originally. Lai Tzu and Lao Tzu, a lot of these figures, Zhuangzi, they did not talk about Taoism as a religion whatsoever with deities and all these things that may be associated with Taoism. Very important to know about because when you look it up, it's going to be mentioned as a religion by many people when I simply see there's not enough evidence for that. It was particularly sparked into religion in later centuries by Zhang Daoling in the Way of the Five Pecks of Rice. But they used Taoism to their advantage politically and culturally, which clearly goes against a lot of the teachings of Taoism to begin with, as demonstrated in this presentation. And among any works that you may understand online, or just reading the Tao Te Ching to begin with. And so when people turn things into religions, it can make things very divisive if they are dogmatic and they close their mind to other religions. And so, for instance, after China became communist in 1949, millions of monks were reduced to thousands. Uh, much of the Taoist heritage was destroyed, especially from 1966 to 1976. So. Maybe part of the reason why Taoism is not so popular um, in practice for a lot of the world is because the cultures and ideologies have been battling it uh, directly. But I do see it going to rise again, inevitably, because it's sort of the nature of the Tao. It's the nature of waters, the nature of the softness of this philosophy. And I don't see there being anything that can stop it. It's helping a lot of people. Um, 
And also, I have a lot of supporting reasons for this at the end of this presentation. But Taoism philosophically has always been generally accepting of others. Is our philosophy based in trust and openness, not separation or forcing nature's will? Because forcing nature's will and separating ourselves from others is the exact opposite of what Taoism teaches. And you can argue a lot of other religions teach compassion and stuff too, but they don't always practice it. It's usually because they get turned into religions. They turn into dogmatic cultural divides. And so, you know, you can look at Taoism, especially through the philosophy that I'm introducing here, based purely on the original text, as the middle ground between atheism and religion, as it recognizes science and randomness while also recognizing a self-governing order. And I think that's what makes Taoism unique uh, um, among all these other types of ideologies that might be associated among it, is the fact that it's able to be like water and the fact that it can align to both religion and science. And I think that's what makes it so powerful. So do you think it's likely for a Taoist to debate or would a Taoist want to be proven right? Like I said, I think the most they would want would be to shatter the closed-mindedness of individuals or the hard-mindedness of people with their softness. And because of their soft approach, I wouldn't likely see them in a debate. That's me personally and my thoughts on that. You can share your thoughts with me as well. And so it's about understanding Eastern philosophy has a unique view on the world that is not often seen in the West. And the West is often associated with a lot of scientific advancement and uh, being able to have all the science to do things medically. And I think the East has always said, we don't necessarily need that. We can understand the body even without it. So Carl Jung even explains to us here, quote, the West emphasizes the becoming human and even the personality and historicness of Christ, while the East says, without beginning, without end, without past, without future. Following his conception, the Christian subordinates himself to the superior, divine person in expectation of his grace. But the Eastern man knows that redemption depends on the works of a person devoted to himself. Out of the individual grows the whole Tao. The Amicio Christi will forever have this disadvantage. We worship a man as a divine model embodying the deepest meaning of life, and then, out of sheer intimidation, we forget to make real the profound meaning present in ourselves." End quote. What he's saying here is that people look up to an individual like Jesus, an external figure, uh, or even Buddha, or external figures, and say, these are my sources of enlightenment. Now, in Buddhism, I think the Buddha says, you are the Buddha, and, and you can even find quotes in Western religions where they say, you know, you have the light within you, Quakers talked about this, the inner light, and so you basically have Christ within you. In that sense, then you're applying the external figures to ourselves, and you're creating a bridge. But... Oftentimes, there are a lot of people who may be worshiping uh, and just depending on others to solve their own problems. And reality may just not work like that. So Carl Jung continues here saying, quote, It can easily happen to the Protestant that the person Jesus, now removed by centuries, could become the superior man within himself. There would then be reached, in a European way, the psychological condition corresponding to that of the enlightened one in the Eastern sense. And so we can all better our lives, no matter where you're coming from, what religion you're watching this from, what culture you're coming from, you can see the value that is taught in Taoism or other cultures and in having nothingness and uh, uselessness and Wu Wei and the uncarved block and the still point and all the things that we talked about. So this also relates to the idea of simple deism, which is the concept of working with the laws of nature in Taoism. And there's different types of deism, particularly a movement that was created around the 1700s, which is the 18th century. 
and you can see some charts summing this up, basically saying there's no separation between the creator and creation, they are one, and that it's a mid-ground between atheism and religion as you recognize that there is this universe that is here for all beings, and there's spiritual laws, or you recognize spirit is just breath, and that we are ever to learn more, or that we recognize there's higher forces than ourselves, there's many ways to interpret deism, but you can say Taoism is a form of simple deism if you want to put it through more of a religious context. And you may even differentiate spirituality versus religion as well. But again, I would like to just call Taoism a philosophy that helps us out in our own life. Thank you very much for watching. This is the end of part three. Continue with us. We'll be talking about a lot more as time goes on. Welcome to part four of Tao, the way of nature, the full return to nature. And we will be talking a lot more about all the many subjects to help us find peace and balance within our lives. And part of that process is developing trust. Trusting the world allows you to become part of it, not against it. This is learning how to leave things alone, get a direct experience. Philosophy sounds good, but it is not reality. Again, the words that we create, the categories, the titles, the judgments, this is not reality. So trust who you are deep down inside. This may be seen as the only meaning in life. This is unconditional honesty, love, and friendship to others, ourselves, and the world. Instead of being judgmental, being a friend. Even the worst of people are among us, a brother or sister. And this reminds me of the quote by the famous American slavery abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison. He says, the country is our world. Our countrymen are all mankind. He had to recognize that for his cause to end slavery because he realized that it doesn't matter what people thought of slaves. It's unnatural for anybody to be a slave. They wouldn't want it done to them personally. Why would they allow it to be done to others? It violates the golden rule, the law of love, they called it. And they used moral suasion to say, you know what? We deserve to be free. Everybody deserves to be free because we're all equal. It says so in the Declaration of Independence, unless we're contradicting ourselves. That's why he publicly burned the Constitution in front of others. He caused a bit of controversy, but in a nonviolent way, just to educate the world about the fact that we all are among each other and have to trust those who we think are inferior. We can empower them. We can help them. If, if you want someone to become better, you can't not trust them and be fearful of them. It's not going to help their condition. You empower them. You trust them like a kid that you're bringing into the world. You don't fear the kid is going to go crazy. You love the kid and you want to help them. And because of your love, they love you, right? So if a kid is growing, realize they are a kid and they will be a kid. So if you see they're doing a bunch of things that are like too playful for you, too chaotic, realize they're just a kid. We do not need to culture kids. They just want to have fun. They want to let go. They want to practice Wu Wei, perhaps more than adults in some sense of being able to let go. And we should admire that in kids and nurture that. Yes, there's its limits, right? In the sense of, okay, you're playing too much here and you're making other people upset or things like of that matter. <laughs> But we realize they're kids. They, they want to have fun. There's a reason why they want to explore the world, why they have mystery. And we realize by understanding the Tao that mystery is so essential for our learning. And kids, we want them to learn. So if we want them to be creative, which they also have the great ability to do, then we would nurture that. We would trust it. We would allow it. We would recognize it as actually important. And maybe we would help that and the fact that we give them coloring books or we allow them to explore nature with us, right? And we trust ourselves to go with them, to have fun with them. 
We trust ourselves to go about every day, drive cars and take risks every day. We don't think of every little risk that we take, but there's hundreds of risks we take all the time. And so this matter of trust and unconditional honesty or love, well, I wrote a book about radical honesty. This is not the plug of the book, but needless to say, I find it very, very helpful. And you can see on the left, there's a very popular book by Brad Blanton, PhD, called Radical Honesty. And the name of my book is Nature's Radical Honesty, a practical application of naturosophy, a philosophy that I developed. I'll talk about that a little bit later uh, as to why I did that, because I found value in Taoism and other philosophies that also studied nature and merely just emphasizing our respect to the universe and to ourselves. And if we truly care about ourselves deep down inside, we will always be honest with ourselves or to others or try to be honest to the universe in achieving what the universe wants of us, in a sense. Okay, so doing what is right and not doing what is wrong. Knowing what is right and sticking by that principle because you know it. You have to be honest with yourself unless you're going to lie and you're going to allow wrongdoing or you're going to create confusion because you're not telling people the truth and you're deceiving them. So honesty is a very, very important topic for you to share these two resources. So wonders of a weed. We criticize weeds. We say weeds are not good for the garden. They need to be taken out. But you know, actually, I have a picture here on the bottom of the slide of a dandelion because although it's considered a weed and a lot of people would cut it down, the whole thing is edible. And there's countries that make salads out of it. And there's people who make soups out of it. And there's people who make tea out of it because it's detoxifying and it's very healthy for the human body in many ways. So is it really a weed? In that case, something we should just cut down and ignore and say is problematic for the world. Is there anything in this world that is just problematic that we should just get rid of? Because I guarantee you, even the things you consider wrong, again, teach us of what is right. They help us see the value in life. They give us a sense of purpose. And so here's a quote from Alan Watts. You notice a small weed growing underneath a hedge. And this weed is really, after all, not just to be dismissed as a weed but some rather lovely design that is in the nature of this plant. Or supposing you are bothered by financial uproar, wars, politics, and everything like that, and you are sitting on a beach, and you become aware of the water endlessly crossing pebbles, and you get a sense that this goes on forever and ever and ever. It is long before you were thought of, long before all human history, empires, schemes, and so on, and will endure long after. But it's something that strikes you that is very simple, very ordinary, like the water on the pebbles or like the little weed under the hedge that suggests a kind of amazing eternal reliability of nature. So in the sense of understanding that nature has always been here and we can just trust the processes of this life and that of all the things that have happened in history and all the things we think are happening now that are disastrous, They've happened before, and humans have gotten past it. We should not worry, because our worries can make matters even worse, actually. As we talked about before, in being able to work from the blank slate, being able to see our original selves, so we can think clearly and rationally. And so there's simplicity in life that we found out we should understand, from looking at no-thingness, uh, looking at the uncarved block or the still point in Taoism. And so here's another quote from Alan Watts. He says, in Buddhism, one would not say so much poverty as one would say simplicity. Not going without, not clinging to things because it's good for you, but because it is actually the happiest way to live. Because nothing is more terrifying than the state of chronic anxiety which one has if you are subject to the illusion that something in life could be held onto and safeguarded, and nothing can. So the acceptance of everything flowing away is absolutely basic to freedom, to being an unsi, a cloud water person who drifts like cloud and flows like water. So tying in both the ideas of riding the wind like Leitze 
and flowing like water, like the Tao. These two are very correlated, one and the same here, and I might have said unsui wrong, I don't know how to say that word, Alan Watts is very proficient in many Eastern philosophies. And so he's able to look at Buddhism and Taoism and learn from all of them to see that there's this underlying simplicity that all of them were basically teaching. That we don't view life in terms of numbers or symbols and who has more or less of this and that, no. It's more about just living life to begin with. And you're able to be more conscious when you have less distractions, when you have greater simplicity. So you can be more among the flow of life that just goes as things are. And so this being said, and we talked about before about the uncarved block and being able to return to our original state um, past a lot of the thoughts in our head and being able to not let the world get to us, we do have to be aware of something. We have to be wary of the extreme. Right? Remember we talked about asceticism as like an extreme of not eating, like an extreme simplicity. Well, there's this concept of the stone Buddha that Alan Watch talks about. He says, a person with no emotions who has completely controlled his emotions is a stone Buddha. So a person who would completely let go would also be some kind of an animate object. And so to be perfectly human, one must not have a state of absolute detachment, but a state of detachment which contains a little bit of resistance. Again, Taoism does not mean no resistance. It means being able to flow. So a certain clinging still, the great yogi, maybe he smokes a cigarette or has a bad temper occasionally, something that keeps him human. And I certainly have that too. I've been able to be more present and look less upon my past because my mind likes to go to the past. Many times because of my great memories and seeing the better world perhaps that I see is better. But the world is still here and nature is relatively the same. Just human matters are changing. And so I'm basically stuck in my own head. And so, if I think about it a little bit sometimes, I go to the past, I get sad, I get a little emotional. But that's because I'm human. I'm going to. Although, most of the time, I've been able to control it quite well because of the Taoist practices. Being able to meditate, quiet my mind, and remember how life changes. Remember this flow of life. So my philosophy, my knowledge is aligned to my presence. You know, and again, but they both give way to another. And so we recognize why we would meditate and we meditate to know more in the first place. And that's a beauty in life. Like you learn from this presentation in order to become more still, to become more present. And that helps you then learn more knowledge in response, right? It's a giving and getting situation. It's integrative. It's holistic. And so that little thing Alan Watts says is very important. It's having that human touch to our lives. And it's like the salt in the stew, he says, having those little things that ground us, <laughs> like those things that might be undesirable according to other people, right? And they are simply just the thing that makes you you to some extent too. This is another great way of saying that even a very great sage, a great Buddha will have in him a touch of regret that life is fleeting because if he doesn't have that touch of regret, He's not human, and he's incapable of compassion towards people who regret very much that life is fleeting. So he's not in an extreme. He's just having a little bit of that spice in his life. Because when you cook food, you just add a little bit of spice. You don't add a bunch of spice. You're going to be burning hot, growing crazy, right? And then you're going to be running for milk. You're going to be running for trying to get some help. <laughs> Your sense is going to go crazy. Your digestion is going to go crazy. Other people might go crazy. And instead, if you have just a perfect amount of spice, you might actually be able to ground yourself a little bit and just open up the senses just enough, but not to the point of, oh my gosh, this is extreme. Just to use a little bit of a cooking analogy, in case that helps. <laughs> but um, to say that it's okay if you have some sin that some people would refer to, or vices, right? We just want to make sure that we have temperance to keep those vices under control, to realize that we're conscious of those, that we are responsible able to respond to what happens in our environment, including ourselves, because we are a part of that environment. 
And so people ask themselves, well, how do I find paradise? We talked about before about how people can find happiness. Less about finding, more about embracing. Well, Alan Watts tells us here, the real thing that you are is the paradise land that you're looking for at the end of the line. And it's far, far more reliable than any kind of an external scene which you could love and cling to and hold on to. So the real thing that you are is the paradise land that you're looking for. There is a price to be paid for every increase in consciousness. We cannot be more sensitive to pleasure without being more sensitive to pain. And so this is just another addition to understand that you know, you have to embrace this life. There's always going to be downsides. You can think that you're going to find some paradise. People go on vacation. They have to go back to work. Oh, man, it doesn't last forever. They go to Florida like I do. Oh, you think it's all paradise. There's palm trees and beaches. No, nope. the real world still catches up with you. Real world. <laughs> but still, you have to realize that problems you're going to run into, they are inevitable. And so if you want to be happy, if you want to find paradise... It's in learning how to deal with that inevitable and learning how to embrace those changes and see the silver lining in those clouds. So you aren't consumed by the darkness and don't just think, well, there's no hope because there's always bad things. No, there is always hope because there is always bad things. It means there's also always good things because that's why we recognize them as bad. That's why, you know, we have those experiences in the first place. They're simply reactions to the actions that we partake in. And so, if we look at this holistic worldview of life, we can look at vinegar tastes. This is a story that is shared. I think I also heard of this from George Thompson, sharing it in one of his videos. Uh, it's a Chinese philosophical story about Confucius, Buddha, and Lao Tzu, each tasting vinegar. Confucius tasted sourness. The world was sour. Humankind was full of corruption and out of alignment. What was needed was rules and rituals. Okay, so he's like, man, society, we, we don't got things figured out. We need more rules, more rituals. We need to make sure more order can manifest. And, and fair enough, you can understand where he's coming from. He sees there's chaos and that there's order that needs to be then created in a response. And you'll see that's a common pattern among these three individuals, but they each have a different way of handling it. And so Buddha tasted bitterness on the vinegar. Life was bitter due to humankind's desires and attachments leading to suffering. So happiness could only be found in leaving the world, entering nirvana, you know, meditation purely, uh, being able to completely detach. This is the Buddhist teachings in a nutshell. And so rather than Confucius, who says we need more rules and rituals, Buddha is like, well, we need to leave the world in a sense, find our detachment. Now, it's not to say we don't learn from these two folks, but who, what does Lao Tzu have to say about this? Well, he actually smiles when he tastes the vinegar. He saw bitterness and sourness, both from Confucius' point of view and Buddha's point of view, as coming from an unappreciative and inattentive mind. Because nature itself, he saw, is not sour or bitter. If we seek to harmonize with nature, it's about seeing this. That life is a mirror, and if you smile at it, it smiles at you. And so, if it's bitter or sour, it's just part of the experience of life, and if everybody has different tastes of that life too, well then that's just also part of life. It, it emphasizes the uniqueness of individuals. But if we're going to look at the world so wrongly, you know, what are we going to do about it? We're going to try to leave it or try to alter it? Lao Tzu says, no, let's learn to live with it. It's reality. Why fight reality? Life is a mirror. If you smile at it, it smiles at you. Many people have, might have called this the law of attraction, okay? Uh, and again, the golden rule, sort of do unto others what you want done unto you. Would you want rules and rituals imposed upon you? And is the wrong the person who does wrong realize that they're doing wrong? Are they trying to do right in their own regard? The person who wants to leave the world, why do they want to leave it so bad? What's going on, right? We have to ask these questions, and Lao Tzu, I think, helps us see a bigger picture past the bitterness or sourness, because these are just merely tastes of a world that includes both. And so we're able to see the bigger picture. Why attach ourselves to one 
idea of what life is, right? And so let me now talk about naturosophy. I mentioned this briefly before. Naturosophy is a philosophy I developed to help us emphasize and unite philosophies, including Taoism, that recognize nature's authority. I developed this on purpose because in the modern world, in a Yang world, you would expect many philosophies, not just Taoism, to become apparent um, for emphasizing nature. Uh, because of our detachment from it, or because we need to learn more from it because of all the chaos or things that we see are not in alignment with it. And merely just to educate people about who they are. You can see that the N and S, which makes up the logo for Naturosophy, can actually be tied into the yin-yang symbol within itself. And I even put an infinity sign as well, because it's actually quite symbolic for what Naturosophy teaches within my works. It's based on the book Sapientia Naturae and its corresponding guidebook. I recommend the guidebook since it's primarily just questions to help an individual learn for themselves. And it's just something to bear in mind because again, I told you that I came across Taoism quite naturally as part of my journey. So I developed this along the way and Taoism was part of that process. And so it teaches us, Naturosophy, that we should let the natural come natural. It's to embrace what you know, including knowing the unknown in the case of the yin, not just the yang. And so what is natural to exist is what is natural to persist. If we see something that has always existed and we can continue to live with, we know this is something that helps support us. Okay, it's something perhaps we need. And so time tells us all truth and time heals all wounds. And just because something naturally occurs does not mean it is natural to exist. And just because something is natural to exist does not mean it is natural to use. And this is understanding essentially time and place. You can use a ventilator to help you breathe. But we should be asking the question of, is the person meant to breathe in the first place? Should they need the ventilator? Because if we say they need it because of how essential it is, yeah, it's very natural to use in helping someone breathe. But is there something that is more natural than a ventilator? Well, it's the person breathing for themselves. And so we should ask the question of why do we need the ventilator? Why do we assume this is part of nature then? If we say it's needed, if we say we can't live without it, Clearly, there's been times before we lived without it, so what did we do then? You know? Oh, well, we didn't have a ventilator, so they died. Well, there might have been other strategies, number one and number two. We need to understand why they died. We need to understand that we can prevent, not just treat, health conditions. And that the body is teaching us. It's teaching us way more than we may see if we're just looking at treatment and we're not looking at prevention. Because prevention would tell us that something is wrong that we're not looking at. The problem is this person isn't breathing. Well, there might be a deeper problem. They might have pneumonia. They might have a bunch of lung conditions. Well, how did that happen, right? We wouldn't ask that question if we didn't want to get more preventative and find out the root cause to the problem. And so there's a common quote shared in Naturosophy, and it's that there is only one good knowledge and one evil ignorance, but yet we also know that we know nothing. And these are two quotes, particularly from Socrates. And so Lao Tzu tells us, similar to this, that the more you know, the less you understand. So you can sort of connect these two ideas. And nature is good or natural in Naturosophy insofar as it is known. And knowing more does require seeking the hidden, seeing what you do not know. That's how you acquire more knowledge and therefore we always keep learning, as we mentioned before. And through the lens of understanding nature and seeing it as good, morality is then naturality. We're not stuck on man-made standards of right and wrong, but rather looking at humans being aligned to nature overall as being this great standard. And so nature can be correlated to that of health or right or correct or real. So just as one would say they would want to do something that is real for reality, somebody would want to do something natural for nature. And Alan Watts tells us just as true humor is laughter at oneself, true humanity is knowledge of oneself. 
And you can say, know thyself. It's a very popular quote as well, telling us this great thing that we have, knowledge, although, again, we can see that there's dangers with it, too, and there's ways we can attain knowledge, which involves not so much seeking it out. Um, that knowledge we can have of ourselves more than others because we're trying to figure out the world around us and try to figure out others, but this is the only home we live in, right? So just bear that in mind. This is body you're in control of. So you might be able to know more of yourself than anybody else on this earth. So that's what, another reason not so much to judge others. And again, not even to judge yourself because we're still figuring it out ourselves. But in naturosophy, what is naturalizing or what is natural or right is for naturalization in the real sense, not naturalization as in becoming a citizen of a country, but as in becoming natural as part of nature. So becoming naturalized, okay? Natural eyes to make natural. That's what it means when you break down the word. And whereas the opposing side to naturalizing would be denaturing which is the unnatural or wrong for denaturalization. So taking ourselves out of nature and putting ourselves into um, man-made illusions and standards and accepting that as our reality rather than reality itself. And so humans can only attempt to violate or force nature, but we will only delay or distract from the inevitable since it's by the very nature of illusion that it is not real that we think something is real when in reality it isn't. And only reality can tell us what is reality. So being able to escape the illusion, you can go back to the idea of honesty, we can start with recognizing we've been lied to or we've been lying to ourselves, and that then we should start being more honest with ourselves. And that's how we become more honest overall. You know, it's starting to do our best and then ever striving to do our best, continually doing more and more to, um, it can be in many ways doing less, becoming who we are meant to be. And that can be the uncarved block, the still point, meditation. It could be reflection techniques. It could be asking ourselves questions. It could be simply making better choices in our lives from that. So that way we can better work with our own body, our own digestion, and the world around us. And so this process you may call natural learning. Within Sapiencia Naturae, there are chapters. There's one on natural leadership. Leadership is talked a lot about in the Tao, very similarly. There's ones about natural profession and finding what is your purpose in this life? Like, what are you trying to do? Is it really to make money? Or is it, again, the things that you want money for and do we seek that out directly can we attain it now even without money and natural learning maybe we don't have to go through a school system necessarily we talked about before about unschooling we talked about how we can learn more by not necessarily desiring it and having the embrace of mystery and so we can obtain wisdom without books or research we can perceive the world and learn about the world from the slightest of things, especially that in nature, which is at the root to everything. And wisdom from wide means vision, okay? The word wisdom comes from vision. So do you use your own eyes? Another way you can look at it is realization, real eyes, right? My friend, realization, that's actually the name of his channel, great content. But you live in the same reality as philosophers, teachers and others who have reached conclusions which you can reach in different ways this is why we see many different cultures around the world sharing similar ideas and that's why i created naturosophy which again did not really have the intent of embracing taoism or transcendentalism or stoicism and seeing the parallels between these or even abolitionism and so there are parallels we can actually see them here on this slide and so here's an example from Black Elk, the Lakota people. They say at the center of the universe dwells the great spirit. That center is really everywhere. It is within each of us. And then here's a quote from Swangza in Taoism. Do not ask whether intelligence is in this or in that. It is in all beings. 
and then from Jesus in Christianity. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me as I in you. So again, the sense of connectedness and trust in who we naturally are and seeing this common trend among great spirit and inner light and Tao and Anima Mundi that you don't need to attach yourself to Taoism, to Buddhism, to Christianity, but you can learn from all these great ideas and see the value therein everything. As Lao Tzu says, being able to see all things when we really are able to come from the point of view of the uncarved block. And therefore then we don't really have an agenda. It's hard to fit ourselves into a box. And so there is emptiness in nature. We can see more of reality and appreciate more that comes from it. You may also learn from other animals to observe intelligence that they have to share, as we mentioned before. So take a walk. Naturosophy handles all things studying nature. And Taoism thereof takes it deeper than mere intellect. It really emphasizes the yin, the parts of us that we don't see about ourselves. I will admit that Naturosophy is more of a mental, intellectual exercise. And Taoism may be more aligned to what people call spirituality. And there's nothing wrong with that, because they both have the same intent of aligning to nature. And they both can be grounded in philosophy, in many different perspectives, many different worldviews and cultures coming together. I think it's a beautiful thing. So take a walk. Don't be afraid to be your own philosopher like the millions of philosophers that's been there before you, many of which might have also lost their works along the way. I mean, who knows? We've had libraries, the Library of Alexandria in the past that burned down. I mean, who knows how much knowledge has been lost due to ideology, due to divisions in the world, right? But now you live in the age of mass information and technology where people can literally research anything and put out anything for all to see. It's quite fascinating. I wouldn't put the modern day down so much when you have power that never was there before. The power to educate people, to reach more people than anyone else, I mean... I, Lao Tzu made more of an impact than me, even though in his day and age, he probably knew way less people than me. And so I'm able to reach more people than him now, but his message lives on stronger than mine, perhaps. And interesting, the ideas matter, the, the message matters, and exactly, nature, in this sense, matters. The truth, reality matters, and so it doesn't matter what title, what label, what ideology you want to string onto it. Let's realize the unifying tie of nature throughout all of it. And so, what is nature according to the Taoist perspective? Well, it's called Zuran or Tsujin. Okay? Now, there's different ways to say words like this one in Taoism again, um, but it has to do with Wu Wei as well. And so, here's a quote The expression Zuran, Tsujin, is the term that we translate nature when we translate Chinese. It doesn't say nature or natura, which means in a way class of things. It means literally self so, what is so of itself, what happens of itself, and thus spontaneity. And in the Tao Te Ching, early on, Lao Tzu tells us that the Tao's method is to be so of itself. It means that the more liberty you give, the more love you give, the more you allow things in yourself and in your surroundings to take place, the more order you will have. Alan Watt. So we talked before about a tyrannical ruler versus somebody who basically doesn't appear to be any ruler at all and how order can manifest on its own. And we even shared a story from the Yellow Emperor uh, shared by Leitza where this emperor dreamed of a empire that ruled itself, self-governing. And so it's because he learned how to let go and let the people manage their own lives. And so this all relates to everything that we are talking about, moving on in this presentation, and you can make endless connections, which is the beauty of this work. And so this relates to the uncarved block, being able to see that of which is so of itself, the Zoran. 
And the uncarved block is also called pu or fupu, which also means honesty, reality, or simplicity. And this is also sometimes translated as wholeness, which wholeness, if you look at the Latin word for health, it means whole. And we also talk about dis-ease as being the opposite of health. Well, the opposite of disease is ease, and ease has a lot to do with flow, letting things go, having simplicity in life, and it makes life much easier for many people. I mean, the goal in life, if I were to ask people, I think they would say, yeah, I want life to be easier, I want life to be better, and so they want life to be better and easier. I think Taoism hits it quite on the nail. Well, the world can self-govern itself. You don't have to worry so much, so it's easy. And at the same time, it's governing itself, so it's working out great. And so this type of simplicity, but really just naturalness, is this Zoran that we're talking about. And the connection in Naturosophy that nature is also health is seen here when you see that the uncarved block, which is also referred to as the Tao, can be translated as wholeness. So beautiful connections that could be made. When we see the connections of life, most importantly, our connection to life itself, we may have tranquility. Again, we see peace, balance. Here's a quote from Zhuangzi. The men of old, while the chaotic condition was yet undeveloped, shared the placid tranquility which belonged to the whole world. At that time, the yin and yang were harmonious and still. Their resting and movement proceeded without any disturbance. The four seasons had their definite times. Not a single thing received any injury. And no living being came to a premature end. Men might be possessed of the faculty of knowledge, but they had no occasion for its use. This was what is called the state of perfect unity. At this time, there was no action on the part of anyone, but a constant manifestation of spontaneity. So Swangs is giving us a depiction of the harmonious nature with our harmonious nature aligned to it, which again, we are just part of nature. So we being part of nature, I'm just going to call nature in the sense of wholeness, in the sense that we are part of that spontaneity, that we are so united with nature that we don't even need to think about it. We don't need to question the things that might be endlessly questioned in the modern day that have never been questioned before because we're so stuck in our heads. We are just living life so naturally that it's no question what is natural and what is unnatural. It's reality. That's not to say that it's wrong to question that. Anybody can question anything in this life. It seems like there's no disturbance. There's no chaos. Maybe it's because people are letting things be more often. I don't know. You tell me your interpretation of this quote. A time where things are harmonious and there's less disturbance in the world. The men of old he talks about. What is he talking about in particular when he talks about this? And we're going to see this as a common trend as well, talking about how there was times of peace or how we dream of a world where there can be peace because we know it's possible given the Tao and what humans can do with it. Again, it's already there. It's the matter of question as to if we will align to it and allow and embrace what simply is. And so nature and Tao is forever for you. It will always be there for you. This is something to just bear in mind, to realize you're never really alone. You may call yourself lonely because there's no other people, but you're not alone in the sense that you always have nature. The trees will always give you oxygen. It does not judge you. Only by your own actions, it does through consequences. But nature only has yet to be understood and allowed to be harmonized with. It is there for you. This is why we chop down trees and use it to build houses. But if we don't recognize the power of trees to begin with, we might cut down all the trees and then we don't realize they can give us oxygen as well. And they give us things that are really, really natural for us that we disregard because of our own man-made creations and our own mind got in our own way of our own alignment to our own world. <laughs> 
And so we live in contradiction. And we don't want to live in contradiction. We want to live in unification, right? In mastery. Becoming the masters of ourselves, of the universe. Um, but in the sense of really aligning to it. We'll be talking about this idea of mastery and masters. And so when we talk about nature and what is good, what may be perceived is an appeal to nature fallacy in philosophy. There is a relatively common logical fallacy accepted within the study of modern philosophy, known as the appeal to nature fallacy. It is assumed that Taoism or naturosophy makes this logical fallacy. However, the natural is specifically defined in both cases. So I made a chart where you can see the appeal to nature fallacy is this basic equa equation, okay? And you basically fill in the words. That which is natural is good. N is natural, therefore N is good or right. And usually they're referring to, okay, I walk into a superstore or I see something that's labeled natural and I assume it's better. Well, from that point of view, if you don't know what is actually natural, yeah, it's quite fallacious in the sense that there's no knowledge behind what you're doing. You don't know what is natural and therefore you can't really say if it's good, right? But if you can define these terms, maybe that will really help us understand. And in Taoism and Naturosophy, these terms are defined. And so let's just use the words that we learned, Wu Wei and Zerand, and apply it into the equation. So if we first use Taoism, that which is natural, or Zoran, or without effort, Wu Wei, is virtuous, which is what we would consider to be good. That would be T or D. Again, that's the Chinese word for virtue. And so N, abiding by the nature of nature, is natural or without effort. And therefore, N is virtuous. It's T or D. Look at this chart for yourself, okay, because me describing it might be a little bit more difficult. But essentially, if something is effortless, if it's natural by the nature of things, then it is virtuous, according to Taoism. Now, to provide another perspective on this using naturosophy, that which is natural or forever existent, again, Zoran, or naturalizing supports the natural, again, Wu Wei, it is moral, good, honest, healthy, right, real, etc. There's many words that represent a similar standard. And so N, abiding by the nature of nature with our knowledge of existence, occurrence, and usage is natural. And therefore, N is moral, good, honest, healthy, right, real, etc. And so we learn what to do and what not to do in this life, essentially. We learn what helps our nature versus what doesn't. We learn what is forever existent versus what isn't. We learn what allows us to be effortless versus what creates so much resistance that the universe clearly doesn't want us to be taking a certain path in this life. And again, we can get stuck on those paths that we see are providing so much resistance. And that's where we need to practice more of the Wu Wei and the Zoran, and realize that if we want to align back to nature, it takes a process of learning Taoism or naturosophy alike and making this appeal to nature with knowledge, not just assuming, oh, well, it says it's natural, therefore it's good. No, there's clearly a foundation here. The whole presentation is that foundation to understanding what is Wu Wei. And it has a basis in nature because everywhere you look in nature, things are growing spontaneously with synchronicity, with this Wu Wei. And it's just a matter of time for humans to recognize that they too are part of nature and can do the same thing. And there are humans who practice it now because you can practice it now. So it's not like something you have to wait on. It's just a matter of time for the whole world to do that. And we don't need to wait for the whole world, right? We can apply it directly in our lives now and see the virtue that we get as a response. And of course, we'll talk more about T or D or what is virtuous. 
But to help us understand more of this idea of the real appeal to nature or naturosophy, natural learning, and what is nature, uh, Jason Gregory has a great video talking about the natural human being. And so he breaks it down with talking about virtue and as well as Lee, which is our organic pattern. He says to seek refuge from these unnatural systems, we need to understand nature itself. The organic pattern of the individual or Li is our innate nature driven by T or virtue. Nature then has no relationship to force, control, or power. The order and pattern of nature is not a forced order as nature is not bound by external influence or control. The Taoist term for nature is the Chinese Zeran or Suchan, which means that which is spontaneously of itself. When a natural organism is in harmony with all life, it grows of itself spontaneously. Suchan can only arise of itself without external compulsion. What would happen if we let go of control? What if we left the animal, plant, and mineral kingdoms alone? They continue to grow without any interference. What then if we left people alone? People would follow their natures. Because passive obedience would no longer be a way of life. We would no longer feel the need to obey unnatural organizational patterns. Because in following our own nature, we would begin to harmonize with other people and the environment. When we leave life alone, Tao runs its natural course and all aspects of life come into order without seeking order. So this summarizes the whole idea of harmonizing with nature from the Taoist perspective. Uh, if you want more, I recommend watching that video. It's by far, if not my most favorite uh, video on Taoism on the entire internet. And maybe I'm just a little bit biased because Jason has a very outright approach to it. And I love his editing skills and everything that he does. But um, I really just love the title of the video. I love the, I love the message. I love how he brings everything together in this one video. So um, maybe I'm biased, but I love it. <laughs> Great job, Jason. But there's this interdependency and Alan Watts talks about it too. He says, there's always the idea of the king and the ruler attached in most spiritual philosophies, but not in the Chinese Tao philosophy. The Tao is not something, the Tao is not something different from nature, from ourselves, from our surrounding trees and waters and air. The Tao is the way all that behaves. And so the basic Chinese idea of the universe is really that it's an organism. Everything operating together so that nowhere can you find the controlling center. There isn't any. The world is a system of interrelated components, none of which can survive without each other. Just as in the case of bees and flowers, you will never find bees around in a place where there aren't flowers. And you will never find flowers around in a place where there aren't bees or insects that do the equivalent job. And what that tells us secretly is that although bees and flowers look different from each other, they're inseparable. They arise mutually. There's no cause and effect. It's not that relationship at all. It's like the egg and the hen. So as the bees and the flowers coexist in the same way as high and low, back and front, long and short, loud and soft, all those experiences are experienceable only in terms of their polar experience. So the Chinese idea of nature is that all the various species arise mutually because they interdepend. And this total system of interdependence is the Tao. Wonderful quote, I find. I find that, I mean, this is like talking about the origin of the universe to some extent, right? And again, you know, Lao Tzu puts it simply in poetic terms. But the interdependency in life, which again, we see the yin and the yang working together and how if one becomes extreme, it's not like the other one just goes away. There's always the seed of the yin and the yang or the yang and the yin. And so there's this interdependency always at play. And so I find that so fascinating, so beautiful. 
to recognize that we cannot put ourselves into one box because there's a reason why there are so many different types of boxes per se. There's a reason why there's so many philosophies and religions. They all give rise to each other, right? It's a beautiful thing. It's not something that we should abhor. But I think it's also the matter of are we willing to accept that and not say, well, mine is the only way and you must live with it. Accept the fact that people think different, that people are different, and that nature has difference. That is what we're talking about as part of this interdependency. And so we have this true mastery to obtain. Quote, the master can act without doing anything and teach without saying a word. Things come her way and she does not stop them. Things leave and she lets them go. Lao Tzu. So if you've gotten to this point in this presentation, this should become more understandable. You observe with stillness and you make room. And you don't be restless. You don't react suddenly. You relax, allow insights to arise naturally, and you adapt and you be flexible. And essentially you gain a mastery over your actions as you practice and it makes perfect into Wu Wei and you take that path of least resistance and you act consciously. Your cold cognition to your hot cognition to the point where things become spontaneous. Things are so natural to be. And that is the type of mastery where I have for a picture on the slide, a painting or a painter who is one with the painting, which is why I said the painting or the painter. This is his creation. It's a part of himself. He became one with the brush and thus became one with the painting. And now he's thus one with the painting because after his time, that painting is there for all of time, right? It's a sense of his essence, his spirit, you may call it. You know, his creative energy, his energy went into that. And so it's sort of like a part of him. I mean, do you have anything that you cherish in your life, a prized possession, a family heirloom that was passed down? Why do you find it important to you? It's because something was tied to it, some sort of essence or spirit from somebody that you may have lost or somebody who matters a lot to you, right? And so there's this mastery that we can attain for ourselves so we can um, create things like they did. So we can become strong and all these people that we admire and look up to, well, we can be just like them if we set our minds to it. But perhaps it's because we also have to let it go into it naturally, allow ourselves to flow. And so you can create just as they do, just as, again, you can be a philosopher, just as the philosophers of the past. You can be a master just among the other masters. There's a reason why every master was once an apprentice. Every pro gamer was once a noob. Just bear that in mind. And next time someone wants to push you down, they were once in your shoes, perhaps. And so there's a level of optimization we all can then reach with understanding our nature and aligning to it. If we're stuck in the house, the easy way is to do stuff in or around the house. If in traffic, you go with the flow. A sailor aware of the wind can sail easier. He's acting intelligently. Again, it's not just the easier way, it's the intelligent way. It's the effortless intelligence. And so we fall asleep by allowing our body to carry us into it. We become creative by providing the right circumstances, but we can't force it. And that is the main conclusion here is that we cannot force nature. Because those who ride the wave in economics or trends can make a lot of impact. And these are all just examples of how if we go with the flow, life is much easier. But again, it's the flow which is Wu Wei, which is nature, which is the Tao. It's not the flow of society and titles and egos and, and attachments. It might feel easy to be pulled onto those strings and to have desires. Whatever easier it is not to have those desires, it only seems easy because we live in the world and be, we've been conditioned to think otherwise. But our natural state, our natural conditioning does not have that. It's able to master itself.
because everything in nature can self-govern. And so when we're following nature and we can ask ourselves, are we following nature? Then we trust the path and we don't fight the stream or current of life. We adjust our mind, but we don't adjust reality. We adjust our mind because this will help us change our man-made reality, our perception of reality. It helps the universe express itself so we're not fighting against it. So we're not trying to replace it. We're not blocking the river. And it's not just for our purpose, but the purpose of the universe, seeing beyond the subjective to see the whole with no limit or ego. Again, the difference between the two truths in Buddhism, the relative truth and the absolute truth, the Tao, and then there's you. And there's no separation between the two, except when we think there is. It's our minds that get in the way. It's our egos that get in the way. It's our perceptions that get in the way. So if we choose to be one with nature, we would allow ourselves to then be part of the flow of nature's perception, which is merely life, reality, the current, the stream, the, the water that Lao Tzu talks about. And so one might actually also take psychedelics for this effect. <laughs> Um, this is worth mentioning because people do. Um, they seek that in order to attain any spiritual enlightenment, and there's many folks who talk about this online, and Terence McKenna you might know about as well, many great talks talking about uh, how psychedelics may have been lost in our natural society um, as it turned more unnatural, but... Um, you know, you can look at his talks, you can learn from him, absolutely. But what does Alan Watts have to say about it? Well, he says, if you get the message, hang up the phone. For psychedelic drugs are simply instruments, like microscopes, telescopes, and telephones. The biologist does not sit with eyes permanently glued to the microscope. He goes away and works on what he has seen. And so he's saying here not to be attached to the psychedelic. Again, you know, you can have tools that help you. You're going to have those things that people may find undesirable. And those psychedelics, they can be marijuana. They can be mushrooms. They can be, I don't know, there's a billion different ways people do this type of stuff. I personally have never done it. And that's not to say that you should never do it. And just because Alan Watts is saying, if you get the message, hang up the phone, that you should do it once and never do it again. But what he's saying is that you shouldn't be dependent on it necessarily. That if you get a message from taking mushrooms, for instance, you take that message to heart and you apply it. You do something with it because the message was given to you and you can try to stay on the phone, but that's when you might have some effects that might be unwanted. People abusing substances and drugs and not using it consciously. And so if we're conscious, we take the message, we take it to heart, we apply it, and we're not permanently glued to the microscope, just like any other tool or instrument in this life, he's saying, okay? We use it when the time is right. This is Wu Wei. So we wouldn't be abusing its use. It's just using things more consciously and more naturally. And we do know that moderation is key, as we've talked about before. So let's bear that in mind and move forward with simplicity, frugality, humility, and compassion uh, toward nature, toward ourselves, and therefore be careful with what we do. But also be able to be carefree in the sense of learning how to let go, and perhaps also without the substances. There's many people who might be alcohol dependent, for instance, and they need that in order to have fun, but they don't need it. They think they do. And again, their mind now gets in their own way. When they're on alcohol, they're able to let go, but why can't they let go without it? So let us not distract ourselves from our feelings and emotions with coping mechanisms. We talked about this before. We bury our emotions and traumas until they erupt. We must master our mind, balance the inner, which is intuition, flow, harmony, and outer, which is the analyzing, categorizing, and comparing being, the inner and outer being. So in thinking, keep to the simple. In conflict, be fair and generous. 
In governing, don't try to control. In work, do what you enjoy. In family life, be completely present. When you are content to be simply yourself and don't compare or compete, everybody will respect you. Lao Tzu. This is some really practical advice that Lao Tzu is giving us here of what to do in our own lives. So feel free to reflect upon this for yourself. Am I thinking simply? Am I fair and generous in conflict? Am I trying to control everything around me? Am I doing what I enjoy? Am I present? Am I simply myself? And do I have a balance between my inner and outer being? This is how we create a holistic life. You see the flower, picture of the flower, everything comes from the center and blooms from the center. As it is so synchronistic, we sense some sense of order with it and throughout it also randomness. It's a beautiful phenomenon. We just can't quite get our finger on it, but we can see it to some extent. And so let us now talk about leadership because this is a very big topic. And a lot of people who may read the Tao Te Ching might assume it is a rule book for leaders, not just for people who are everyday people. Now, Lao Tzu tells us there isn't a difference really between leaders and everyday people. There's just people, right? He talks about how the Tao is like water and it seeks the lowest places. So what then is their value in leadership? What is Lao Tzu's views on leadership? He says to us, the wise embracing unity will become the world's model. Not boasting, they will be praised. Not building up themselves, they will endure. As much as they embrace the world, the world will embrace them. Peace is meant to be our natural state. Those who try to seize power and remake society will fail. One who attempts to remake it will only deface it. Radiating simplicity, wise rulers inspire others to follow their path. If people were to follow it, Tao, they would have no need of rulers. The high is always founded upon the low. Great rulers identify with orphans, inferiors, and the unworthy. Oppressive measures never achieve their intended results. Police officers and lawmakers are often the worst criminals. Those who fight do not win. Those who win do not fight. They know nothing of power, yet they are bursting with life. When people live freely and fearlessly, virtue will abound. Respond to hatred with kindness. It is the very opposite of common governing, but it is the most effective way to rule. Wise rulers, desiring to lead the people, humble themselves and stay below them. Wishing to help the people, they stay out of the way. They guide without coercion. They do not quarrel with anyone, so no one quarrels with them. Compassion leads to victory in battle and safety in defense. So, you may be able to notice that this is a compilation of a bunch of different quotes that I just put on one slide basically going over many of the different aspects there in leadership. Now, this is also a mixture of different types of translations, because there can be some issues when we're talking about leadership when it comes to the Tao Te Ching that I've noticed. For instance, the idea of rulers or masters or leaders, these might be different things. And even Ian Withy Berry, which is another content creator that you may find online, talks about when the word ruler is used, he's actually referring to ourselves. So there's different interpretations of what is meant by ruler or leader, but even if we did take it through the context of these rulers are people in government, um, ask yourself if government does any of these things. And if they follow all these rules that Lao Tzu is telling us about the Tao, and simplicity, and frugality, and compassion, kindness, and humility. Ask yourself if that is followed by any government ever in history. And I'm sure there's been moments where there might have been people who want to follow leaders. But if those leaders are now higher than the other individuals, then they are present, and then 
that seems to contradict what Lao Tzu talks about when the leaders are supposed to be in the lower places and they don't even seem like they exist. So it's kind of confusing to some extent. We have to break this down a lot more. So let's start off with the fact that there's different types of masters. So is a master who people want to follow a master in the sense of slavery? Because many times, if you, especially if you look at the 1800s, for instance, which is way long after Lao Tzu wrote his text, you know, he's talking about master, and oftentimes he's talking about mastery, as in mastering your senses, mastering your thoughts. This is why, again, Ian Withy Berry talks about how the idea of ruler or master is re referring to ourselves. But we have to see that the word master has clearly two different interpretations. So let's not assume that Lao Tzu is talking about a master that people should follow, um, but rather a master in a sense of somebody who is maybe actually masterful, somebody who's really skillful, um, not somebody who's saying you have to obey me like a slave master. I mean, that's totally different. Okay, so in the same way, we can say, is the leader who inspires others to voluntarily emulate their actions a ruler who is given an authority to demand compliance? They're two completely separate things, right? A leader, somebody that people really look up to and are inspired by, who maybe helps them become rulers uh, or leaders over themselves and for others, and it's voluntary. Whereas a ruler or again, a slave master, I mean, they are not voluntary relationships. They are imposing, they use force. So it clearly goes against Wu Wei. It clearly goes against the ideas of the path of least resistance. And so just something to bear in mind. I mean, you can even see the pictures I chose here. I mean, on one hand, you have a master on the left and you could have a master on the right, but the guy on the left is clearly skillful. He's a master in karate or whatever martial art he's doing. And the guy on the right, he's just wearing a fancy crown and uniform. I don't know if he's actually skillful or worth emulating. It seems like he has an identity that he built around himself. And so um, it's a big difference, perhaps, that I wanted to just note when we see these words is that the word master or ruler may not be interpreted the same way everybody thinks it should be interpreted as. And so let's talk about then ruling the world. What is Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu, what do they have to say directly about this? Well, Lao Tzu tells us, do you want to rule the world and control it? I don't think it ever can be done. The world is a sacred vessel and it cannot be controlled. You will only make it worse if you try it may slip through your fingers and disappear. The master does not force virtue on others, thus she is able to accomplish her task. The ordinary person who uses force will find that they accomplish nothing. Force is followed by loss of strength. This is not the way of the Tao. That which goes against the Tao comes to an early end. So he's making it really clear here, from my interpretation of this, of Lao Tzu, that force and violence is not the path of leadership or mastery. And so when we look at mastery in the sense of slave masters, or we look at leaders in the sense of rulers, I don't think that's what Lao Tzu is talking about. He's talking about an individual who is worth emulating, who is good at what he, they do. They don't need to use force for people to follow them. They just go with the flow of nature, and therefore they don't seek to rule the world. They don't seek a position of authority. And so Swangza tells us, when he tries to extend his power over objects, those objects gain control over him. He who seeks to extend his control is nothing but an operator. While he thinks he is surpassing others, others see him merely straining, stretching to stand on tiptoe. And if you want to relate that to a previous Lao Tzu quote we talked about before, if you try to stand on a tiptoe, if you try to put yourself in the light, you're going to dim your light. You're just going to make things worse. It's counterintuitive. And so ask yourself if any government in history has ever really not used force or violence. I mean, every single law that I know of has been backed by violence. So this violates pretty much every government we've ever seen. And that supports the other quote we saw, which is that 
it's like a government that we've never seen before. It's never been there because again, Lao tells us that if it does exist where somebody is aligned to the Tao, they don't exist as a ruler. They aren't present. <laughs> so it seems like we have to wrap our head around this and it seems so contradictory and weird, but it's actually so simplistic. It's coming from this position of the uncarved block that a lot of us may not be able to see. And so we can notice that there's a location of law going on. There's a difference between someone there's a difference between someone whose law is within himself versus someone whose law is outside himself. The first person acts without any need of approval or disapproval. So do you own yourself? Because if you own yourself, you've recognized this as sort of a rule for yourself, right? So why would you concern about a world out of your control? You're trying to control others, then that means you have to make rules for them. But that means then you're trying to own others or tell them how to live their own lives. And can you really do that in reality? Well, Swangza, Lao Tzu, they're telling us that you can't do that. And if you try to put yourself on this elevated position, it's actually going to create a lot of downsides and problematic occurrences. So we can't help but then talk about anarchism. Because if you do research on Taoism, and I talked about this in the very beginning of the presentation, Taoism is considered among the first anarchist philosophies historically. And so don't be afraid of this term because we're going to be looking at it under a philosophical basis. We're going to break it down and really understand what is meant when this accusation is used. But to first realize, again, the problem with titles and identities even if this was true, we shouldn't just say, oh, well, I'm an anarchist or I'm a Taoist or I'm this or that and I should be using these symbols and colors because they stray away from the truth and the higher truth that could be seen. So just something to bear in mind when I share all this information. So from the Greek prefix an means without the absence of and the Greek noun archon means master or ruler Anarchy does not mean no rules, it means no rulers. It is not a rejection of hierarchy or leaders, only involuntary hierarchies, i.e. rulers. Okay? Every time it's been used throughout history, it has been used, again in the philosophical context, uh, specifically to mean this. No rulers. No hierarchy, in particular no involuntary hierarchy. Okay, there's different types of anarchism that people like to string on to this too. Anarcho-capitalism, anarcho-communism, anarcho this and that and that. And it becomes very ideological. It becomes to the point where people say, this is my identity. And they start with desires and attachments and they bring it in to this basic idea of there's no involuntary hierarchy. And if you just go from that premises of there's no involuntary hierarchy, then there's no violence being used. Because the concept of rulers implies man-made law or authority or government or the state. These are all just words to represent the same thing. So the inherent nature of law, which is violence, and inauthenticity, which is statism, people trying to be something they're not, acts against Wu Wei and the Tao. So we'll be talking about what that actually means. But the symbol for anarchy, just to throw this out there, it's an A with an O. The O actually represents order or organization. So contrary to popular belief, um, you know, you might see people who are protesting with this symbol, who are causing chaos and violence, obviously against what <laughs> Lao Tzu and Taoism talks about. Um, philosophically, it means order and organization, and the A just means anarchy, which again just means no rulers. So it doesn't mean there's no rules, and it doesn't mean people can't organize. Again, the O can represent organization as well. So let us look more into this and understand why Taoism is accused of being an anarchist philosophy. Again, not to attach ourselves to it, but to understand that Lao Tzu is actually telling us that if a world is going to self-govern itself, and there's not going to be any rulers present, that Taoism is essentially an anarchist philosophy. And this will become more apparent as we look deeper into even more quotes from Lao Tzu and Zhuangzi, if not the whole presentation and everything I've shared so far. 
This is no agenda on part of me, but simply on the nature of what Taoism is. And so anarchism tackles something called statism. And I mentioned that that is the inauthenticity of human beings, human beings trying to be something they're not. So statism is the belief that there is such a thing as authority vested in certain human beings, magically giving them the right to rule over other people. This authority means that certain people who we call government have the moral right to issue commands to those who they rule, those under their jurisdiction, and that their subjects or slaves have a moral obligation to obey the arbitrary dictates or laws set by their masters. Most simply put, a statist is someone who believes in the legitimacy of slavery. And there's even evidence of the abolitionists in the 18th century, in the 19th century as well, uh, where they talk about this type of slavery. So this is not something that's new. It's not something that is just, uh, again, used for agenda purposes. Statism has been talked about throughout history. Even Etienne de la Bozzi, he's a French writer, uh, wrote a whole book about this called The Discourse on Voluntary Servitude. And it's a fantastic read and talks about, has many quotes about being in harmony with nature and allowing nature's laws to rule. And so that aligns very much with Taoist teachings. But instead of me telling you what anarchy is and what statism is and statism seen as this bad thing because it's inauthenticity of human beings and who we naturally are, I want you to ask yourself these questions. Number one, is there any means by which any number of individuals can delegate to someone else the moral right to do something which none of the individuals have the moral right to do themselves? So if you don't have the right to steal from others, can you give that right that you don't have to other people? Say government, authority figures, policemen, they're allowed to rob from others, but you're not because they're an authority figure. Is morality not universally applied? Is the golden rule now able to be broken? So then let's look at number two. Do those who wield political power, presidents, legislators, etc., have the moral right to do things which other people do not have the moral right to do? If so, from whom and how do they acquire such a right? So if you say, yeah, well, they can steal for this or for that, you are now allowing theft, and not to mention you're guaranteeing it, to prevent pro possible theft or possible problems for your own whim. You're controlling other people that you do not control, and you are giving people power, putting them up on a pedestal over other human beings as well, uh, you create a lot of really tense, chaotic scenarios that wouldn't have happened in nature, um, that wouldn't be naturally there, per se. And so if you give people the moral right to do things which other people do not have the moral right to do, it's quite contradictive because we're all human beings, are we not? So unless you're saying we're not equal and that we each have different rights, then you're saying that some people have the right to rule and some people have the right to steal. Well, then what gives them the right to steal? What gives them the right to rule? Other than your mere belief, it has to be statism. Number three, is there any process, constitutions, elections, legislation by which human beings can transform an immoral act into a moral act without changing the act itself? Can you do that? Can you turn a theft or murder into something that's right. Say, oh, well, no, theft is okay if it's in this scenario, if it's in that scenario, if, if it's for the greater good. Or are you going to say theft is always wrong, no matter what? Because it is. You know, even if we can recognize it teaches us of what is right, that's the whole point of why we would recognize it as wrong. Right, so we can not see it necessarily as wrong, but as the part of as part of life, as in Taoism. But at the same time, we're not going to continue it because it's force. It goes against Wu Wei. It's trying to change human beings and make them good, but we cannot do that. 
And so number four, when lawmakers and law enforcers use coercion and force in the name of law and government, do they bear the same responsibility for their actions that anyone else would who did the same thing on their own? You really have to think about these questions for yourself because, I'll be honest, this programming goes back to our very childhood. When we grow up in this world and wherever country you're in, you think your country is one that you have to be proud of and you have to pledge allegiance to a flag or um, worship some pieces of paper. But is that honest? Is that natural for your condition? You know, did Lao Tzu ever say, yeah, you know, pe there's human authority in, in, in people and they must be followed no matter what? Confucius might have said, yeah, there need to be rules and rituals in society, but did Lao Tzu tell us that? Confucius got his way in China. Look what happened. Lao Tzu, on the other hand, left China because he saw it was heading in that direction. He saw that the world was getting more ideological and agenda-based. And Jason Gregory, which is one of the reasons why I love his videos, is he's very open and speaks up about this. He's not shy away from it. He says, hey, you know, if, if you want to live in harmony with nature and, and let things be, we can't have an agenda. We can't tell people how to live their lives. And so when there is a conflict between an individual's own moral conscience and the commands of a political authority, is the individual morally obligated to do what he personally views as wrong in order to obey the law? Should he go against what he knows to be wrong just because someone told him to do so? This would be going against our own intuition and what we know. Again, Wu Wei is intelligent effortlessness and going with the stream of life, not the stream of society. Not having all these desires and attachments and letting them take hold of us and just doing what we're told. No, acting intelligently and acting only when necessary. So just ask yourself these questions and think for yourself. Here's more understanding that we can get from this point of view. If we had our needs met and we're content with who we are, we would be ungovernable. What works today will not work tomorrow. There will always be change naturally. So when we try to pass a law, it's not universal and it's temporary. And it's just some opinions of some people of what they think should be done upon the rest of society. So apply that in light of our knowledge of the Tao. Does that really stand at the test of time? Is that challenging the Tao? Well, we don't need to force change. We cannot alter nature based on belief systems or social conformity. We try to force the enforceable, but we can't make people good. Lao Tzu, remember, he tells us, let reality be reality. We are told that nature is chaotic and thus we think we should try to control everything. And so every government always falls and never sustains. And it rises again because people still have that statist belief system, which is actually quite simple. It's not so complex. It's simply that belief in authority that other people have the right to rule, that you can put people on this pedestal and they can do things that other people can't do. It's contradictory to our own morals and our own beliefs. And so Taoism teaches us that everything in nature will govern itself and that nature always gets its way. So why do we try and keep attempting to create new governments thinking that we've got it figured out? Sometimes we'll even say that the government was created by God and it's perfect and it will keep itself limited, but it never does. Perhaps it's because it's the nature of such a system that it cannot do so. And it's not the first time, again, that we've recognized this. And I'm going to be sharing with you a lot more information about this, even from Chinese Taoists throughout history that share this exact perspective. And so without government, who would provide blank, right? Many people ask this question, well, who would provide roads? Well, who will, you know, uh, fix this problem, that problem, whatever comes on people's mind arbitrarily. So if I ask you, is it important for what you think government would provide? And if you say no, well, then the government shouldn't be wasting money on things that aren't important. But if you say yes, it's important. Well, would you be willing to pay for it even if you weren't forced to do so? And if you say yes, well, then people would pay for it voluntarily. 
And if you say no, then I have to go back to the question, is it important? Because if it's important enough, people will pay voluntarily, just as they do any other service in society. The only exemption people make to their basic morality is with statism and in politics. And if we understand this, this may be able to help us align to Taoism in more ways than we may understand. Because as far as I'm aware right now, and of making this presentation, a lot of Taoists do not know this perspective of their own philosophy about anarchism, about authority and the concept of human authority, if that's even a thing. And so look at the position of voluntarism on the chart on the right. So if you look at communism, socialism, conservatism, even minarchism, minarchism is the idea that the government should be very small and limited and it will be perfect if it's just balanced enough to work in such a way. Notice that it still includes using violence on peaceful people in order to get certain things done. And the only one that doesn't is voluntarism which is just a simple moral philosophy that says, I am not willing to use violence against peaceful people. I will seek to acquire desired services through voluntary relationships. It is embracing the reality that people will always trade with each other, that there will always be some sort of fruits of people's labor, that people will need to work for what they want or trade and, and develop businesses and organizations, that that is just part of our nature to organize, to do everything that we do. But it's not part of our nature to think that somebody is an authority figure who must rule over our lives, who must use violence in everybody else that we disagree with. Because, you know, we think that authority figure is the best and, and should rule over everyone else, or we think we should rule over everyone else. I mean, it's absurd. We get that idea because we were programmed into it purely and only because of that. And I will share more as to why that is, and I can say so without a doubt. Statism requires force. Voluntarism requires virtue. Statism divides people into controllable groups, whereas voluntarism leaves people free to associate. Statism encourages envy, whereas voluntarism encourages wise decision-making. Statism rewards loyalty to the state, whereas voluntarism rewards rewards loyalty to hard work. Statism destroys success, whereas voluntarism rewards success. Statism seeks to control others, and voluntarism seeks to keep others from controlling you. And you can just look at a mere example of raw milk, how it's illegal in a lot of states in America. It's a healing food that's been consumed for thousands of years. It's illegal because some people think it's unhealthy or it's going to cause disease, but do not people have the right to their own body to decide what to put in it or not? If they have the right to decide what to put in their own body because they own their own body, then it doesn't matter what someone says that they can or cannot do with their own body because it's their own body. And so as long as they don't transgress on other people's bodies, fair enough, it's the golden rule. It's voluntarism. It's voluntary. And so, voluntarism offers limitless options. Statism limits your options, and it results in suffering, whereas voluntarism results in freedom, inevitably, because it is. And you can just see these other charts sum it up quite well. We were all humans until race disconnected us, politics divided us, religion separated us, and wealth classified us. Again, Taoism would look at all of these polarities and say, these are all man-made attachments and desires holding humans in place and preventing us from flowing with the natural universe at hand. Plato, Western philosopher, tells us good people don't need laws to tell them to act responsibly and bad people will find a way around the laws. So what's the point of the law? Larkin Rose really helps summarize this concept of authority in his works he has many videos online, many great animations, even movies, awesome stuff. He says, I'm not scared of the Maos and the Stalins and the Hitlers. I'm scared of the thousands of millions of people that hallucinate them to be authority and so do their bidding and pay for their empires and carry out their orders. 
I don't care if there's one loony with a stupid mustache. He's not a threat if the people do not believe in authority. He also says government itself does no harm because it is a fictional entity. But the belief in government, the notion that some people actually have the moral right to rule over others, has caused immeasurable pain and suffering, injustice and oppression, enslavement and death. And again, all you have to do is open up any textbook, <laughs> read history, and you'll see this has been the case. So why do we think we can create an exception to that, to the reality that we cannot rule over this universe or attempt to play God and rule over other people's lives? Here are just some of the examples of the silly things governments make people do. 125 years ago, you didn't have to ask permission from the government to collect rainwater, go fishing, own a property, start a business, build a home, get married, hunt, own a weapon, cut hair, sell a product, protest, or sell food. You can do virtually nothing without being extorted by government and obtaining their permission first. If you still think you're free, you're deluding yourself. You are just a free-range human living on a tax farm. Now, you may say this part of the presentation is getting a little bit more doom and gloom, but we have to face our problems. We don't escape them. We recognize that these problems are part of the process of life because they are. We experimented, and guess what? Our experiment did not work. If we want to learn from history, not repeat history, we will understand this. And so, here are more examples. Just don't feed the homeless. Don't expose secrets. You must use licenses and permits. You are required to register your birth. You must join the army if needed. You can't collect rainwater. You must use money. You are required to use a passport to travel. You must send your kids to school. You must keep all your bills and receipts. You must not grow certain plants. You must pay 20 to 40% of your income to the government, to people you don't know, for services you may not even know get done mandatory vaccines to participate you must pay money for higher education you can't drink raw milk i mentioned that you can't actually say what you want break any rules and you will pay or be locked up in a cage now go to school get a job get married get a mortgage consume obey and die and again life is so much more than that why are we trying to limit the possibility and freedom and the potential of humans to gather together. I ask people, I do interviews in the street and I ask them, I say, what is it you want in the world? And everybody says kindness. They say, why can't the world be more kind? And everybody's saying that. And there's a small few exception of people they recognize do bad things. But because of that small exception, we have to force extort every, all of society and put it all under lockdown just because of some one two problems that we recognize are in the millions of generally peaceful people who understand what is right and wrong generally and don't even need to be taught it because it's become part of their intuition effortlessly as Wu Wei what is right and wrong generally as you know do not harm others the golden rule and all the things I mentioned before and so you can understand this through a psychological perspective too there's no end to this perspective Controllers, abusers, and manipulative people don't question themselves. They don't ask themselves if the problem is them. They always say the problem is someone else. Politics is greatly dividing, and people do this. They defend their ideology. They have this reinforcement with other people who agree with them. In politics, it's always this party's fault, that guy's fault. And it's a never-ending battle. And you saw it not long after America's foundation. The abolitionists started to see it not even a hundred years after and now we're 300 years after and the government has grown even more exponentially in power and you can see this uh, graph in the top right how to solve all problems robot up uprising well give the government more power pandemic give the government more power uh, crocs give the government more power starbucks gets your order wrong give the government more power people disagreeing with you give the government more power orc invasion give the government more power this is what it's getting down to. People don't want to be responsible for themselves. They want to give it away to others because they have a hard time being honest with themselves and accepting their natural reality. And again, they've been programmed into 
thinking that the government is like this mommy or daddy, the daddy that will protect them or the mommy that will give them everything they need as like a caretaker figure. And so psychologically, the government works upon the populace in subtle ways like that. Even with Stockholm Syndrome, a psychological phenomenon in which hostages express empathy and have positive feelings towards their captors, sometimes to the point of defending them. We're so conditioned to the point where we think we need to steal from the public in order to have services, in order to have good things in the world. We need to guarantee something wrong. And it's saying that we need something evil for the possibility of something good. Just think about how contradictive that sounds. Democide, it's the murder of any person or people by a government, including genocide, politicide, and mass murder. It's actually known as the number one cause of unnatural death. A total of nearly 400 million deaths in the 20th century. That's not even counting the 350 plus wars between governments, the 40 plus million war deaths. I mean, it's, it's so crazy, right? This is when we have to face, yes, this is the man-made reality that we built for ourselves, but it's not the natural reality. We have to remember that. When the government does it, it's the Patriot Act. When anyone else does it, felony wiretapping. And just go through the list, you know? When government does it, it's education. When anyone else does it, indoctrination. When the government does it, arrests. When anyone else does it, kidnapping. When the government does it, taxation. When anyone else does it, armed robbery. Are we going to keep living with this clearly contradictive logic? Larkin Rose tells us, if you personally advocate that I be caged if I don't pay for whatever government things you want, please don't pretend to be tolerant or nonviolent or enlightened or compassionate. Don't pretend you believe in live and let live. And don't pretend you want peace, freedom, or harmony. This is also related to the idea that Carl Jung talks about with mass psychosis. And he also has many quotes talking about how people view the state as God um, and worship it and how it alienates individuals into collective mindsets that ultimately tear apart a nation and causes chaos. He talks about that in his last book, The Undiscovered Self. But he talks about a mass psychosis is an epidemic of madness and it occurs when a large population of society loses touch with reality and descends into delusions. He says it is not famine, not earthquakes, not microbes, not cancer, but man himself who is man's greatest danger to man. For the simple reason that there is no adequate protection against psychic epidemics which are infinitely more devastating than the worst of natural catastrophes. So he's saying psychic epidemics are infinitely more devastating what people believe, what's in their minds. And again, we talked all throughout this presentation about how our minds get in our own way, how they prevent us from aligning to our own nature. So, I mean, just look again through history. We can even create a chart, like this chart from Art of Liberty. They have a ton of great resources on their website documenting so much. And they go through how people worship the flag. They're taught to do the Pledge of Allegiance. And all these tyrannical countries all had constitutions. They all had the same monetary systems as the ones now. This worries me. The same exact strategies that these countries used and all their citizens were like, yeah, this is great. And let's, we love Hitler. We love Stalin. It's all this like idol, idols and, and, and falling in love and putting them on pedestals and saying, these people are going to save us from our problems. And then it descends into madness, into chaos, and it causes so much chaos that it becomes the number one cause of death. I mean, this is just mind-blowing. I don't know how to share this with the world at a certain point. Here's a really simple way to understand this whole concept of statism and the problem with authority. If John told you that you had to obey him or he would violate you, that would be wrong. So even if John claims that because he and his friends are in the majority, you must obey or be punished, that would still be wrong. Even if John and his friends vote to have an institution work on their behalf and that you must obey its dictates or be punished, that would still be wrong. So if you understand this basic concept, then you understand that government neither has the legitimate or lawful right 
to violate you just because some people decided to vote for it. And you can even see that all the arguments used against abolishing slavery are virtually the same for that of abolishing government. Again, not a newly found connection. We'll talk more about that too, but I also wrote many books and have many videos on that topic to be exact. And so you can see a thumbnail of a video on the top left of this slide about abolitionist towns. If you want some inspiration to get out of this mess, the abolitionists in the 1800s, I consider them rather successful for what they had to do, which was end chattel slavery after thousands of years, a practice of brutality, having to convince the world that no, it is not economically good for society and that it's okay to free slaves. It's not going to result in chaos. It's going to result, if anything, in more productivity. And it did. Yes, there's short-term chaos that happened because of, you know, a new change in society after thousands of years. But eventually, it even spread to the rest of the world because the ideas were irresistible. And people saw it that it was destined for the human race to be free. That is how the abolitionists really were able to convey their message. They even built towns to help runaway slaves called the Underground Railroad that would allow people to stay with them to get away from the government, to get away from their slave masters, and be able to live more freely. And so there was one town that literally went 13 years with no government, and yet there was no crime. I believe the one particularly being noted there is called Modern Times by Josiah Warren. And he's known as the practical anarchist. He's also an abolitionist throughout history, an orchestra leader, inventor, Great guy, right? A lot of fantastic quotes from his works. And there's a lot of other abolitionists at that time. He was particularly an anarchist as well. Although again, he's wearing a bow tie, he dresses very nicely. You wouldn't think of him as an anarchist the same way you would look at someone like Murray Rothbard. Or even, like I show on this slide, J.R.R. Tolkien, who is the writer of the Lord of the Rings series, which is greatly popular around the world, he says, my political opinions lean more and more to anarchy. The most improper job of any man, even saints, is bossing other men. Not one in a million is fit for it, and least of all those who seek the opportunity. And that was taken particularly from uh, his own letters that he sent to his son. You can find those online. I also did a video on psychological experiments, in particular banned psychology experiments that are not able to be reproduced because of how controversial the foundings were. In particular, the Stanley Milgram experiment and the Stanford Prison experiment. The Stanley Milgram experiment, definitely something you should probably look up because it tells you exactly this mentality of statism as well, where somebody is willing to compromise their own morals because they're told to do so by an authority figure. They believe in it so much. And there were many experiments, and this was redone many times, and I compiled it a lot in that documentary uh, of all the footage because it was recorded as well. And there were books written about it too, Obedience to Authority by Stanley Milgram. And it's this, it's just shocking. Over 90% of people would conform to authority. And for the few people who didn't, they said, this is why Nazi Germany, this is why Soviet Russia did what they did. And the, the person who did that experiment, Stanley Milgram, said that if today America had camps, the same thing would happen just as in Germany because people believe in authority that much to this day. So it hasn't changed. That's really alarming. And that should make everybody um, want to hopefully educate people about these ideas. But as we understand Taoism, we don't want to push ourselves too much out there. We don't want to have extreme views in the sense. But is it really extreme to tell people to simply be people? To respect people as merely people, not to see them as authority, not to see anyone higher or lesser than anyone else. It's not extreme. It seems extreme especially when we're new coming to it. It's really simple, actually. And so you can see if we're trying to create a better world, well, we can choose the nonviolent path. Again, the path of least resistance, Wu Wei. This is how we're actually gonna achieve peace. Because if we go to submission, we have loss, and that, you know, it's based on survival. 
And if we have aggression, we have gain, but that's based on instinct. So the midground between submission and aggression and survival and instinct is peace, which is nonviolence. We don't want to be stuck in fear. Okay, we want to be stuck in love, which doesn't have us stuck. It has us ever expansive. It has us welcoming to our fellow man, being willing to accept their difference in opinion. Okay, that is that is harmony. That is voluntarism. You live the life you want to live. I leave you alone. You leave me alone. That's it. We each live our own lives with our own opinions. We just don't impose it on each other with violence. It's so simple. And so there is no necessary evil. You cannot balance what is unnatural to exist as it may simply be abolished as in the case of abolitionism. There is a reason why we would call something bad or unnatural. So why would we call anything a necessary evil or a natural unnatural? Chattel slavery was deemed unnatural for humankind, and we see that we can naturally live without it. It's more effortless to just live our own lives, not try to chain up other human beings and tell them, you have to work for me. <laughs> that took a lot of work to maintain. It's way more effortless to live our own lives and let people pursue their own dreams. And it's way more prosperous for everybody. A poisonous plant, although it may be natural to exist, would not be something natural to use as we recognize its nature as poisonous to our nature. So an attempt to balance government would be counterintuitive if we cannot balance something that should not exist in the first place. It has no existence other than through our belief in statism, similar to our belief that anyone must be enslaved. Okay, It's purely in the mind, and that's why it can be abolished. It can be a, a lost you know, history of humanity, putting it behind us, going to the future, Let's actually create a unified, voluntary world. That's the world that I want to create. Now, unified in the sense of people are still different among each other, but they accept that difference and therefore they're unified. That's the type of unity I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, oh, well, you have no choice but to abide to this person. Okay, and no choice but to go along with what they say. That's not unity. That's using violence to force your way upon the world. I'm talking about acceptance of the differences, allowing people to live their own lives. So here's another story that Swangza shares with us. He was fishing, relaxing at a riverbank. Two individuals approach him and offer to him a position in power. He observes the river's motion and states that a turtle is taken away from his natural habitat and draped in silk, enshrined for the royal palace. But which condition is preferable? Well-being tells us the natural habitat. Quote, When all men do not carry their nature beyond its normal condition, nor alter its characteristics, the good government of the world is secured. Swangza. So he's saying, the better life for the turtle is being in nature, not being enshrined and for the royal palace and seen as this symbol for the world that has to be worshipped? No. So the same thing for him. He basically is declining the position of power in a clever way here by saying, well, look at nature. They're not creating governments and religions and going to war with their own species with nuclear bombs. <laughs> They're not mad enough to do that. They might have some small quarrels among themselves. That's always going to exist. But they're not going to go out of their way to destroy their own species across the world at best. I mean, goodness, us humans, we do a lot of crazy things that we can look back at the past and say, man, we burned witches. Well, we got over that because we believed in witches. Well, we don't have to believe in authority. There's no such thing. There's just human beings. And so it's about having principles. C.S. Lewis talks to us about this. I am very doubtful whether history shows us one example of a man who, having stepped outside traditional morality, or Tao, and attained power, has used that power benevolently. And bear in mind that C.S. Lewis is somebody who comes from more of a Western point of view, a Christian point of view. And Jesus is an example of someone who followed the Tao and got punished for it. 
Jason Gregory, in his video, Why a Taoist is a Threat to Society, explains that someone who follows the Tao can't follow societal norms and dogmas. Taoism teaches us that we are interfering with our nature. We live in fear instead of trust, so we try to create goals and controls. Every ideology tries to shape individuals. We need to be able to say no and live with principles to live by, not man-made standards. Lao Tzu was a rebel to the mainstream Confucianism in China, and he straight up left. He's a rebel. He's an anarchist to that system. He didn't do so with violence. I'm going to go to the state. I'm going to... No, he just left. Now, it's not so easy nowadays. People tell me, well, if you don't like it here, why don't you leave? This is my natural universe. And not to mention, they watch you everywhere. And there's basically nowhere you can escape nowadays. But that being said, why can't I live where I naturally reside? In nature, actually naturalized. Not as a citizen, but as a human being. In nature, natural eyes to make natural. I don't see why this can't be the case. It's only people's beliefs that are holding other people back from living their lives. So if we deconstruct this one belief, which by the way, barely anyone talks about as much as when I'm making this video, then you know, we can really expect a change in the world because most people never even heard of statism or voluntarism. At least this is from my point of view of how I look at it. Even just Taoism has always been sort of like the undercurrent of society, but it's still always rising here and there again and again. And I think it's because it has some of these similar themes to voluntarism and understanding this basic concept of we need to align to nature, not man-made politics, not man-made religions, not man-made systems of control. Nature has been there. It's always been there, right? And so there are no lesser evils. Lao Tzu tells us the great Tao flows everywhere, both to the left and to the right. It loves and nourishes all things, but does not lord it over them. And when good things are accomplished, and when good things are accomplished, it lays no claim to them. Lao Tzu. So choosing the path of least resistance is not picking between two evils. It is not participating at all and therefore nourishing both evils in the light of the Tao. People think they have to choose a lesser of greater evil, but then that means they're still picking evil. They have a third choice. The third choice is do not vote, do not participate simply live your life so whether you're looking at democracy or a republic and republicans or republics are telling you we're not a democracy it doesn't matter it's still a system of control it's an ideology telling human beings how to live their own life so if we want to get out of that it's about seeing this Taoist perspective returning to our uncarved block and seeing we're all just human beings and that's all just made up from people long ago we didn't even know most of them <laughs> being slave owners too and a lot of shady practices happened back then as well that can also be documented. But, you know, people will always ask the question, well, what about law and order? Lao Tzu tells us, the more laws and restrictions there are, the poorer people become. The sharper men's weapons, the more trouble in the land. The more ingenious and clever men are, the more strange things happen. The more rules and regulations, the more thieves and robbers. So, I mean, you can just look at that picture. It's like, tell me what in there is natural other than the fact that they're human beings, but they're trying to be something they're not. They're all wearing special wigs and outfits and trying to be, have some sort of position of identity and authority over others. And you can see probably some conflict arises between the members um, and they're deciding the fate for the rest of the world. You know, these, these group of individuals over millions of other people. I mean, just to think of that alone, like a select few people over millions of people or one person over millions of people, does that make sense to you? I mean, it doesn't to me personally, but you know, again, think for yourself on this matter. Here's another story from Swangza. I don't actually know how to say this guy's name, but I'm gonna butcher this. Uh, Soi Chi said to Lao Tzu, you say there must be no government, but if there is no government, how are men's hearts to be improved? 
The last thing you should do, said Lao Tzu, is to tamper with men's hearts. The heart of man is like a spring. If you press it down, it only springs up the higher. It can be hot as the fiercest fire, cold as the hardest ice. So swift is it that in the space of a nod, it can go twice to the end of the world and back again. In repose, it is quiet as the bed at a pool, in action mysterious as heaven, a wild steed that cannot be tethered, such is the heart of man. From Swangza. So this is another story telling us, again, that the world is not meant to be governed by other men, other human beings. And Alan Watts even helps us put this into perspective. He says, quote, you're only making a mess by trying to put things straight. You're trying to straighten out a wiggly world and no wonder you're in trouble. And quite literally, we can observe the wiggly world in nature. Li in Chinese is considered organic pattern, but it's also considered law or order. It's the wiggly world which can be observed throughout nature. And here are just a bunch of different photos of different patterns within nature. I remember just going into the ocean the other day and seeing the pattern of the ripples of the waves. I mean, you can say it's a pattern, but each one, it's not the same, but it's relatively similar. It's like an order, you, again, you can't really put your finger on. And I looked at seaweed. I pulled up seaweed out of the ocean. I'm like, wow, this has like a, a brick-like structure to it. It's so fascinating, right? That there's this order and randomness within the universe at once together. It's so amazing. So Lao Tzu tells us the strong wind cannot last the whole morning. The torrential rain cannot last all day. It is nature that causes these things. But even nature cannot cause them to go on forever. If nature cannot do this, then certainly man cannot do so. The wise person follows the laws of earth. Soldiers are weapons of evil. Well, those are two separate quotes there, but they're both from Lao Tzu. And, you know, I love that one where he says, the wise person follows the laws of earth. I mean, most people, when they hear the word law, they only have one definition. And, you know, Mark Passio, he teaches a concept called natural law, very much related to that. Again, we also talked about deism, which shares that same idea. So he's saying, if nature cannot do this, then certainly man cannot do so. Trying to make something last forever, like a government, trying to make a law be perfect, it's not going to be perfect. So do we expect humans to always just be on top of it all the time and constantly be putting in new laws and taking them out? I mean, it's a stressful pursuit. Most of the people I talk to in those fields, they don't even want to do it themselves. Oh, I feel obligated to. I got to run for the people. They're doing what they don't want to do. Is this the life that people should be living? People should follow perhaps what is forever, what is nature itself. You see this kid surrendering into nature, into God, into the laws of earth, whatever you want to see it as, to the real government of the world. It has its own laws, thermodynamics, gravity, or whatever you want to call it, morality, right? The Tao. That is what we can embrace because it's all here for all of us, not just some select portion of humanity. Not for some people's ideas and ideologies, so they can also have a paycheck with it. I think it's absurd. And hopefully, coming from the uncarved block perspective, you can see this, and it becomes simple, as I see it. I see it so simply because I've done that shadow work. I've cried um, having to get over that belief system for myself. I couldn't wrap my head around it for the longest time. I mean, and I'm a young person, and I can expect it to be much harder for somebody who's 40, 50, 60 years old, going through this belief system so long into their life, statism. This is why Larkin Rose calls it the most dangerous superstition. And this is his book, The Most Dangerous Superstition. And you know what he says in it? He says, anarchy is reality. There's a whole section dedicated to it. So this is just one part of that section, okay? It's a fantastic book, perhaps the most underrated book of our times. And I think it will stand the test of time, just as the Tao Te Ching does. He says, many people have become anarchists, advocates of a society without any ruling class after having to come to the conclusion that society would be more prosperous and more peaceful and would enjoy more justice and security without any government at all. 
However, that is somewhat akin to an individual deciding, after careful analysis, that Christmas would work better without Santa Claus. But if Santa Claus is not real, it is pointless to have a debate about whether he is needed in order for Christmas to work. If Christmas works at all, it already works without Santa. And so it is with the usual debate between government and anarchy. Government does not exist. And this is a shared perspective among this voluntarist community that simply wants to see nature as nature and allow human beings to do what they've always done, which is trade with each other voluntarily without this superstition that has been indoctrinated into us at a very young age through the public schooling system. And so he even shares with us about the absence of rulers. He says, anarchy, meaning an absence of government, is what is. It is what has always been and will always be. When people accept that truth and stop hallucinating a creature called authority, they will stop behaving in the irrational and destructive manner they do now. People cannot delegate rights they do not have, which makes it impossible for anyone to acquire the right to rule, i.e. authority. People cannot alter morality, which makes the laws of government devoid of any inherent authority. A human being cannot have superhuman rights, and therefore no one can have the inherent right to rule. A person cannot be morally obliged to ignore his own moral judgment, therefore no one can have the inherent obligation to obey another. And those two ingredients, the ruler's right to command and the subject's obligation to obey, are the heart and soul of the concept of authority, without which it cannot exist. So that's it. Two ingredients, the subject obeying and the ruler's right to rule, which again comes from the person that gives them that right, which is statists, um, the belief in authority, statism. In particular, I like to focus on the idea. I don't like to go around saying to people, you're a statist or you're an anarchist. You know, I don't like to do that. I like to stay very focused on the ideas and the beliefs, what's actually going on. There's a reason why it is referred to as the most dangerous religion. Okay. And so here's another book that reaffirms this. And this is also very simply put. I mean, you're talking... I think kids can read this just like the Tao Te Ching. It is very simplistic yet very powerful. Uh, I think we shared a quote from this before, The End of All Evil by Jeremy Locke. He explains to us, there is no such thing as anarchy. You will not kill your neighbor in the absence of police. You are not evil. Those who wish this type of control and violence over others teach you that you are not worthy of ruling yourself. In fact, they're inciting chaos a lot of the time. They're putting in societal programmings. They're making it worse so they can validate their own existence. They teach you that you lack intelligence, self-control, and value. They teach that only government can rule you. The word government means tyranny. It exists to establish ownership of you. You need no governing. You are a human being and as such have infinite worth. You and you alone rightfully control your actions, your speech, and your labor. All who seek these things of you must receive your permission first. All who do not are evil. Anarchy is a lie. It is created by tyrants to deceive you. There is no such thing as anarchy. There is only tyranny. And again, it's just another way of saying anarchy is simply nature then. And this is another shared perspective among many other writers I can share with you. I can go on all day, but you get the point. What is being emphasized? What is being emphasized here is that voluntary interaction is superior to violent interaction, and most people know this. So let us go by what we know, and act intelligently, and do not act in the case of government. Wu Wei, non-action. Let's deliberately choose not to create the existence of government because it doesn't exist in reality. We want to go with the flow of life not the flow of some system that is built to control us. That is not a system that we want in our lives if it's just always going to end up in chaos and the most amount of death that is way more than any private murderers can ever do on their own. And this has also been statistically proven. So thank you very much for watching. This is the end of part four. We have a lot more to share and a lot more evidence of a lot of what I shared in, throughout this entire presentation. 
we're going to be concluding in the final part for part five. Thank you very much for sticking around as long as you have. Take care. Welcome to part five, the final part of Tao, the way of nature, a full return to nature. One that we are all ever working toward. If that is, we care about ourselves and the world around us. And that may mean sacrifice to the extent of our own belief systems, to fight our own cognitive dissonance, which is those mental blockades of getting past our old belief systems and being able to emerge as a more optimum, more sustainable individual, an individual who is more self-reliant, who has more freedom, because they're not tied or attached to ideology, tied or attached to different nations and borders and flags and titles and power and greed and all of it that comes from our current Yang materialist society. And so, as you see this, as we move on, uh, may you always remember to think for yourself. But I will say that the tie between philosophical anarchism and Taoism is no new concept. And if you were here for the last part, it would not alarm you because there are many quotes from Lao Tzu and Xuanzi that support this stance. And the word anarchism, again, just means no rulers. Not no rules, um, but it does imply that individuals should live voluntarily or without aggression being legitimized by authority or statism. And so, as you can see on this slide, there are many different people who have acknowledged this, not just myself. In fact, we're going to actually go over many historical figures as well toward the end of this presentation. And you can see that I have highlights, I have some titles of some works that make this connection, an Anarcho-Taoist Manifesto, the Tao of Anarchy, and surprisingly also the Metaphysics of Anarchism, where it even says political Taoism is the only true form of anarchism, speculative Taoism is the one pure form of metaphysics. So that is quite interesting. That article goes over quite a lot as well, and some of these are very well written and there's a lot more out there actually but i figured to screenshot some of those that seem to really use Lao Tzu and swung quotes just as i do and you can see that if you just go to the mere wikipedia and look at precursors to anarchism the first thing that pops up is ancient china where it says taoism the first word in the very first paragraph um, and it says that Many of the Taoists actually lived in an anarchic lifestyle. So there's a lot of um, ties that could be made here. You can even see there's a flag. We'll go over that. Um, there's common colors being used here for Taoist anarchism, which again, isn't really a thing. It's a title. It's an identity. We don't want to attach ourselves to it. But there's even pages. There's articles. This is not a new connection or concept. Just as there's that quote, there is nothing new under the sun. And especially since Taoism goes back thousands of years, this is quite impressive to see this connection, being that anarchism is relatively new. It's something that arose out of the 1800s into the 1900s. So that's not even 200 years ago from when I record this now. Even Taoist writers from back then in the years BC actually support this conclusion I'll be sharing with you guys. But if we look at symbolism, like that flag right there that you see on the left side of the slide, where you have the white and the black, well, typically in anarchism, the black stands for non-aggression, non-violence, or just anarchism. And then usually it's paired with another color. So yellow would usually be self-ownership, voluntarism, or capitalism, or free trade, or free markets. Uh, red might be setting up communes and setting up collective societies that people choose to live together. Um, you know, there's pink, there's uh, 
dark green for people who really like nature and feel like technology might be a threat to human existence. There's many different types that people make uh, sort of to tie into anarchism to make their position a bit more clear, although again, it can stray a bit more toward the identity issue. But typically, when you see white paired with black, uh, like we do see with the yin-yang symbol, well, white actually stands for non-resistance, pacifism, unity, simplicity, or spirituality. So you'll see it among uh, like Christian anarchism, which is also among the roots of all anarchism. And you'll see it among uh, pacifist anarchism, which actually there's a lot of people who hold that position. Again, using Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and what they did in history uh, and how powerful it was to create change. So just realize that there's value in all these different ways of thinking, and they aren't just baseless. They aren't just for chaos. Uh, they have a philosophical undertone. And so even Leo Tolstoy uh, recognized the Tao, and this is a very important thing to understand because Leo Tolstoy, who's Russian, is known as one of the greatest writers of all time, according to many different sources, and he was outspokenly an anarchist. And he tells us what to do in 1899 from letters to a Chinese gentleman. He says, quote, only adhere to that liberty which consists in following the rational way of life. Z-E-Y Tao is a Tao, and of themselves will be abolished all the calamities which your officials cause you, and your oppression and plunder by Europeans will become impossible. So he's saying, follow the Tao, and all your problems will go away, essentially. You will free yourselves from your officials by not fulfilling their demands, and above all, by not obeying, you will cease to contribute to the oppression and plunder of each other. You will free yourselves from plunder on the part of Europeans by keeping the Tao and not recognizing yourselves as belonging to any state or as being responsible for the deeds committed by your government. If the people recognize human power as higher than the power of God, higher than the law or Tao, then the people will always be slaves, and the more so, the more complex their organization of power, such as a constitutional one which they institute and to which they submit. Only those people can be free for whom the law of God or Tao is the sole supreme law to which all others should be subordinated. If the Chinese people were only to continue to live as they have formerly lived a peaceful, industrious, agricultural life, following in their conduct the principles of their three religions, Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, all three in their basis coinciding, Confucianism and the liberation from all human authority, Taoism and not doing to others what one does not wish done to oneself, and Buddhism and love towards all men and all living beings, then of themselves would disappear all those calamities from which they now suffer, and no powers could overcome them. So a very powerful quote from Leo Tolstoy sharing with us uh, the value of the Tao. So again, we're seeing now some of the positive perspectives coming back in. I know that we had a period of this presentation where we looked at some of the dark sides of humanity and what we do to each other. Um, but again, there we have to not ignore the problem at hand and realize that that problem is part of the process of learning if we seek the bigger picture we seek this yin yang taoist perspective that tells us let's look at the law of god let's not get stuck on human powers and the governments that tell us what to do no there's this Tao that is teaching us what to do every single day of our lives and this is the real thing that we have to follow leo tolstoy is basically telling us here and so, if we look across some historical figures, we may come across Bao Jingying, uh, who lived between late 200 AD and 400 AD. He was a philosopher and Taoist known as China's first political anarchist. He is the author of the text Neither Lord Nor Subject, which was preserved by Taoist Gi Hong, which is a practitioner and philosopher. You can see uh, a book cover for this short little text that we're going to actually be reading here in the following slide. And so you can see the anarchy symbol being basically merged here with the yin-yang symbol. 
And so let's just read over this because I find this absolutely astonishing that this was written so long ago and is so relevant to now. And based on my estimation of understanding voluntarism and anarchism and how these ideas are growing alongside Taoism in the modern day, I think these ideas can make a great revival and truly change the world for the better in the near future. And so this is Bao Yingying, a Taoist, telling us from his text, neither lord nor subject. Quote, in the earliest times, there was neither lord nor subject. Wells were dug for drinking water. The fields were plowed for food. Work began at sunrise and ceased at sunset. Everyone was free and at ease, neither competing with each other nor scheming against each other, and no one was either glorified or humiliated. The way and its virtue, the Dowdy, having fallen into decay, a hierarchy was established. Customary regulations for promotion and degradation and for profit and loss proliferated. Ceremonial garments such as the gentry's shash and sacrificial cap and the imperial blue and yellow robes for worshipping heaven and earth were elaborated. Buildings of earth and wood were raised high into the sky, with the beams and rafters painted red and green. The heights were overturned in quest of gems. The depths dived into in search of pearls. But however vast a collection of precious stones people might have assembled, it still would not have sufficed to satisfy their whims and a whole mountain of gold would not have been enough to meet their expenditure. So sunk were they in depravity and vice, having transgressed against the fundamental principles of the great beginning. Daily they became further removed from the ways of their ancestors and turned their back more and more upon man's original simplicity. Because they promoted the worthy to office, Ordinary people strove for reputation, and because they prized material wealth, thieves and robbers appeared. The sight of desirable objects tempted true and honest hearts, and the display of arbitrary power and love of gain opened the road to robbery. So they made weapons with points and with sharp edges, and after that there was no end to usurpations and acts of aggression and they were only afraid lest crossbows should not be strong enough, shields stout enough, lances sharp enough, and defenses solid enough. Yet all this could have been dispensed with if there had been no oppression and violence from the start. Although tyrants such as Chie and Cho were able to burn men to death, massacre their advisors, make mincemeat of the feudal lords, cut the barons into strips, tear out men's hearts and break their bones, and go to the furthest extremes of tyrannical crime, down to the use of torture by roasting and grilling, however cruel they may by nature have been, how could they have done such things if they had to remain among the ranks of the common people? If they gave way to their cruelty and lust and butchered the whole empire, it was because, as rulers, they could do as they pleased. As soon as the relationship between lord and subject is established, hearts become daily more filled with evil designs, until the manacled criminals sullenly doing forced labor in the mud and the dust are full of mutinous thoughts. The sovereign trembles with anxious fear in his ancestral temple, and the people simmer with revolt in the midst of their poverty and distress and to try to stop them revolting by means of rules and regulations, or control them by means of penalties and punishments, is like trying to dam a river in full flood with a handful of earth, or keeping the torrents of water back with one finger." So that is an excerpt of this text, and I find it very astonishing. A lot of parallels to what we talked about before with understanding that the root cause to anarchism or statism, understanding statism, is the relationship between the ruled and the ruler. That this relationship would not exist if it wasn't for statism, the belief that individuals have a moral right or legitimate right to rule over other individuals' lives. That belief is responsible for all, most of the bloodshed throughout history 
and as demonstrated here in this fantastic quote. Now, there was another individual. His name was Wu Enji. He was a Chinese Taoist, lived between late 200 AD and 300 AD. He lived a life of play, much like Zhuangzi. And so he wrote this text, The Biography of Master Great Man. So this is from Ruin Qi, a Taoist. Quote, The weak were not cowed by oppression, nor did the strong prevail by their force. For then there was no ruler, and all beings were peaceful. No officials, and all affairs were well ordered. Men preserved their persons and cultivated their natures, not deviating from their norm. Only because it was so were they able to live to great ages. But now, when you make music, you get sounds in disorder. When you indulge in sexual activity, you weaken the body. You change your exterior appearance to hide your passions within you. Filled with desires, you seek excess. You practice counterfeits to make yourself famous. When rulers are set up, tyranny arises. When officials are established, thieves are born. You idly ordain rights and laws to bind the lowly common people. You cheat the stupid and fool the unskillful, and hide your knowledge to make yourselves appear to be like spirits. The strong look fierce and are oppressive, the weak shiver with anguish and are servile. You pretend to be honest to attain your avaricious ends. You harbor dangerous thoughts within you, but appear benevolent to the outside world. When you commit some crime, you do not repent of it, but when you encounter some good fortune, you take it as a matter for personal pride. Now, if there were no honors, those in low position would bear no grudges. If there were no riches, the poor would not struggle to obtain them. Each would be satisfied within himself and would have nothing else to seek. If liberalities and favors did not bind one to a sovereign, there would be no reason to expose oneself to death in defeat against his enemies. If rare music were not performed, the ear's hearing would not be altered. If lascivious views were not shown, the eye's sight would not be changed. If the ear and the eye were not altered and changed, there would be no way to disrupt the spirit. But now you honor merit to make one another exalted. You compete with your abilities to set one above the other. You struggle for power to make one rule over another. And you esteem honors so that you can offer them to one another. You encourage the whole world to pursue these aims. And the result is that the upper and lower classes harm one another. You exhaust all the creatures of the universe to their very limits in order to purvey to the endless desires of your senses. This is no way to nourish the common people, and then you fear the people will understand what is going on, so you add rewards to please them and strengthen punishments to keep them in awe. But when there is no more wealth, rewards can no longer be given. When there are no more punishments, sentences cannot be carried out. Then begin the calamities of ruined states, assassinated rulers, and armies defeated and dispersed. Are these things not caused by you, gentlemen? Your rights and laws are indeed nothing more than the methods of harmful robbers, of troublemakers, of death and destruction. And you, you think they form an unalterable way of excellent conduct. How erroneous you are. Wow. What a quote from this text, a biography of Master Great Man. And, I mean, is this not telling? I've read a lot of different anarchist philosophy texts throughout history. This reminds me a lot of Lysander Spooner and what he talks about. Um, and again, nobody really learns about him, ever. Um, you know, he goes against a lot of worldviews, even the chaotic anarchist because they're philosophically based they're based in understanding natural laws i mean spooner wrote a whole thing about natural laws of the universe and morality and following that and you know you can clearly see these people aren't against order in in the world they're not against uh people coming together they're against rulers telling others how to live their own lives
They're against this greed, insatiable desires that man falls into. And they see it ultimately then as like this fall of society. It's absolutely alarming. Um, to anyone who's a Taoist out there, I plead you to really look at your own writings in this case. Um, look at these historical writings and see what you can make of it for yourself. I, I think this is extremely powerful for the modern day and getting past our political divisions just for one division in the world at least a very big one in fact uh, it's perhaps the biggest one that is aggregated that i've noticed is the idea of government authority because the reason why is because people assume government to be nature itself the law of the universe that they must follow and individuals can't serve two masters they have to serve truth and morality, I would hope, or the Tao. They can't serve humankind unless humankind also aligns to the Tao, right? And so this is this binding, universal, helpful tool for humanity, the Tao. And yet we ignore it in the attempt to play God and play as nature and play as the Tao and choose to alter life and tell other people what to do. It's absurd. Well, here's another historical figure. His name is Leo Shifu. He went through many different um, ideas through his lifetime. Some people have to experiment to understand where they place themselves. He is actually known as the father of Chinese anarchism. And he came to realize that violence is not the solution to solving the problems, as well as the fact that the whole system needs to be changed, and that requires the masses. He also came to understand that morality would be a requirement. So anytime people talk about politics nowadays, I guarantee you most of the time they're not talking about morality, they're not talking about the Tao, and they're not talking about the average everyday person. They want to put some person in power, one select individual, and put them up on a pedestal, and then they ask for money, and then they build an identity, and they build titles. They do the exact opposite of what the Tao teaches us. And so he, Leo Shifu, even created a conscience society with a 12-point pledge. So this is a voluntary, you know, little group that he set up. And it said, do not eat meat, do not drink liquor, do not smoke tobacco, do not use servants, do not ride in seat in chairs or rickshaws, do not marry, do not use a family name, do not serve as an official, do not serve as a body do not serve as a member of a representative body, do not join a political party, do not serve in the army or navy, and do not believe in a religion. And so, quite interesting, you know, we think of conscience, we think again of our ability to do right as opposed to wrong, to uh, listen to our intuition, our common sense knowledge. And so I'm guessing his 12-point pledge here comes from the basis of these things make a society less pure. Um, they tend to corrupt human beings. And we can see that with each one of these, even marriage, because typically it might be under a strict setting of it has to be done a certain way. And that can go against the Tao in the sense of it is strict. It has a set ritual. So kind of like Confucianism, it deals with a lot of rituals, whereas Taoism, it's more about aligning to nature. Let's let the love come naturally. Let's not set up a bunch of identities around it. We can see how this can be an issue in the modern day where people are fighting, you know, men versus women and who has more rights or not. And then people act like they're victims and then people want to empower others and then it can be counterintuitive and then they focus so much on it and it makes other people upset and marriage there's a lot of superficial ideas around it where people are like well you got to get money you got to have a cake you have to have a certain person read you certain lines uh it's you know they may not even live with each other before they get married you know it's but then society gets in their way and they lose what they first had because of the materialism and there's so many factors at play that we can't really generalize but generally speaking we can see that certain things um, like telling people what to do 
is counterintuitive. And so even then telling people what not to do can be counterintuitive, but usually the do nots are more powerful, like in the sense of Wu Wei, uh, because it's saying to return back to simplicity, like Lao Tzu says, to unlearn every day until you arrive at non-action or Wu Wei. And we also have Liu Shipai, and he is known as the most important Chinese theorist in anarchism. And he was a philologist. I don't know what exactly that is, um, but he's greatly influenced by Taoism. He was a teacher, and he died at a young age with a lot of potential. When I was doing research on him, I'm like, wow, this guy did a lot of stuff, um, and he wasn't that old. You know, he had a whole future ahead of himself. So. A little unfortunate there, but he still nonetheless created some impact in his time, and he created systems to better calculate chronology, so that's time. He starred a newspaper called Tianyi Bao, which is called Natural Justice, and it's known as the first anarchist journal in the Chinese language, but it got shut down by the government of Japan. Probably not a surprise there. He worked alongside his wife, He Jin, uh, who advocated for the freedom of women. And he also worked alongside Jing Meiju. Many ideas were shared among Russian thought and writers like Leo Tolstoy. Tolstoy had a great influence on the people at the time. And the language Esperanto was also supported by anarchist efforts at times, and it shared many similar ideals. He also was influenced by French anarchist Jacques Elise Recluse. So that's another individual you may learn about. Another is actually Ba Xin. And Ba Xin was a Chinese anarchist, translator, and writer, but he aged to 100 years old. So that's from 1904 to 2005. I'd be curious if there's any footage of him online uh, talking about anything, but he is responsible for the work titled Family. He states, quote, only by not forgetting the past can we be the master of the future, and that my pen is a light and my body a flame. Until both burn down to ash, my love and my hate will remain here in the world. And I can assure you, Ba Jin, if you're listening to me in the spirit world, um, your voice is definitely going to be carried on, as with many anarchists throughout history who were seen as rebels, uh, just for thinking for themselves. Uh, you are not the only one. <laughs> so don't worry about that, my friend. I mean, here is another good example. Ursula K. Lagoon. She is a famous American author, and she was inspired by nonviolent resistance, activism, Taoism, Carl Jung, and anarchism. So just bringing together all the many different ideas that we talked about in this presentation, I find it fascinating. And if we learn about one of her books, The Dispossessed, it was set on twin planets of Eurus and Inares, and it features a planned anarchist society depicted as an ambiguous utopia. Unlike classical utopias, the society of Inares is portrayed as neither perfect nor static. The protagonist, Shevek, finds himself traveling to Eurus to pursue his research. Nonetheless, the misogyny and hierarchy present in the authoritarian society of Eurus is absent among the anarchists, who base their social structure on cooperation and individual liberty. So that's a quote from the Wikipedia that I borrowed, and here's a quote from Ursula Goyne herself. She says, writers such as Peter Kropotkin and Paul Goodman, with them I felt a great immediate affinity. They made sense to me in the way that Lao Tzu did. So there she's making another connection between an anarchist and a Taoist in her own words. Fantastic. Uh, if you don't know who Peter Kropotkin is, uh, he is a famous anarchist theorist who came up with many great ideas. In fact, you want if you want to read some ideas that can be applied in the modern day, uh, the individual Derek Bros wrote a book on how to opt out of the technocratic state. So how to opt out of the technocratic state by Derek Bros, and he shares some ideas by Peter Kropotkin. Even Jason Gregory shares some ideas from him. Uh, he's been talked about a little bit in the Taoist communities because of his recognition of some of its teachings. So I mentioned before about the abolitionist of the 19th century. 
Well, you can see I have some screenshots of the non-resistant newspaper, which by the way, sounds a lot like the path of least resistance that is referred to for Wu Wei in Taoism. But you can also see the Wikipedia page for the New England Non-Resistance Society, which consisted of many abolitionists, uh, it said that their basic outlook is that of philosophical anarchism. So much like what Taoism is considered. Now, many prominent 19th century abolitionists, again, those who opposed chattel slavery, were actually Christian or deist anarchists. And they shared many similar views to Taoism, even if they did not know so themselves. And this includes William Lloyd Garrison, Lysander Spooner, Aidan Ballou, Henry Clark Wright, Ezra Haywood, Josiah Warren, Charles Lane, Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Jeremiah Hacker, William Batchelder Green, and Stephen Pearl Andrews. Later then came Leo Tolstoy and Benjamin Tucker and the whole anarchist movement as a whole. But some of these individuals have been credited for inspiring Martin Luther King Jr. and Mahatma Gandhi. So again, the connections are endless because a lot of these individuals upholding non-resistance can be considered pacifist views or using nonviolent methods to protest. So Gandhi also was raised on Tolstoy farm, which is again, named after Leo Tolstoy. You can go down this rabbit hole all day. And it's actually fascinating that people don't know these connections. Charles Lane was somebody who wrote a great length of detail about how we should have voluntary systems of government. And his colleagues were like, well, that's not really government. <laughs> You know, um, Josiah Warren, again, orchestra leader, uh, inventor of the first Rotary Press, and he does a great deal of work, the most practical anarchist in history. Henry Clark Wright, controversial figure, awesome writings. Aidan Ballou set up his own freedom-based towns, and he was a preacher for Christian anarchism. I mean, these guys were very passionate about their ideas, and they wanted peace in the world, absolutely. They did not want chaos, that's for sure. And so there's a need for morality, as you can see through the course of these writings and seeing that ultimately morality is not legality. Uh, morality, if anything, is higher than legality, as we would recognize the Tao is higher than man-made government or our desires and attachments. It is being able to emerge out of that that we become our optimum selves, in a sense. So C.S. Lewis helps us further understand this when he talks about the Tao, and he has a rather unique position on the Tao. Again, he is mostly considered a Christian writer. Quote, either we are rational spirit obliged forever to obey the absolute values of the Tao or natural law, or else we are mere nature to be kneaded and cut into new shapes for the pleasures of masters who must, by hypothesis, have no motive but their own natural impulses. Only the Tao provides a common human law of action which can overarc rulers and ruled alike. A dogmatic belief in objective value is necessary to the very idea of a rule which is not tyranny or an obedience which is not slavery. So he's saying right here that the Tao is the rules. So there may not be rulers present in nature, but there are rules and that is the Tao. And this is essentially our ruler, right? And because many people will also equate the Tao to God, if not what God or Jesus taught. And so this may relate to the concept of synderesis, which is our inclination towards good. And it's also highlighting our ability to align to the Tao or conscience, which again is another word for common sense or common knowledge. Many people have the feelings of guilt. They, many cultures share similar ideas of morality, and I don't think that's a coincidence. And C.S. Lewis in his book, The Abolition of Man, even lists tons of different quotations from all the different cultures, and they all share similar messages of morality. So he's like, there's this universal Tao, and all of them were basically hitting on it. So he basically used the Tao to say, this is that universal thing that they were looking at, right? It's nature, it's understanding our human action and how do we create order among each other. And so there is need for morality, but it's not the type of morality as in human standards that many people may think of. And so C.S. Lewis tells us more. 
The Tao, which others may call natural law or traditional morality or the first principles of practical reason or the first platitudes, is not one among a series of possible systems of value. It is the sole source of all value judgments. If it is rejected, all value is rejected. If any value is retained, it is retained. The effort to refute it and raise a new system of value in its place is self-contradictory. There has never been and never will be a radically new judgment of value in the history of the world. What purport to be new systems or ideologies all consist of fragments from the Tao itself, arbitrarily wrenched from their context in the whole and then swollen to madness in their isolation, yet still owing to the Tao and to it alone such validity as they possess. So saying that the Tao is basically beyond all human thought, all human made systems, they owe their allegiance to the Tao. The Tao is what allowed that to be created in the very first place. And so when you lose the Tao, you lose all the systems. The systems are going to collapse. The systems are going to cause so many problems. The Tao is that moral law that he's telling us that really brings us together in the very first place, that allows us to have order, he's saying, is the sole source of all value judgments. So you may understand this then as natural morality, looking at nature as morality. And so in talking about morality, C.S. Lewis explains again, the heart never takes the place of the head, but it can and should obey it. And quote, the rebellion of new ideologies against the Tao is a rebellion of the branches against the tree. If the rebels could succeed, they would find that they had destroyed themselves. So by man trying or attempting to go against this universal fabric of reality, they ultimately destroy themselves. And that's the whole premises of his book, the abolition of man. So let's talk then about morality in Taoism. Well, we know that there is a word in Taoism that particularly pertains to morality. So although we may be against man-made standards, it doesn't mean we're against morality. In fact, the whole idea of the book is that there's a certain way of living and there's a certain alignment that we have uh, to our universe that we must learn from. The whole point of the Tao Te Ching, right? And so even Lao Tzu tells us that the man of virtue doesn't really need to think about it. He simply is among it. He's a flowing with it. It's Wu Wei. So it doesn't mean he doesn't have virtue. It just means it's part of his nature. It's second nature. So let's look into this. T, which is also called virtue, is said to be unlocked by returning to nature or aligning to Tao, which is by fasting the heart. So we're really bringing all the concepts together now. And again, fasting of the heart refers to our mind. And that is also referred to as power. So virtue is translated as power. So our morality, what we know to do, not do, is our power. And it really is, because it's our power of choice. And when we fast the heart and we're able to think clearly and rationally, we can make a better choice. So when we live our own life with T, we find our purpose, meaning, or drive, our Li, and our Li, as we mentioned before, is our organic pattern. Okay, so it's that order that we can find in the universe, although we can't put a name on it exactly, we can't exactly define it. And these are correlated concepts with one another. So Li, Ti, Tao, right? Fasting of the heart, anarchism. I mean, all these tie in together. And so by seeing this universal blueprint in action, we can then work with it. Because life is fundamentally right and natural under the Taoist perspective. Lao Tzu tells us, therefore, all things arise from the Tao. By virtue, they are nourished, developed for, cared for, sheltered, comforted, grown and protected. So it's like caring for nature, caring for the Tao, but being able to live with it, simply embrace it. To be carefree in a sense, not just to care, to simply embrace it, to live with it. He says the man of highest power, which again is also a virtue, does not reveal himself as a possessor of power. Therefore, he keeps his power. The man of inferior power cannot rid of the appearance of power. Therefore, he is in truth without power. And if you apply this concept of 
power to that of power and politics or the worldly leaders and rulers, which again is an authority figure that demands compliance. They really want to have their power and position of authority in their identity. That's what makes them the authority. That's what makes them the government, the state. And because they have this appearance, they are in truth without power because they're not among the low. They're not with the water. They're not with the Tao. They're going against the fabric of creation. And so the people who do go with the fabric of creation, they are the ones who actually keep their power. The people who try to be something they're not, they lose it. They cannot hold on to it. It's an illusion. And so when you think of the word virtue, this is not some new concept. You can even go back to many ancient cultures, including the Greeks, and they talk about virtue. Virtue is a very common word to represent morality throughout history. The concept of virtues has been talked about in many ancient cultures. Greek philosopher Aristotle would emphasize how we need to create balance so not to fall to an extreme in either excess or deficiency, similar to that of achieving balance in yin or yang, thereof Taoism. So you know how we talk about yin and yang and how we can't be in the excess or have deficiency when it comes to our simplicity in life, coming to realize our attachments and desires, and simply becoming content with our lives. Well, Aristotle provides to us the idea that there's virtue in the middle and there's a vice on the other extreme ends. So we don't want to be cowardly or rash, we want to be brave. We don't want to be addictive or ascetic, we want to be temperate. We don't want to be stingy or extravagant, we want to be generous. We don't want to be self-deprecating or boastful, we want to be truthful. We don't want to be boorish or buffoonish, we want to be witty. We don't want to be quarrelsome or bootlicking, we want to be friendly. <laughs> we don't want to be melancholy or boisterous, we want to be spirited. We don't want to be depraved or differential, so we want to be conscientious. We don't want to be envious, but we also don't want to be retributive, so we want to be indignant. We don't want to be mean, but we also don't want to be self-sacrificing, so we want to be benevolent. And we don't want to be lazy, and we don't want to be single-minded, so we want to be industrious, right? So these are just different balances that we may attain to understand that virtue is in aligning to the Tao or the yin and the yang thereof. Just another perspective to perhaps understand virtue through another lens. And so if we understand then Tao as morality, just as C.S. Lewis says, we should not fear being wrong, as we will be wrong. It teaches us of right. It has a part due to polarity. Change is law. It is Tao. But it teaches us then what is right. And we will always learn if we are open to it. Again, if we are always seeking to learn. Because although man-made standards are limited, nature remains to be harmonized with as it is our basic foundational standard. You may see it as really the only standard considering the fact we have to align to nature. It's the Wu Wei and the Zoran that we talked about before. And so our nature remains so long as we see this to prevent the abolition of man or what C.S. Lewis calls men without chests. We want to still have our chest. We still want to have our heart. If we're so up in the head, we don't have our heart. This is what C.S. Lewis is saying. We can try to be all scientific in the world that we want, but we have to not forget about our empathy and the Tao, which is beyond just our mind and our mental illusions. He's warning us about this. And so there's the objectivity then we have to worry about because people will say, well, can we define what morality is? Can we get really, really specific on what is right and what is wrong? Now, again, there's a general framework that may be observed within the universe, but just how important is it to really define it? Because it can be perhaps counterintuitive and we need to know when we cross the line, when we're creating man-made standards and we're straying away from the Tao or truth or nature itself. So morality has less to do with definition than it does its very existence and usage by understanding Taoism. You know, C.S. Lewis doesn't give us an exact definition of morality. He says, look at all these cultures and look at the similar themes they're sharing. They're looking at this Tao. 
He doesn't say exactly what the Tao is, because again, even Taoism tells us it's unnameable. And perhaps it's better off like that. Perhaps it's better off that we don't want and seek to try to find and have names and labels for all the answers in the world. Perhaps some mystery is necessary. Well, here's what Larkin Rose has to say about this, because I consider him a great philosopher among these ideas, and again, tying in Taoist anarchism. He says, whether the issue is math, morality, or anything else, there is a huge difference between trying to determine what is true and trying to dictate what is true. The former is useful, the latter is insane. In short, if there is such a thing as right and wrong at all, however you wish to define those terms, then the laws of government are always illegitimate and worthless. Every person is, by definition, morally obligated to do what he feels is right. If a law tells him to do otherwise, that law is inherently illegitimate and should be disobeyed. And if a law happens to coincide with what is right, the law is simply irrelevant. The reason, for example, to refrain from committing murder is because murder is inherently wrong. Whether or not some politicians enacted legislation declaring murder to be wrong, whether or not they outlawed it, has no effect whatsoever on the morality of the act. Legislation, no matter what it says, is never the reason that something is good or bad. As a result, even laws prohibiting evil acts such as assault, murder, and theft are illegitimate. While people should not commit such acts, it is because the acts themselves are intrinsically evil, not because man-made laws say they are wrong. And if there is no obligation to obey the laws of the politicians, then by definition, they have no authority. Because again, what you may see as the real authority, or the real laws or rules of the universe, is morality, is Tao itself. And so, we have a question of enforcement, right? Because Larkin Rose tells us there, hey, you know, these laws that are preventing these problems that people generally agree are problems, well, it's not the laws doing, it's morality's doing. Well, Alan Watts talks about this too. He says, just as we have to agree in order to communicate about language, we have to agree about, say, the rules of driving on the highway, the rules of doing business, the rules of doing banking, and so on, and so on, the rules of family arrangements and whatnot. And these are actually rules of the same kind as the rules of grammar. But alas, this is not very often recognized because the authority, the sanctions, the power behind these rules is different from the authority behind grammar. What I mean is this, if you transgress the rules of grammar, people will shrug their shoulders and say, well, he doesn't make sense. They won't summon the police. But if you transgress the rules of driving on the highway or the rules of finances, someone is likely to summon the police. And so one sees the authority of the state as standing behind those rules. But see, Alan Watts is helping us understand here, what's the difference? We're, we're drawing lines in the sand. We're being so arbitrary here. Why can't we live with some of the problems that we may perceive as problems? Do you not think people will learn themselves to some extent? And also, is it the job of the police or is it the job of everybody to do what is right at all times and to defend each other and to help each other? And is it solely just the job of the police or can there be competing different interests to help individuals just like any other product in the market where they compete to become better so they don't become corrupt? Because nobody would support them if they were becoming corrupt. They would be dependent on the market. We'll be talking about that concept too. But even Alan Watts talks about conscience. He says, The moment you subscribe to the idea that your inner feeling should be commanded, you let yourself in completely for hypocrisy. If, you see, you tell another person that you love them because you know you're supposed to love them, and in fact, in your heart you don't love them, you're a liar. And therefore, the more you insist on that lie, the more you feel it's your duty to make your feelings over and to love that other person, the more you get yourself deeper and deeper and deeper into trouble. Because you're lying to yourself. You're not following what you know deep down inside. And again, 
most people, even the one people who do wrong, they know what they're doing. They know it's wrong, but they do it anyways. They live their lives in contradiction, which we talked about early on in this presentation. And if we want to live with harmony with our universe, we have to respect and listen to our internal wisdom and listen to Tao and nature because it all has a lesson to tell us. And we can't just ignore it. We can't try to push it down. Reality will come back and bite us in the butt. And that's what happens every time. And so honesty is key. We talked about before Radical Honesty, a best-selling book, and also how I wrote a book about honesty. Well, Alan Watts talks about it. He says, real honesty is a genuine basis of morals. Real honesty is always not pretending that your feelings are other than they are. Now, when we transplant or translate that into the moral sphere, the sphere of human conduct, the equivalent is this. There are no wrong feelings. There may be wrong actions in the sense of actions contrary to the rules of human communication, but the way you feel towards other people, loving, hating, etc., etc., aren't any wrong feelings. And so to try and force one's feelings to be other than what they are is absurd and furthermore dishonest. In other words, if you feel that you hate someone intensely, it isn't necessarily the right way of dealing with that feeling to go out and cut his throat. But it is right that you should have the feeling of hating, or of being sad, or frightened, terrified, whatever it is. Like a sailor, whether he wants to sail with the wind, or whether he wants to sail against the wind, he always uses the wind. He never denies the wind. So Alan Watts is teaching us a really great life lesson here about following our heart and knowing that the emotions that arise are okay. The extent to which we allow those emotions to affect us, that's up to us. Again, we can be choosing our responses so we aren't reactive. So we can meditate and we can have all the negative thoughts come to us and many different thoughts of all kinds, but we can acknowledge them. We don't have to fight them. We don't have to go against them. We can acknowledge them there, okay? And then let them pass as we focus on the breath and we focus on clearing our mind or being more disciplined in our own mind. You know, if we have to face our own thoughts, it's because nature is giving us a, a sign. It's telling us to do something about it, okay? But our own mind and our own whim and our own instincts can get in the way if we aren't conscious and we're not using our cold cognition for our hot cognition. We don't want to just act purely out of hot cognition. We want to use our cold and our hot, our yin and our yang. We want to think about what we're doing before we just do something, in a sense. And if we become so skillful to do something intelligently that we do so without even having to think about it, we become wu wei. <laughs> so it's a beautiful thing to work with nature and align to nature without even having to really think about it. And that's the goal of society. That's where we want to get to the point where we are so aligned to who we are and who we're meant to be that we don't have to think about it. Like I'm myself here. I'm not trying to be someone else. And because I am always myself, it's easy to be myself. But someone who lives a persona and a certain identity so much of their life, a certain ego, they attach themselves to it. It's really hard to get out of it. But once they start realizing, okay, this is who I am, then they could practice with it again until it becomes Wu Wei again. Because I guarantee as a kid, they had some sense of honesty that was there until they were programmed into the adult society. Again, we learn from kids, we learn from other animals, but we learn from our nature, ultimately. And so, nature as morality. Tao as morality. Nature, then, is the only moral standard. Alan Watts tells us, things are as they are. Looking out into the universe at night, we make no comparisons between right and wrong stars, nor between well and badly arranged constellations. We usually don't look. We overlook. The truth is revealed by removing things that stand in its light. The truth is already there. Right is already there. So it's like an art, not unlike a sculpture in which the artist creates not by building, but by hacking away. So you can think of somebody who's sculpting. They're hacking away at the clay, right? It, or carving a block, right? Like we talk about with the uncarved block. 
carving the block. The block is there in its original form and you're just hacking away at it to build a sculpture. Well, the truth is there, okay? The truth is in the universe and is being shrouded by all this man-made stuff, the materialism, the consumerism, our egos, our judgment, our minds, that if we can't get past that, we'll never see the truth or nature. So there's so much more we don't see simply because we're consumed in this. And I've always found that fascinating because I recognize there's a lot I can see if I reflect and take the time, but there's definitely more I don't see simply because of my upbringing, simply because of my lifestyle and being not so close to nature as, say, some tribes or the people in the past, our ancestors or Lao Tzu. I mean, come on, if we face it, they didn't have the technology and all the distractions that we have now. And so they might have been able to understand nature a bit more in some ways. And we understand it now, even though we have technology and science and all the ability to do research and learn new knowledge. It's a sort of an irony that we're dealing with, again, with this universe. And so even Mencius tells us about the need for moral suasion, which the abolitionist of the 19th century called it. And that is basically the idea of educating others about morality. So Mencius, or Menza, is often associated with Confucian thought, but his writings are often greatly interpreted as Taoist, as he disagreed with some Confucian positions. One such position is the idea that we need moral education to work with our nature and help it reach its fulfillment rather than working against it. Again, this worked for the abolitionist, so if there were to be another action that we may partake in our own lives, it would then be learning from people like Mencius who's saying, hey, we can educate others, right? And this is why I'm making this whole presentation. And you can think of it like watering a plant rather than carving wood into bowls or not tugging on your plants to help them grow. You are working with what is and allowing it to be nurtured into existence. Just as Lao Tzu said before, with virtue, we can nurture the Tao. So what is already there? So a baby comes into this world with certain organs and certain systems. You don't want to poison the baby. You don't want to make the growth process bad. You want to feed it what it needs. Maybe you want to do some breastfeeding. Maybe you want to give it some raw milk. You want to really help with its growth and development because now you're working with its nature. It's a beautiful, beautiful phenomenon uh, when we are able to do that. And again, in the modern century, I'd hope we'd have more tools and resources to do that. And I'd hope we'd have food abundance like we talked about before with food forest. This should not be something hard for humanity to do. It's only become hard because of money and all the problems with the systems that we created, these overarching man-made systems. But again, we created them. So in other words, we can all live in the societies that these people are talking about if we simply dismantle these mental blockades, the illusions that are holding us so deeply uh, from our progression morally and naturally, as is the same. And so Jason Gregory shared a story about ultimately self-regulation. And Lao Tzu says, tell me, in what consist charity and duty to one's neighbor? They consist, answered Confucius, in a capacity for rejoicing in all things and universal love without the element of self. These are the characteristics of charity and duty to one's neighbor. Lao Tzu says, what stuff? Does not universal love contradict itself? Is not your elimination of self a positive manifestation of self? Sir, if you would cause the empire not to lose its source of nourishment, there is the universe. Its regularity is unceasing. There are the sun and the moon. Their brightness is unceasing. There are the stars and their groupings never change. There are the birds and beasts. They flock together without varying. There are the trees and shrubs. They grow upwards without exception. Be like these. Follow Tao and you will be perfect. Why then these vain struggles after charity and duty to one's neighbor as though beating a drum in search of a fugitive? Alas, sir, you have brought much confusion into the mind of man. So I'm pretty sure this is like a, a fan-made story of Lao Tzu talking to Confucius. I'm not entirely sure, but um, Jason Gregory shared the story and I find it quite helpful to understand that Lao Tzu is saying, 
let's not try so hard. You know, Confucius is saying, well, you owe your your money or you owe things to your neighbor. Lot just says when you create these conditions, you're basically pushing yourself more than your natural means. You're going out of your means to do something. And it's okay to be active in a sense, but there's also a great need to realize the passive and realize that you have to respect who you are at your current moment to not try to go out of your way. He says like beating a drum in search of a fugitive. <laughs> that's the that's the analogy being used here because you're trying to make something happen and because you're trying it goes against wu wei it goes against allowing life to manifest itself which he's saying you know things will manifest itself if we allow it to it doesn't mean people won't be helped it doesn't mean we don't help others it means we allow it to come natural we're not doing it for fame we're not doing it for status we're not doing it because it, we say so that we need to do so. We do it genuinely out of our heart, out of our morals, if anything, right? But we get to choose voluntarily on our own behalf because we also own ourselves. So this sums up a lot of the concepts that we may have been talking about. And so ultimately, we know our place. Lao Tzu says, those who would be above must speak as if they are below. Those who would lead must speak as if they are behind. Because the sage isn't contentious, no one struggles against him. And then Lao Tzu further says, I do nothing and people become good by themselves. I seek peace and people take care of their own problems. I do not meddle in their personal lives and the people become prosperous. I let go of all my desire to control them and the people return to their natural ways. Xuanza tells us, there has been such a thing as letting mankind alone. There has never been such a thing as governing mankind. Letting alone springs from fear lest men's natural dispositions be perverted and their virtue left aside. But if their natural dispositions be not perverted nor their virtue laid aside, what room is there left for government? I mean, he's just saying it exactly as I'm saying it. I'm not making an assumption here that Taoism has anarchist positions i mean he's saying what room is there left for government if the people recognize morality if they don't let themselves get perverted by their own belief systems and fears you have to know our place right i mean we're just free among the waves like this girl on the side i mean she's living life do you think she's worried about politics and religion no this is what life is about we're so worried and it causes so much problems that don't need to be there. We start messing with other people's lives and everybody's like, I just want to be left alone. I just want to live my life. But even the people who say that believe in statism. They give way to the system and don't even realize that they do. I mean, how absurd is that? It's crazy. We've been pulled into an illusion and we have the blindfolds on. We don't even see it until we do that shadow work and return to that uncarved block. And so we still can have community. We still can have organization. Again, voluntary hierarchy, just not involuntary hierarchy. On community and society, Swangza states, it is, quote, an agreement of a certain number of families and individuals to abide by certain customs. Discordant elements unite to form a harmonious whole. Take away this unity and each has a separate individuality. A mountain is high because of its individual particles. A river is large because of its individual drops. And he is a just man who regards all parts from the point of view of the whole. So when people like to draw lines in the sand, they're already violating this unification of humankind. Again, our country is the world, our countrymen is all mankind. So Swangzi even talks about self-governing in this conversation here. Tlen Ken asks, Please may I ask how to rule the world? The nameless man said, Get away from me, you peasant. What kind of a jury question is that? I'm just about to set off with the curator. And if I get bored with that, then I'll ride on the light and the som bird, cut beyond the six directions, wandering in the village of not even anything, and living in the broad and borderless field. What business do you have coming with this talk of governing the world and disturbing my mind? Tian Ken repeated his question. The nameless man said, Let your mind wander in simplicity. Blend your spirit with the vastness. 
follow along with things the way they are and make no room for personal views. Then the world will be governed. <laughs> so saying that the world has this self-governing order to it if man learns to just let go and not have his attachment to the idea that there needs to be a government, that there needs to be a system that tells people how to live their own lives. And so Swangsa says, I have heard of letting the world be, of leaving it alone. I have never heard of governing the world. But then the continuation of that quote is, you let it be for fear of corrupting the inborn nature of the world. You leave it alone for fear of distracting the virtue of the world. If the nature of the world is not corrupted, if the virtue of the world is not distracted, why should there be any governing of the world? Again, just to repeat that quote, it's so important because, you know, this is, I think, another different translation. Some of these translations I can get mixed up here, but beautiful either way. Um, the message that these quotes are saying to us, I mean, I think they're profound. And so Jason Gregory tells us in his documentary called The Natural Human Being, which, again, I absolutely love. I think it's one of my most favorite videos online. He says, we can only leave people alone to live their own lives if we are sincere in our own introspection and willing to discard the conditioning that clouds our unity with our brothers and sisters. Where we are sincerely humble and free from agendas, we nourish and secretly transform the world. Again, through not seeking to transform it. A sage has no agenda and this brings spiritual oxygen into the world. We all have undergone various sorts of conditioning, and we all have the same physical and emotional states, so we can sympathize with the rest of the world, which suffers as a result of the same hypnosis as ours. And that hypnosis, again, can be seen as statism. On the other hand, we are all inherently the same. We also possess the same qualities that a sage lives by. Zoran can only come to fruition when we trust that everything the universe has produced is fundamentally right and could be no other way. The systems of government, politics, banking, religion, and commerce are unnatural, but they have gotten us to a certain point, and we have learned many lessons from them. It's just that they are no longer needed. If we cannot trust the world and the people in it, we stand no chance for survival because a species at war with itself is doomed. People often say that they trust the universe, but then they consistently condemn life according to their conditioned perspectives. And again, we can get really specific and say it's statism here with our evaluation and seeing more from this quote again. So we are obeying truth. You can see on the left side of this slide, the golden rule shared across every single culture and religion. Again, spiritual teachings, ultimately, we can learn from all of them. Look at that, the golden rule in every single one of them. And here's a quote from Larkin Rose. You call yourself Christians or Jews or claim to follow some other religion. But the truth is, what you call your religion is empty window dressing. What you truly worship, the God you really bow to, what you really believe in, is the state. Thou shall not steal, thou shall not murder, unless you can do it by way of the government. Then it's just fine, isn't it? So he's saying, this is the hypocrisy with people's own mentalities, their own morality. Alan Watts even says, when we attempt to exercise power or control over someone else, we cannot avoid giving that person the very same power or control over us. So we obey truth instead of these man-made systems. You can see, you know, the government is a religion. It doesn't matter what government it is. The way they operate, as they all have throughout history, is through mental manipulation to keep those in power in power. Um, because, well, people want power if they're given that power by the masses. It depends on their belief system. And so that belief system can get reinforced through all these means. Worship, crusades, deities, texts and symbols and prayer, temples and monuments, leaderships for like the church and sins and conversion and blasphemy and ordainment and jihads and inquisitions and tithes and offerings. I mean, it's all there. Various sects. I mean, it's... <laughs> It's insane. This religion is by far the one that nobody talks about. And it is, again, considered the most dangerous one because it's the only one that really is backed by violence um, when it comes to the notion of authority. 
And so when we're getting past that belief system of authority in statism, we understand anarchism, but more specifically, we understand voluntarism. We talked about this before, but voluntary or consensual interaction or the non-aggression principle is a basic moral framework which follows Wu Wei or the path of least resistance. And it is naturally embraced by most people, with the exception only being in politics. So voluntarism usually consists in people going about their own voluntary lives and recognizing that they should not participate in politics whatsoever because it's connected to involuntary interactions. It's an involuntary hierarchy. So people can do whatever they want as long as they do not harm or aggress upon others, essentially. It's the non-aggression principle. And so insecurity makes us unwilling to agree to disagree and want to impose on others with violence, thus violating voluntarism. But if your ideas require violence, are they good ideas? Trying to alter what nature has intended or force its will is like flowing against a stream. It's exhausting and gets us nowhere. Again, as we have seen throughout history, there is no moral high ground and we aren't to change the world, but rather allow and gain the world. Ronald Reagan to the communist leader Mao Zedong have both used the Tao to fit their agendas. However, it should be apparent that there cannot be an agenda in Taoism in order to truly live and let live. Taoism follows voluntarism. It doesn't have an agenda. It doesn't have a strict goal or guideline. It simply is following the path of least resistance, allowing nature to manifest its own allowing people to live their own lives, not using it for political, religious, social means. No, Taoism is simply understanding the Tao, and the Tao is unnameable, <laughs> and it has no box that it can fit in. So when I talk about anarchism and voluntarism, I warn you again about the symbols, about the colors, and the parts of it that is unnatural. But then I do recognize the parts of it that is natural, that follows Wu Wei, that follows what Taoism specifically teaches. And again, Ronald Reagan, Mao Zedong, they did not teach Taoism. If they did, they wouldn't be in power. <laughs> As evident with all the quotes and everything I shared in this presentation. And so it's really simple. You can see some like symbols and stuff on the side of the slide. It's really a simple notion. And again, voluntarism, anarchism is the opposite of statism. Statism is the utopian ideal that just the right amount of violence used by just the right people in just the right way can perfect society, right? So many dependencies and it's all based on faith and belief of, oh, well, if we just do this, it'll be better. You know, if we just follow the constitution, if we just vote this person in office, the world can't be changed like that. People trying to change the world is the very problem. And so we need to universalize nonviolence and believe that a voluntary society is possible because we know it's possible. We do it on an everyday basis anyways. Why don't we follow it to its end and allow people to live their own lives to their fullest, allow people to live naturally. And so what is the greatest rebellion? And, you know, Jason Gregory also talks a lot about this. He says the greatest rebellion is just being your peaceful self as nature and freedom intends. It annoys those who feed on fear. Violence and conflict are counterintuitive if we are solving violence and conflict. In addition, problems aren't new. Few have taken the Taoist approach of non-interference. And people will say, but if we don't interfere, that's wrong. With using love, nonviolent resistance, and Wu Wei, more positive change would manifest than otherwise, despite the appearing irony. We can remain in society, but not following their way. Love, piece by piece, piece by piece, right? Allowing people to live in peace, well, then we are peaceful, because then it allows them to. We can't solve violence and conflict with violence and conflict. The rebellion is just being ourselves, allowing ourselves to live our natural lives. And to be more specific, if I'm going to tell you outright what it would be, at least one town not paying taxes and showing why to the rest of the world, using this education, using it as an educative motive if they must, showing the world with technology, 
which those in the past did not have to their advantage. We can now reach the world with this knowledge. They couldn't do that back then, all those writers I talked about. They had a great message to share with the world. But how many people were able to see it? Now, I mean, we can reach millions of people. That's amazing. You want a rebellion? Well, it's an awakening. It's people realizing who they are meant to be, who they actually are. And so, let us talk then about the economic side of it, too. Taoism doesn't stop at politics and recognizing there can't be a political structure. Well, the same thing with economy, actually. There can't be an economic structure, Corey. Well, there isn't one set plan. There isn't set standards. The Taoist concept of Wu Wei does not just apply in a moral or individual action context, as it is similar to Austrian economics in the concept of laissez-faire, which translates to leave people alone to do as they wish. It means government does not intervene with the economy. So they don't do subsidies, they don't do regulation. Government lets the market go where the market wants to go. So people are in control of what they actually want. Governments cannot produce, but only steal and transfer what has been produced by individuals. And this viewpoint has been deeply studied by many researchers. You can find that information on Mises.org, M-I-S-E-S.org, or LouRockwell.com. In a quote from Ayn Rand, she says, Laissez-faire capitalism is the only social system based on the recognition of individual rights and therefore the only system that bans force from social relationships. And she made a great impact on the world's people with her book, Atlas Shrugged. So... You might be familiar with that, but I would say that these ideas, these simple, basic economic ideas, do support Taoism. The idea that if people want something, fund it. If you don't want something, don't fund it. But don't force anybody to fund something that you want, okay? People can choose what to do with their own property. And so this is the concept of a Wu Wei economy. The Taoist concept of Wu Wei in the economic worldview may best be seen in the concepts and works titled Spontaneous Order by individuals such as Frederick Hayek and Chase Rachels. So when we say spontaneous order, what comes to mind? I think Taoism, that's the first thing that comes to mind. <laughs> and you can see there's a book cover on the left side of the slide with, again, the anarchist symbol, spontaneous order, saying that there can be order spontaneously? Well, that sounds a lot like what Taoism teaches. Again, Jason Gregory even has documentaries talking about it. And so here's a quote. It is a system which has developed not through the central direction or patronage of one or a few individuals, but through the unintended consequences of the decisions of myriad individuals, each pursuing their own interest through voluntary exchange, cooperation, and trial and error. That's just life. And so the interactions of individual people in a market are quite simple. People give something in exchange for something else. From these simple interactions emerges the whole economy. Prices, combined with profit and loss, provide information and feedback in the economy, regulating the actions of different people along with the laws of economics. This means that on a large scale, things are not random and chaotic, but ordered. The economy is planned and organized even though nobody is planning or organizing. Billions of decisions are made by individuals that lead to the integration of all their opinions and knowledge into the economy even as this information changes and grows over time. So it's able to adapt. It is like water. It is a Wu Wei economy. Amazing stuff. And so here's some really good information about spontaneity. Again, there's Jason Gregory's documentary, Effortless Action, Taoism documentary. Definitely recommend checking it out. But here's also a really helpful photo. It says, we marvel at spontaneous order in the natural world around us. We enjoy its beauty and wonders and interact with it for pleasure. We savor the fruits of it and act in certainty of its results. We understand its necessity and passionately decry anything that interferes with it, corrupts it, or threatens its full and continued flourishing. As soon as the majority of human beings marvel at, cherish, and passionately protect human spontaneous order in the same way, 
perpetual war and poverty will be eradicated and humanity will flourish like never before. Again, telling us the solution is letting life be and allowing things to work in the order that they are designed to work in. That is, with the Tao. Things arise spontaneity. Things arise with spontaneity. Again, Carl Jung observes this, Jason Gregory, all the many Taoist teachers talk about this. This is not a new concept, and it is beautiful because all of nature does this all the time. And so we can make many connections, such as with that of integrative nutrition. Integrative nutrition is a connection we can make to Taoism because the holistic view on life embraced by Taoism teaches us how there cannot be a one-size-fits-all philosophy, which can be applied to health and diet. So we don't just have to look at economy or morality. So in integrative nutrition, the many different types of theories, diets, nutrients, medicines, fields, etc. can come together for the bio-individual or unique individual to see what works best learning about themselves for themselves with guidance from the practitioner. The practitioner is guiding the patient. They're helping the patient. And so Lao Tzu tells us, within, within, this is where the world's treasure has always been. And so this is rather than the practitioner merely imposing what they think is best for their patient. By being supportive rather than authoritative, the outsider practitioner can help the insider patient shedding light on the yin, what they don't see about themselves. And similarly, in naturopathic medicine, it was developed to emphasize working with nature and allowing the body to heal itself as they see it as intended. So again, spontaneous healing, healing happening on its own without force, without invasive procedure. This is not a new concept. Natural medicine has been used for thousands of years, so why do we call it alternative medicine? That's because of conventional medicine getting in the way and claiming to be the only solution for people. Well, people are finding out it's not working for them, and this is why alternative medicine and growing food is back on the rise. There is no surprise, but it's also why a lot of it also gets censored. And so, let's talk about equality. Because we talk about all these ideas and recognizing the whole of society, but also recognizing the individual, there is an equality being shared here, however. Lao Tzu tells us the way is great, heaven is great, earth is great, people are great, and nature holds no prejudice and cares for all things the same. It views everything as so many straw dogs, neither loving nor hating them. And so Jeremy Locke from The End of All Evil further helps us understand this by saying, you live after the era of wars, and the only remaining step in the pattern of liberty is to answer the question held in the minds of people around the world. The lies of millennia have not stopped the unquenchable thirst for freedom that grows within the hearts of every person on earth. They are poised and ready to take the freedom that is rightfully theirs. They need only hear that freedom is possible, that freedom is real. You are the key to teach the people of Earth the value that they have within themselves. You need only speak and tell them that every good thing is theirs to have. You need only tell them that the glory of liberty is real and that it belongs to them, that their nature is who they are, that they shall be them, that they are meant to be them, that they are such a beautiful person, because we all are, and that we shouldn't put ourselves down, and that we could recognize ourselves beyond all the illusions and titles and judgments, so we can truly just let ourselves live with ourselves to begin with, and then we can nurture it. And so, being a Taoist, Sanjoy, in his video, tells us why most people won't become a Taoist in the current day and age, especially, despite the fact that they may be able to take drastic steps toward it that even Taoists may be unaware of, i.e. dismantling statism with voluntarism, as evident with Taoist anarchism. People may not realize how much of a difference it can make on society if you shatter the world's biggest illusion, the world's greatest religion that is harming the population. I mean, you can say back then, man, no one's going to free the slaves. 
slavery is just part of life. We need it for the economy. And you can make all those justifications like that chart I shared before. But actually, you can end slavery. And all it takes is a certain amount of people, which history shows us not even like 3% of the population, to really make a big difference. Just the way they think, their minds changing on a certain subject. And so how do we then bear with what Sanjoy says is why most people won't become a Taoist? Well, let us bear in mind these three main reasons, and we'll break them down a little bit here. He says people do not want to see their own failing. And that's true, because truth is uncomfortable and we have to plant a seed so we can ask questions. Asking questions is low resistance, and it's shared as a very helpful tool by Larkin Rose and his Candles in the Dark seminar. Definitely recommend checking it out if you want to know how to talk to people. But as well as by the mere example of the Socratic method. Another method is to share your own experience and sympathize. So we can say, yeah, there's this problem, this is why people won't become Taoist, but there's clearly solutions like that. And so people do not want to change. This is another concern people might have, as Sanjoy brings up. And that's because knowledge that people do obtain, it's used for man-made values rather than what is truly important in this life. If people do commit to any change, well, we can help guide individuals in seeing their own priorities and contradictions. Another method is to show by example. So we don't have to point the finger and look around all the time and expect everybody else to change. Perhaps we start by changing ourselves and then show by example. Another concern he mentions is that people do not want to give up their desires. Sure, you know, there's consumerism and conformity, and it binds humanity. But we can help guide individuals to see the beauty in life and having self-sufficiency, family, community, and the things that may matter most in life to truly fulfill them, with also understanding what can never truly fulfill them. Small new beginnings in exploring nature, invoking creativity and mystery can make a big difference. We start off this whole presentation talking about the importance of mystery. If people have a desire to start to search for knowledge, that's a start. And may, they may end up with the conclusion that, well, knowledge isn't everything, as we talked about later on. But we can also recognize that it can be a starting point. It can be a bridge. And you can build those small little bridges. You can prepare healthy foods for your family members that taste good and they become healthier. And then they want more of those foods over time. Even though they might seem really resistant to healthy foods at first, you are allowing their body to condition to what you think is good for them. And maybe, and hopefully, it's based on your knowledge of nature and what you know would be good for them. And you can find that out more by talking with them and building a connection, right? So I think there are many strategies that people can use. So I don't want to get stuck on this idea that, oh, well, the world can't understand these Taoist ideas. They absolutely can. And I just shared a bunch of solutions that you can apply in your own life right now. And so you can even make the connection with Taoism and other philosophies that people say, well, you know, they're not going to be followed, but there's a reason why they're growing. There's a reason why they're timeless. There's a reason why people see so much value in them and why it's ultimately changing lives. Stoicism is one of those that has been talked about quite a lot in the modern day. It's an ancient Greek philosophy which held that the goal of life is living in agreement with nature. And that's what Zeno of Citadim says. And again, Stoicism holds many parallels to Taoism. Here's another quote. Therefore, the end turns out to be living in agreement with nature, taken as living in accordance both with one's own nature and with the nature of the whole. That's from Diogenes. Here's another quote. It's not things that upset us, but how we think about these things by Epictetus. And then there's also the Stoic concept of okiosis, which means self-ownership. Because humans are like animals, but we are more than animals. And they have another word for that, proheresis, because we have rational capacity. We don't need our instincts to dictate our actions. 
we can own ourselves. And that goes to the basic idea of self-ownership, which is emphasized, again, through the writings of Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu with recognizing our individuality. And so with Stoicism or Taoism, the goal is for society to not affect us, remaining unharmed in the midst of danger, being able to adapt and learn how to adapt, I would say, is the main connection here. But I will say there are differences. There's a reason why they are two separate philosophies. But like anything, you're going to see some parallels within it. Uh, for instance, Taoism emphasizes Wu Wei. And I don't necessarily see that within Stoicism as much. Now, there's also transcendentalism. This one in particular, I find, has many parallels to Taoism. And transcendentalism is a 19th century school of thought during abolitionism. So maybe that's part of the reason why <laughs> many of the transcendentalists were abolitionists. So Ralph Waldo Emerson says, a form of inner spirituality that can only be expressed through imaginative or poetic language. That's transcendentalism. Well, look at the Tao Te Ching. It's literally poetry that is very imaginative and is considered a spirituality. It encourages not living in the constricting guidelines of society and that God is in each person and in nature. Individual intuition is the highest source of knowledge and each person should have an optimistic emphasis on individualism and self-reliance while also being able to reject traditional authority. So all of those concepts right there definitely shared among Taoism based on my understanding of it and everything we shared in this presentation. And here are just many examples. And for those of you who maybe come from the East, you may have not heard of this because this is more of a Western uh, philosophy, but it is greatly beneficial. I remember when I was learning this in school because they do teach a little bit of transcendentalism in school over here. My teacher would call me a transcendentalist. And I thought that was quite funny, but that's because I shared a lot of their views. And so here's a quote from Henry David Thoreau. He says, It matters not where or how far you travel, the further commonly the worse, but how much alive you are. And Lao Tzu says, similar to this, the farther you go, the less you know. Here's another example. I ask not for the great, the remote, the romantic, what is doing in Italy or Arabia, what is Greek art or Provencal minstrelsy. I embrace the common. I explore and sit at the feet of the familiar, the low. That's Ralph Waldo Emerson. Sounds a lot like what we talk about with the water in Taoism, doesn't it? Well, here's another example. To go into solitude, a man needs to retire as much from his chamber as from society. I am not solitary whilst I read and write, though nobody is with me. But if a man would be alone, let him look to the stars, the rays that come from these heavenly worlds. That's Henry David Thoreau, and that's similar to what Lao Tzu says here. Ordinary men hate solitude, but the master makes use of it, embracing his aloneness, realizing he is one with the whole universe. I mean, these are very parallel. And here you can recognize the love for nature. Popular transcendentalist texts include Walden by Henry David Thoreau or Nature by Ralph Waldo Emerson. So if you haven't read these, definitely you can check these out as well uh, on your adventure in Taoism. It might actually help you. Walden is a perfect mirror. Nations come and go without defiling it. It is a mirror which no stone can crack, whose quicksilver will never wear off, whose gliding nature continually repairs. No storms, no dust can dim its surface ever fresh. A mirror in which all impurity presented to it sinks, swept and dusted by the sun's hazy brush. This the light dust cloth, which retains no breath that is breathed on it, but sends its own to float as clouds high above its surface, and he reflected in its bosom still. Wow, amazing poetry by Henry David Thoreau. So there's that great love of nature, and you can see some parallels here in the text of Walden and in the Tao. Most men, even in this comparatively free country, through mere ignorance and mistake, are so occupied with the factitious cares and superfluously coarse labors of life that its finer fruits cannot be picked by them. And that's similar to what Swangza says, to labor without seizing all life, and then without living to enjoy the fruit, worn out with labor, to depart, one knows not whither. Is not this a just cause for grief? 
Here's another example from Swangza. A pheasant of the marshes may have to go 10 steps to get a peck, a hundred to get a drink, yet pheasants do not want to be fed in a cage, for although they might have less worries, they would not like it. That can also be related to slavery and how they like their condition, but they would actually be better off if they were free. But aside from that, this is what Thoreau has to say. Shall I transplant the primrose by the river's brim to set it beside its sister on the mountain? This was the sod it grew in. This the hour it bloomed in. If sun, wind, and rain came here to cherish and expand it, shall not we come here to pluck it? Shall we require it to grow in a conservatory for our convenience? And so, in similarity to the Taoist anarchist position, Thoreau even says that government is best which governs not at all. And here are shared paradoxes shared in Taoism and Transcendentalism. So there's seven paradoxes from Lao Tzu and seven paradoxes from Thoreau. Lao Tzu says the greatest skill appears like clumliness. Lao Tzu says the greatest skill appears like clumsiness. Thoreau says the highest condition of art is artlessness. Lao Tzu says truth sounds like its opposite. Thoreau says truth is always paradoxical. Lao Tzu says the sage puts himself last and finds himself in the foremost place. Thoreau says he will get to the goal first who stands stillest. Lao Tzu says by action without deeds may all live in peace. Thoreau says there is one let better than any help and that is let alone. Lao Tzu says to yield is to be preserved whole. Thoreau says, by sufferance you may escape suffering. Lao Tzu says, it is not because he does not live for self that his self is to realize. Thoreau says, he who resists not at all will never surrender. Lao Tzu says, the sage regards his body as accidental, and his body is therefore preserved. Thoreau says, stand outside the wall and no harm can reach you. The danger is that you will be walled in with it. So amazing, some of these are really on point. And so as we conclude this presentation, I'm gonna give you some helpful tips uh, to really bring a lot of these ideas together. For instance, you can actually make your own yin yang with your hands and I'm doing it just like this. This is basically what I'm doing. I'm just grasping one thumb and boom, I can see a yin yang, it's like an S symbol. So individuals merely holding hands may represent a yin yang. However, there is one that you can do with your own hands to remind yourself of the polarity in life. Take one hand and entirely grasp the thumb of your other hand, then wrap your fingers of that other hand on top of the grasping hand. You should see a clear S formation like that of the Taija II. Okay, so just like that. There we go, we got a yin yang going here. Look at that, amazing stuff. I love it. So you can always remind yourself. I sometimes look at this, I go in the ocean, I'm like, oh, this is cool. Because I even just see the waves and I'm like pushing the waves with my hand and I get to see the yin yang just in the wave formations. It's really incredible. I start to see it in a lot of things now. <laughs> but also, you know, we talked a bit about meditation in this presentation. So I figured to share some helpful little tips, very simple practical tips that you may be able to use. Uh, at least these are my favorite that I personally also use. And so you want to consider experimenting with your meditation in fasting the heart. And again, there's many resources online, even if you want to get more specific, again, the secret of the golden flower or uh, look up Taoist meditations, Master Gu, we mentioned before. So here are some simple tips to help you fast the heart and practice a little bit of meditation. Find the best way to breathe for yourself. That can include deep breaths, diaphragmatic or belly breathing, which you can do that, by the way, by putting one hand on your heart, like on your lungs, and one hand on your belly. And when you breathe in, your belly should expand. And then when you breathe out, your belly should go down. Your lungs, your chest should never expand or go down, actually, because these are short breaths. Your long breaths are your diaphragmatic belly breathing or baby breathing, this is the healthiest form of breath. It brings us into the parasympathetic nervous system. So if you do this, feel which is being expanded here. 
you don't want your chest to be expanding. Okay, now my chest might be expanding a lot because I'm talking a lot, and so I'm taking a lot of quicker breaths, but if you want to relax yourself, belly breathing is very beneficial. And again, do your own research if you don't think that's the case. Um, there's a lot of material about that. But also, you want to breathe at your own pace. Okay, you don't necessarily want to time yourself, but you can utilize these tools as like a basic framework and then experiment from there. You can have your tongue on the top of your mouth. A lot of people will say this as well. Uh, so, right now I have my tongue on the top of my mouth when I breathe, okay? And you can pause after each inhale and exhale. So I can breathe in. And if you notice, my exhale is like double as long as my inhale, but I took a break between the inhale and the exhale. And so you can focus on that little brief period of time as well. If you focus on the pauses, on the breaks, and your nose and your mouth, you can get more immersed into your meditation, okay? And so you inhale through the nose and exhale through the mouth. Now, that's not a requirement. I've seen many Taoist meditators and Tai Chi practitioners who actually don't do that. Um, but you can see what works best for you. I like to breathe through my mouth, like, I mean, inhale through my nose and then exhale through my mouth, okay? That's me personally. Now, you can also listen to sounds or feel your surroundings or focus just purely on the breath, okay? Now, you also wanna find the best way to relax for yourself. So that might mean feet flat on the floor. Like if you're in a chair like this, that's fine too. You don't have to be crisscrossed necessarily. You can go about your day doing anything meditatively. You don't have to be meditating to breathe very deeply and nice and relaxed, okay? And so that's kind of like the principle of Tai Chi is it's a meditative type of Qigong. So you're doing things more slow and relaxed. You're basically in a meditation, but with Qigong added to it. And so um, you can also just have your legs crossed with your back straight and your arms resting. Your hands could be open or laying down. And you can also have your feet on each leg or simply as comfortable. You know, if you're really flexible, you can put your foot on each leg in the crisscross position. Um, but if not, totally fine. There's no strict rules around this. Just find the best way to relax for yourself to focus on your breath. And again, there's many resources online in case you want to learn more. And so if you take a lot of those tips into your life, these are just some of the things you might want to notice. You want to practice your breath. By the end, you should feel more open, aware, and at peace. Your breath should be slow or at ease, as with your mind. You want to scan your body from head to toe. Where is there any discomfort? You know, you can feel your body, get in tune with your body rather than getting so stuck in your mind. So feel your environment, listen to the sounds, listen to your breath, right? And focus on it in a sense, but be able to let go to the point where it becomes so easy. I noticed that toward the end of my meditation, I'm breathing so slow, just naturally, right? Because I've made it Wu Wei and I don't even have to think about it anymore. And my mind feels so much more relaxed. So it helps someone like me again a lot with uh, overthinking, for instance. And so feel that discomfort. If you feel any discomfort, notice it, allow it, give it your attention. Notice it as arising. Emotions have a message for you. Give it your attention. It is like holding ice. Eventually it releases. You may also consider journaling or other ways of expressing your feelings. Again, I've always journaled. I think it's very beneficial, so something I would recommend to personally. And again, this has to do with internal alchemy or emotional alchemy, which includes transmuting your emotions. And so that means embracing our emotions as energy, part of change as every step is valuable. So tin can turn to gold in this sense. Without detaching from our thoughts, we cannot question them. So use your mind, but don't be used by it. Do not meditate for any motive because that is future thinking. Stay present. The whole point of meditation is presence. Okay, so if you're thinking about so much and you're trying super hard, it's the exact opposite. It should be very relaxing, okay? It shouldn't be something that you're forcing upon yourself. 
And so what is then the action overall in this presentation, aside from meditation? Well, I have a picture of the Shire, and the reason why is because the Shire, to me, is sort of like a model for action. And I have a lot of pictures in this presentation, some of which I may have addressed, others are more symbolic that I may have not addressed. Um, use your imagination to think about the pictures if you want to go back. But the Shire is symbolic for many things. In Lord of the Rings, which again, J.R.R. Tolkien was an anarchist, he actually said the Shire had no government, and they lived as a very peaceful community, growing food, voluntarily trading. And so the Shire can be seen as like a, a framework for the world that Lao Tzu and Swangza and many of the writers we talked about before were talking about, where people live in sort of an industrial, agricultural world where they're still in harmony with nature. And so this is the action. The action proposed in this seminar is Wu Wei, or non-action. With this, we understood the place of moral suasion or education for voluntarism or abolitionism rather than the yin obedience or yang domination extremes of statism. So any peaceful modality, be it natural law, the Socratic method, unschooling, food forests, honesty, meditation, qigong, tai chi, naturosophy, or Taoism, can help us follow the path of least resistance. And furthermore, we may simply go into nature. So that, to me, would be how I would summarize the action part of this presentation. I do hope that you may have taken notes or applied as you went by many of the parts in this presentation, applied it to your life, because I find it incredibly helpful for myself, for instance. So remember, the message is always among us. Nature is the answer, Wei, Tao, or Law. This message is an individual and collective endeavor. Through technology and through governments, nature is beyond. A million words is not enough to describe life. Hence, nothing is to be said. Don't attach yourself to these words or any ideology. Quote, the fish trap exists because of the fish. Once you've gotten the fish, you can forget the trap. The rabbit snare exists because of the rabbit. Once you've gotten the rabbit, you can forget the snare. Words exist because of meaning. Once you've gotten the meaning, you can forget the words. Where can I find a man who has forgotten words so I can have a word with him? <laughs> that swungza. I love it. It's fantastic. And honestly, it's true. I, I go around, I'm like, I just don't want to talk to people with an agenda who you know, can just be themselves. I've, that's, those are the people I want. You know, I just want people who can be themselves, people who are honest and authentic, who are trying to find themselves too, because that's part of the process. And so Lao Tzu tells us, those who are stiff and rigid are the disciples of death. Those who are soft and yielding are the disciples of life. They're able to change. They're able to adapt. They're able to listen. And so simply enjoy life. Remember that when you say this, you disregard that, and so on. You are left with silence. You find yourself being open. Again, many people say they want to live their lives, and then they, next moment, support the government. They support politics. They support an ideology. They want to impose their will on others, and they don't realize what they're doing. So they're enjoying life, but they're going with this passive yin obedience. But they're not really channeling into their yin, empty, simplistic mind to help themselves see that the actions that they're contributing to with their yang energy is toxic and actually chaotic. And so, Alan Watts tells us, Lao Tzu said the Tao is like water. It always seeks the low level, which human beings abhor. So it's a very mysterious idea. What I would have to say to this is, will it continue to be mysterious? If you abolish the world's most dangerous, unnatural hierarchy, i.e. the government, as taught by Taoism, as taught by voluntarism, maybe not so much. I truly, deep down, believe that. Now, you can share your thoughts with me, but it is the path of least resistance as far as I'm concerned. So, if we are to summarize Taoism, we have Tao, which is the way. It's the source of existence, it's the root of all beings, seen and unseen. 
It is achieved through acting thoughtfully, not impulsively, and meditation and reflection in solitude. And from that we achieve Wu Wei, or non-action. It's acting in harmony with nature and living in peace, simplicity, and tranquility. Here's another summary of the Tao. It says, to escape the social, political, and cultural traps of life, one must escape by one, rejecting formal knowledge and learning, two, relying on the senses and instincts, and three, discovering the nature and rhythm of the universe, and then four, ignoring political and social laws. And just to remember that Wu Wei involves understanding natural and social laws to the point where you can act in harmony with nature. Okay, so the natural laws are very much different from political laws in that sense, if you want to differentiate the two. And so here's another great summary of Tao. Tao teaches the way how to work with nature's forces and not fight against them to achieve harmony in oneself and with nature. The Tao is the goal, path, and journey all in one. Wu Wei is the method of following the Tao. It's translated as not doing. It means that everything humans do should follow the natural course of nature. We should not try to change it. Go with the flow. Do nothing and everything gets done. Wu is the concept of emptiness and nothingness. By achieving emptiness, we can observe nature and understand ourselves, i.e. meditation. We have to empty our mind of any impulses, aspirations, wishes, or desires that are against Tao. T is the power of a thing. It's the virtue. The T of a person is their self. By understanding ourselves, we can be happy and reach Tao. T is expressed through humility and meekness, the three jewels, the three treasures. And then again, in light of government, the Taoist view is that the government shouldn't have power over people because it breaks the Wu Wei. Because everything has life, Tao believes it is wrong to fight each other in wars. Man is unhappy when he has to follow rules and laws, and that may be seen as the opposite of Confucianism, though again, Leo Tolstoy says we can embrace all the cultures as long as we don't violently impose them on each other. And so I thank you guys so much for learning all about many of the information that I have in this seminar. There's so much more information, though, out there, and I want to give credit 100% to these guys who not only inspired me, but provided a lot of the information in this seminar. So you have George Thompson, Master Gu from TaoistWellness.com, Jason Gregory, Einzelganger, Alan Watts, Prisma, True Meaning, and Ian Withy Berry in particular. Okay, so these are my main sources uh, that I used for this presentation, aside from, of course, Swangza and Lao Tzu, which are, of course, the main sources for Taoism in general. Most of these channels, just as myself, are interpreters, people who are taking that material and looking deep upon it, applying it to our own lives, and finding it to be super helpful for everybody. Um, that we come across and anybody that really puts the time and attention into um, this knowledge, which again is knowledge of themselves, knowledge of nature, embracing it for what it is. And so thank you so much. Follow your path, yin to yang, like this hobbit here in the Shire, walking from the dark into the light, <laughs> into the outside world of nature, away from his man-made house. Though he recognizes himself as part of nature, he can still live in the house, but he recognizes that world outside of it. And so if he needs to go on a journey, so he must. But he will return to the Shire. He will return to his simple life. He wants to remain among the low, among the, the being that can't be uh, seen by evil, which evil cannot stand the most. It's this simple little hobbit that does the most harm to the greatest evil in the world. So do not be afraid. Do not live in fear. Allow yourself to embrace your natural condition. And I really encourage your journey among that process. Again, we are all working on that journey for ourselves. Thank you very much for watching. Share your thoughts with me, of course, and share this message, this presentation with any of your favorite content creators or anybody you think who would benefit from this work. There's a lot on Taoism on the internet, and I wanted to make 
uh, in my eyes, one of the greatest projects dedicated to the topic, which is bringing all the information together, at least a lot of it. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. This is Corey Andrelot. Nature is the answer.